Chapter Seventeen of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That Friday made the last of our fine days for a month. In the evening, the weather broke. The wind shifted from south to northeast, and brought rain first, and then sleet and snow. On the hidden morrow, one could hardly imagine that there had been three weeks of summer. The primroses and crocuses were hidden under wintry drifts. The larks were silent, the young leaves of the early trees smitten and blackened, and dreary and chill and dismal that morrow did creep over. My master kept his room. I took possession of the lonely parlour, converting it into a nursery, and there I was, sitting with the moaning doll of a child laid on my knee, rocking it to and fro, and watching, meanwhile, the still driving flakes build up the uncurtained window. When the door opened, and some person entered, out of breath and laughing, my anger was greater than my astonishment for a minute. I supposed it one of the maids, and I cried, "'Have done! How dare you show your giddiness here! What would Mr. Linton say if he heard you?' "'Excuse me,' answered a familiar voice, "'but I know Edgar is in bed, and I cannot stop myself.' With that, the speaker came forward into the fire, panting and holding her hand to her side. "'I have run the whole way from Wuthering Heights,' she continued, after a pause. "'Except where I've flown. I couldn't count the number of falls I've had. Oh, I'm aching all over. Don't be alarmed. There shall be an explanation as soon as I can give it. Only just have the goodness to step out and order the carriage to take me on to Gimmerton, and tell a servant to seek up a few clothes in my wardrobe.' The intruder was Mrs. Heathcliff. She certainly seemed in no laughing predicament. Her hair streamed on her shoulders, dripping with snow and water. She was dressed in the girlish dress she commonly wore, befitting her age more than her position. A low frock with short sleeves, and nothing on either head or neck. The frock was of light silk, and clung to her with wet, and her feet were protected merely by thin slippers. To add to this a deep cut under one ear, which only the cold prevented from bleeding profusely. A white face scratched and bruised, and a frame hardly able to support itself through fatigue. And you may fancy my first fright was not much allayed when I had had leisure to examine her. "'My dear young lady,' I exclaimed, "'I'll stir nowhere and hear nothing till you have removed every article of your clothes and put on dry things, and certainly you shall not go to Gimmerton to-night.' so it is needless to order the carriage. Certainly I shall, she said, walking or riding, yet I've no objection to dress myself decently. And, ah, see how it flows down my neck now. The fire does make it smart. She insisted on my fulfilling her directions before she would let me touch her, and not till after the coachman had been instructed to get ready, and a maid set to pack up some necessary attire, did I obtain her consent for binding the wound and helping to change her garments. Now, Ellen, she said, when my task was finished, and she was seated in an easy chair on the hearth, with a cup of tea before her, you sit down opposite me, and put poor Catherine's baby away. I don't like to see it. You mustn't think I care little for Catherine, because I behaved so foolishly on entering. I've cried, too, bitterly. Yes, more than anyone else has reason to cry. We parted unreconciled, you remember, and I shan't forgive myself. But for all that I was not going to sympathise with him. The brute beast! Oh, give me the poker! This is the last thing of his I have about me. She slipped the gold ring from her third finger and threw it on the floor. I'll smash it, she continued, striking it with childish spite. And then I'll burn it. And she took and dropped the misused article among the coals. There! He shall buy another if he gets me back again. He'd be capable of coming to seek me, to tease Edgar. I dare not stay, lest that notion should possess his wicked head. And besides, Edgar has not been kind, has he? And I won't come suing for his assistance, nor will I bring him into more trouble. Necessity compels me to seek shelter here, though if I had not learned he was out of the way, I'd have halted at the kitchen, washed my face, warmed myself, got you to bring what I wanted, and departed again to anywhere out of the reach of my accursed, of that incarnate goblin. Ah, he was in such a fury! If he had caught me! 
It's a pity Earnshaw is not his match in strength. I wouldn't have run till I'd seen him all but demolished, had Hindley been able to do it. Well, don't talk so fast, miss, I interrupted. You'll disorder the handkerchief I have tied round your face, and make the cut bleed again. Drink your tea, and take breath, and give over laughing. Laughter is sadly out of place under this roof, and in your condition. An undeniable truth, she replied. Listen to that child. It maintains a constant wail. Send it out of my hearing for an hour. I shan't stay any longer. I rang the bell, and committed it to a servant's care, and then I inquired what had urged her to escape from Wuthering Heights in such an unlikely plight, and where she meant to go, as she refused remaining with us. I ought, and I wished to remain, answered she, to cheer Edgar and take care of the baby for two things, and because the Grange is my right home. But I tell you, he wouldn't let me. Do you think he could bear to see me grow fat and marry? could bear to think that we were tranquil and not resolve on poisoning our comfort. Now I have the satisfaction of being sure that he detests me, to the point of its annoying him seriously to have me with an earshot or eyesight. I notice, when I enter his presence, the muscles of his countenance are involuntarily distorted into an expression of hatred, partly arising from his knowledge of the good causes I have to feel that sentiment for him, and partly from original aversion. It is strong enough to make me feel pretty certain that he would not chase me over England, supposing I contrived a clear escape, and therefore I must get quite away. I've recovered from my first desire to be killed by him. I'd rather he'd kill himself. He has extinguished my love effectually, and so I'm at my ease. I can recollect yet how I loved him, and can dimly imagine that I could still be loving him if— no. No, even if he had doted on me, the devilish nature would have revealed its existence somehow. Catherine had an awfully perverted taste to esteem him so dearly, knowing him so well. Monster! Would that he could be blotted out of creation and out of my memory! "'Hush, hush! He's a human being,' I said. "'Be more charitable. There are worse men than he is yet.' "'He's not a human being,' she retorted and he has no claim on my charity. I gave him my heart, and he took and pinched it to death and flung it back to me. People feel with their hearts, Ellen, and since he has destroyed mine, I have not power to feel for him, and I would not, though he groaned from this to his dying day, and wept tears of blood for Catherine. No, indeed, indeed I wouldn't. And here Isabella began to cry. But, immediately dashing the water from her lashes, she recommenced. You asked what has driven me to flight at last. I was compelled to attempt it, because I had succeeded in rousing his rage a pitch above his malignity. Pulling out the nerves with red-hot pincers requires more coolness than knocking on the head. He was worked up to forget the fiendish prudence he boasted of, and proceeded to murderous violence. I experienced pleasure in being able to exasperate him. The sense of pleasure woke my instinct of self-preservation, so I fairly broke free, and if ever I come into his hands again he is welcome to a signal revenge. Yesterday, you know, Mr. Earnshaw should have been at the funeral. He kept himself sober for the purpose, tolerably sober, not going to bed mad at six o'clock and getting up drunk at twelve. Consequently he rose, in suicidal low spirits, as fit for the church as for a dance and instead he sat down by the fire and swallowed gin or brandy by tumblerfuls. Heathcliff, I shudder to name him, has been a stranger in the house from last Sunday till today. Whether the angels have fed him or his kin beneath, I cannot tell, but he has not eaten a meal with us for nearly a week. He has just come home at dawn, and gone upstairs to his chamber locking himself in, as if anybody dreamt of coveting his company. There he has continued, praying like a Methodist. Only the deity he implored is senseless dust and ashes. And God, when addressed, was curiously confounded with his own black father. After concluding these precious orisons, and they lasted generally till he grew hoarse, and his voice was strangled in his throat, he would be off again, always straight down to the Grange. I wonder Edgar did not send for a constable and give him into custody. For me— grieved as I was about Catherine, 
it was impossible to avoid regarding this season of deliverance from degrading oppression as a holiday. I recovered spirits sufficient to bear Joseph's eternal lectures without weeping, and to move up and down the house less with the foot of a frightened thief than formerly. You wouldn't think that I should cry at anything Joseph could say, but he and Hareton are detestable companions. I'd rather sit with Hindley and hear his awful talk than with Till Little Maester and his staunch supporter, that odious old man. When Heathcliff is in, I'm often obliged to seek the kitchen in their society, or starve among the damp, uninhabited chambers. When he is not, as was the case this week, I establish a table and chair at one corner of the house-fire, and never mind how Mr. Earnshaw may occupy himself, and he does not interfere with my arrangements. He is quieter now than he used to be, if no one provokes him, more sullen and depressed and less furious. Joseph affirms he's sure he's an altered man, that the Lord has touched his heart and he is saved. So is by fire. I'm puzzled to detect signs of the favourable change, but it is not my business. Yesterday evening I sat in my nook reading some old books till late on towards twelve. It seemed so dismal to go upstairs, with the wild snow blowing outside, and my thoughts continually reverting to the kirkyard and the new-made grave. I dared hardly lift my eyes from the page before me, that melancholy scene so instantly usurped its place. Hindley sat opposite, his head leant on his hand, perhaps meditating on the same subject. He had ceased drinking at a point below irrationality, and had neither stirred nor spoken during two or three hours. There was no sound through the house but the moaning wind, which shook the windows every now and then, the faint crackling of the coals, and the click of my snuffers as I removed at intervals the long wick of the candle. Hareton and Joseph were probably fast asleep in bed. It was very, very sad, and while I read I sighed, for it seemed as if all joy had vanished from the world, never to be restored. The doleful silence was broken at length by the sound of the kitchen latch. Heathcliff had returned from his watch earlier than usual, owing, I suppose, to the sudden storm. That entrance was fastened, and we heard him coming round to get in by the other. I rose with an irrepressible expression of what I felt on my lips, which induced my companion, who had been staring towards the door, to turn and look at me. "'I'll keep him out five minutes,' he exclaimed. "'He won't object.' "'No, you may keep him out the whole night for me,' I answered. "'Do. Put the key in the lock and draw the bolts.' Earnshaw accomplished this ere his guest reached the front. He then came and brought his chair to the other side of my table, leaning over it, and searching in my eyes for a sympathy with the burning hate that gleamed from his. As he both looked and felt like an assassin, he couldn't exactly find that— but he discovered enough to encourage him to speak. "'You and I,' he said, "'have each a great debt to settle with the man out yonder. If we were neither of us cowards, we might combine to discharge it. Are you as soft as your brother? Are you willing to endure to the last, and not once attempt a repayment?' "'I'm weary of enduring now,' I replied, "'and I'd be glad of a retaliation that wouldn't recoil on myself. But treachery and violence are spears pointed at both ends. They wound those who resort to them worse than their enemies. Treachery and violence are just return for treachery and violence, cried Hindley. Mrs. Heathcliff, I'll ask you to do nothing but sit still and be dumb. Tell me now, can you? I'm sure you would have as much pleasure as I in witnessing the conclusion of the fiend's existence. He'll be your death unless you overreach him, and he'll be my ruin. Damn the hellish villain! He knocks at the door as if he were master here already. Promise to hold your tongue, and before that clock strikes, it wants three minutes of one. You're a free woman. He took the implements which I described to you in my letter from his breast, and would have turned down the candle. I snatched it away, however, and seized his arm. I'll not hold my tongue, I said. You mustn't touch him. Let the door remain shut and be quiet. No, I form my resolution, and by God I'll execute it cried the desperate being. I'll do you a kindness in spite of yourself, and hurt and justice. And you needn't trouble your head to screen me. Catherine is gone. Nobody alive would regret me, or be ashamed, though I cut my throat this minute, and it's time to make an end. I might as well have struggled with a bear, or reasoned with a lunatic. 
The only resource left me was to run to a lattice and warn his intended victim of the fate which awaited him. "'You'd better seek shelter somewhere else tonight,' I exclaimed, in rather a triumphant tone. "'Mr. Earnshaw has a mind to shoot you if you persist in endeavouring to enter.' "'You'd better open the door, you—' he answered, addressing me by some elegant term that I don't care to repeat. "'I shall not meddle in the matter,' I retorted again. "'Come in and get shot, if you please. I've done my duty.' With that I shut the window and returned to my place by the fire, having too small a stock of hypocrisy at my command to pretend any anxiety for the danger that menaced him. Earnshaw swore passionately at me affirming that I loved the villain yet, and calling me all sorts of names for the base spirit I evinced. And I, in my secret heart, and conscience never reproached me, thought what a blessing it would be for him should Heathcliff put him out of misery, and what a blessing for me should he send Heathcliff to his right abode. As I sat nursing these reflections, the casement behind me was banged on to the floor by a blow from the latter individual, and his black countenance looked blightingly through. The stanchion stood too close to suffer his shoulders to follow, and I smiled, exulting in my fancied security. His hair and clothes were whitened with snow, and his sharp cannibal teeth, revealed by cold and wrath, gleamed through the dark. "'Isabella, let me in, or I'll make you repent.' He gurned, as Joseph calls it. "'I cannot commit murder,' I replied. "'Mr. Hindley stands sentinel with a knife and loaded pistol.' "'Let me in by the kitchen door,' he said. "'Hindley will be there before me,' I answered, "'and that's a poor love of yours that cannot bear a shower of snow. "'We were left in peace in our beds as long as the summer moon shone, "'but the moment a blast of winter returns you must run for shelter. "'Heathcliff, if I were you, I'd go and stretch myself over her grave "'and die like a faithful dog. "'The world is surely not worth living in now, is it?' You had distinctly impressed on me the idea that Catherine was the whole joy of your life. I can't imagine how you think of surviving her loss. He's there, is he? exclaimed my companion, rushing to the gap. If I can get my arm out, I can hit him. I'm afraid, Ellen, you'll set me down as really wicked, but you don't know all, so don't judge. I wouldn't have aided or abetted an attempt on even his life for anything. Wish that he were dead I must, and therefore I was fearfully disappointed, and unnerved by terror for the consequences of my taunting speech, when he flung himself on Earnshaw's weapon and wrenched it from his grasp. The charge exploded, and the knife, in springing back, closed into its owner's wrist. Heathcliff pulled it away by main force, slitting up the flesh as it passed on, and thrust it dripping into his pocket. He then took a stone, struck down the division between two windows, and sprang in. His adversary had fallen senseless with excessive pain and the flow of blood that gushed from an artery or large vein. The ruffian kicked and trampled on him, and dashed his head repeatedly against the flags, holding me with one hand, meantime, to prevent me summoning Joseph. He exerted preterhuman self-denial in abstaining from finishing him completely, but getting out of breath he finally desisted, and dragged the apparently inanimate body onto the settle. There he tore off the sleeve of Earnshaw's coat, and bound up the wound with brutal roughness, spitting and cursing during the operation as energetically as he had kicked before. Being at liberty, I lost no time in seeking the old servant, who, having gathered by degrees the purport of my hasty tale, hurried below, gasping, as he descended the steps too at once. What is there to do now? What is there to do now? There is this to do, thundered Heathcliff. That your master's mad, and should he last another month, I'll have him to an asylum. And how the devil did you come to fasten me out, you toothless hound? Don't stand muttering and mumbling there. Come, I'm not going to nurse him. Wash that stuff away, and mind the sparks of your candle. It is more than half brandy. And so ye be murthering on him exclaimed Joseph, lifting his hands and eyes in horror. If ever I see the seat like this, may the Lord. Heathcliff gave him a push onto his knees in the middle of the blood, and flung a towel to him. But instead of proceeding to dry it up, he joined his hands and began a prayer, which excited my laughter from its odd phraseology. I was in the condition of mind to be shocked at nothing. In fact, I was as reckless as some malefactors show themselves at the foot of the gallows. "'Oh, I forgot you,' said the tyrant. "'You do that. 
down with you and you conspire with him against me do you viper there that is work fit for you he shook me till my teeth rattled and pitched me beside joseph who steadily concluded his supplications and then rose vowing he would set off for the grange directly mr linton was a magistrate and though he had fifty wives dead he should inquire into this he was so obstinate in his resolution that Heathcliff deemed it expedient to compel from my lips a recapitulation of what had taken place, standing over me, heaving with malevolence, as I reluctantly delivered the account in answer to his questions. It required a great deal of labour to satisfy the old man that Heathcliff was not the aggressor, especially with my hardly wrung replies. However, Mr. Earnshaw soon convinced him that he was alive still. Joseph hastened to administer a dose of spirits and by their succour his master presently regained motion and consciousness. Heathcliff, aware that his opponent was ignorant of the treatment received while insensible, called him deliriously intoxicated, and said that he should not notice his atrocious conduct further, but advised him to get to bed. To my joy he left us, after giving this judicious counsel, and Hindley stretched himself on the hearthstone. I departed to my own room, marvelling that I had escaped so easily. This morning, when I came down, about half an hour before noon, Mr. Earnshaw was sitting by the fire, deadly sick. His evil genius, almost as gaunt and ghastly, leant against the chimney. Neither appeared inclined to dine, and having waited till all was cold on the table, I commenced alone. Nothing hindered me from eating heartily, and I experienced a certain sense of satisfaction and superiority, as, at intervals, I cast a look towards my silent companions, and felt the comfort of a quiet conscience within me. After I had done, I ventured on the unusual liberty of drawing near the fire, going round Earnshaw's seat, and kneeling in the corner beside him. Heathcliff did not glance my way, and I gazed up, and contemplated his features almost as confidently as if they had been turned to stone. His forehead, that I once thought so manly, and that I now think so diabolical, was shaded with a heavy cloud. His basilisk eyes were nearly quenched by sleeplessness, and weeping, perhaps, for the lashes were wet then. His lips devoid of their ferocious sneer, and sealed in an expression of unspeakable sadness. Had it been another, I would have covered my face in the presence of such grief. In his case I was gratified, and, ignoble as it seems to insult a fallen enemy, I couldn't miss this chance of sticking in a dart. His weakness was the only time when I could taste the delight of paying wrong for wrong. "'Fie, fie, miss!' I interrupted. "'One might suppose you had never opened a Bible in your life. If God afflict your enemies, surely that ought to suffice you. It is both mean and presumptuous to add your tortures to his.' "'In general I'll allow that it would be, Ellen,' she continued. "'But what misery laid on Heathcliff could content me, unless I have a hand in it? I'd rather he suffered less, if I might cause his sufferings, and he might know that I was the cause. Oh, I owe him so much! On only one condition can I hope to forgive him. It is, if I may take an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, for every wrench of agony return a wrench, reduce him to my level. As he was the first to injure, make him the first to implore pardon, and then—why then, Ellen, I might show you some generosity. But it is utterly impossible I can ever be revenged, and therefore I cannot forgive him. Hindley wanted some water, and I handed him a glass, and asked him how he was. "'Not as ill as I wish,' he replied. "'But leaving out my arm, every inch of me is a sore, as if I had been fighting with a legion of imps.' "'Yes, no wonder,' was my next remark. Catherine used to boast that she stood between you and bodily harm. She meant that certain persons would not hurt you for fear of offending her. It's well people don't really rise from their grave, or last night she might have witnessed a repulsive scene. Or not you bruised, and cut over your chest and shoulders? I can't say, he answered. But what do you mean? Did he dare to strike me when I was down? He trampled on and kicked you, and dashed you on the ground, I whispered and his mouth watered to tear you with his teeth, because he's only half man, not so much, and the rest fiend. Mr. Earnshaw looked up, like me, to the countenance of our mutual foe, who, absorbed in his anguish, seemed insensible to anything around him. 
The longer he stood, the plainer his reflections revealed their blackness through his features. Oh, if God would but give me the strength to strangle him in my last agony, I'd go to hell with joy, groaned the impatient man, writhing to rise and sinking back in despair, convinced of his inadequacy for the struggle. Nay, it's enough that he has murdered one of you, I observed aloud. At the Grange, every one knows your sister would have been living now had it not been for Mr. Heathcliff. After all, it is preferable to be hated than loved by him. When I recollect how happy we were, how happy Catherine was before he came, I'm fit to curse the day. Most likely, Heathcliff noticed more the truth of what was said than the spirit of the person who said it. His attention was roused, I saw, for his eyes rained down tears among the ashes, and he drew his breath in suffocating sighs. I stared full at him and laughed scornfully. The clouded windows of hell flashed a moment towards me. The fiend which usually looked out, however, was so dimmed and drowned that I did not fear to hazard another sound of derision. "'Get up and be gone out of my sight,' said the mourner. I guessed he uttered those words at least, though his voice was hardly intelligible. "'I beg your pardon,' I replied, "'but I loved Catherine too, and her brother requires attendance, which, for her sake, I shall supply. Now that she's dead, I see her in Hindley. Hindley has exactly her eyes, if you had not tried to gouge them out and made them black and red, and her—' "'Get up, wretched idiot, before I stamp you to death,' he cried, making a movement that caused me to make one also. "'But then,' I continued, holding myself ready to flee, "'if poor Catherine had trusted you, and assumed the ridiculous, contemptible, degrading title of Mrs. Heathcliff, she would soon have presented a similar picture. She wouldn't have borne your abominable behaviour quietly. Her detestation and disgust must have found voice.' The back of the settle and Earnshaw's person interposed between me and him, so instead of endeavouring to reach me, he snatched a dinner-knife from the table and flung it at my head. It struck beneath my ear, and stopped the sentence I was uttering. But, pulling it out, I sprang to the door and delivered another, which I hope went a little deeper than his missile. The last glimpse I caught of him was a furious rush on his part, checked by the embrace of his host, and both fell locked together on the hearth. In my flight through the kitchen, I bid Joseph speed to his master. I knocked over Hareton, who was hanging a litter of puppies from a chair-back in the doorway, and, blessed as a soul escaped from purgatory, I bounded, leaped, and flew down the steep road, then, quitting its windings, shot direct across the moor, rolling over banks and wading through marshes, precipitating myself, in fact, towards the beacon-light of the grange, and far rather would I be condemned to a perpetual dwelling in the infernal regions than, even for one night, abide beneath the roof of Wuthering Heights again." Isabella ceased speaking, and took a drink of tea. Then she rose, and bidding me put on her bonnet, and a great shawl I had brought, and turning a deaf ear to my entreaties for her to remain another hour, she stepped on to a chair, kissed Edgar's and Catherine's portraits bestowed a similar salute on me, and descended to the carriage, accompanied by Fanny, who yelped wild with joy at recovering her mistress. She was driven away, never to revisit this neighbourhood. But a regular correspondence was established between her and my master, when things were more settled. I believe her new abode was in the south, near London. There she had a son, born a few months subsequent to her escape. He was christened Linton and, from the first, she reported him to be an ailing, peevish creature. Mr. Heathcliff, meeting me one day in the village, inquired where she lived. I refused to tell. He remarked that it was not of any moment, only she must beware of coming to her brother. She should not be with him, if he had to keep her himself. Though I would give no information, he discovered, through some of the other servants, both her place of residence and the existence of the child. Still, he didn't molest her, for which forbearance she might think his aversion, I suppose. He often asked about the infant, when he saw me, and on hearing its name smiled grimly, and observed, They wish me to hate it too, do they? I don't think they wish you to know anything about it, I answered. But I'll have it, he said, when I want it. They may reckon on that. Fortunately, 
Its mother died before the time arrived, some thirteen years after the decease of Catherine, when Linton was twelve, or a little more. On the day succeeding Isabella's unexpected visit, I had no opportunity of speaking to my master. He shunned conversation, and was fit for discussing nothing. When I could get him to listen, I saw it pleased him that his sister had left her husband, whom he abhorred with an intensity which the mildness of his nature would scarcely seem to allow. So deep and sensitive was his aversion, that he refrained from going anywhere where he was likely to see or hear of Heathcliff. Grief, and that together, transformed him into a complete hermit. He threw up his office of magistrate, ceased even to attend church, avoided the village on all occasions, and spent a life of entire seclusion within the limits of his park and grounds, only varied by solitary rambles on the moors, and visits to the grave of his wife, mostly at evening, or early morning before other wanderers were abroad. But he was too good to be thoroughly unhappy long. He didn't pray for Catherine's soul to haunt him. Time brought resignation, and a melancholy sweeter than common joy. He recalled her memory with ardent, tender love, and hopeful aspiring to the better world, where he doubted not she was gone. And he had earthly consolation and affections also, for a few days, I said, he seemed regardless of the puny successor to the departed. That coldness melted as fast as snow in April, and ere the tiny thing could stammer a word or totter a step, it wielded a despot's sceptre in his heart. It was named Catherine, but he never called it the name in full, as he had never called the first Catherine short, probably because Heathcliff had had a habit of doing so. The little one was always Cathy, it formed to him a distinction from the mother, and yet a connection with her, and his attachment sprang from its relation to her, far more than from its being its own. I used to draw a comparison between him and Hindley Earnshaw, and perplex myself to explain satisfactorily why their conduct was so opposite in similar circumstances. They had both been fond husbands, and were both attached to their children, and I could not see how they shouldn't both have taken the same road for good or evil. But I thought in my mind, Hindley, with apparently the stronger head, had shown himself sadly the worse and the weaker man. When his ship struck, the captain abandoned his post, and the crew, instead of trying to save her, rushed into riot and confusion, leaving no hope for their luckless vessel. Linton, on the contrary, displayed the true courage of a loyal and faithful soul. He trusted God, and God comforted him. One hoped, and the other despaired. They chose their own lots, and were righteously doomed to endure them. But you'll not want to hear my moralising, Mr. Lockwood. You'll judge, as well as I can, all these things. At least you'll think you will, and that's the same. The end of Earnshaw was what might have been expected— it followed fast on his sisters. There were scarcely six months between them. We at the Grange never got a very succinct amount of his state preceding it. All that I did learn was on occasion of going to aid in the preparations for the funeral. Mr. Kenneth came to announce the event to my master. "'Well, Nellie,' said he, riding into the yard one morning, too early not to alarm me with an instant presentiment of bad news. "'It's yours and my turn to go into mourning at present.' Who's given us the slip now, do you think? Who? I asked in a flurry. Why, well, guess. He returned, dismounting and slinging his bridle on a hook by the door. And nip up the corner of your apron. I'm certain you'll need it. Not Mr. Heathcliff, surely, I exclaimed. What, would you have tears for him? Said the doctor. No, Heathcliff's a tough young fellow. He looks blooming today. I've just seen him. He's rapidly regaining flesh since he lost his better half. "'Who is it then, Mr. Kenneth?' I repeated impatiently. "'Hindley Earnshaw, your old friend Hindley,' he replied. "'And my wicked gossip, though he's been too wild for me this long while. "'There, I said we should draw water. "'But, cheer up, he died, true to his character, drunk as a lord. "'Poor lad, I'm sorry, too. "'One can't help missing an old companion.' though he had the worst tricks with him that ever man imagined. 
and has done me many a rascally turn. He's barely twenty-seven, it seems. But that's your own age. Who would have thought you were born in one year? I confess this blow was greater to me than the shock of Mrs. Linton's death. Ancient associations lingered round my heart. I sat down in the porch and wept as for a blood relation, desiring Mr. Kenneth to get another servant to introduce him to the master. I could not hinder myself from pondering on the question, had he had fair play? Whatever I did, that idea would bother me. It was so tiresomely pertinacious that I resolved on requesting leave to go to Wuthering Heights and assist in the last duties to the dead. Mr. Linton was extremely reluctant to consent, but I pleaded eloquently for the friendless condition in which he lay, and I said my old master and foster brother had a claim on my services as strong as his own. Besides, I reminded him that the child Heriton was his wife's nephew, and, in the absence of nearer kin, he ought to act as its guardian, and he ought to and must inquire how the property was left and look over the concerns of his brother-in-law. He was unfit for attending to such matters then, but he bid me speak to his lawyer, and at length permitted me to go. His lawyer had been Earnshaw's also. I called at the village and asked him to accompany me. He shook his head and advised that Heathcliff should be let alone, affirming if the truth were known, Harriton would be found little else than a beggar. His father died in debt, he said. The whole property is mortgaged, and the sole chance for the natural heir is to allow him an opportunity of creating some interest in the creditor's heart, that he may be inclined to deal leniently towards him. When I reached the heights, I explained that I had come to see everything carried on decently, and Joseph, who appeared in sufficient distress, expressed satisfaction at my presence. Mr. Heathcliff said he did not perceive that I was wanted, but I might stay and order the arrangements for the funeral if I chose. Correctly, he remarked, that fool's body should be buried at the crossroads without ceremony of any kind. I happened to leave him ten minutes yesterday afternoon, and in that interval he fastened the two doors of the house against me, and he has spent the night in drinking himself to death deliberately. We broke in this morning, for we heard him sporting like a horse, and there he was, laid over the settle. Flaying and scalping would not have wakened him. I sent for Kenneth, and he came, but not till the beast had changed into carrion. He was both dead and cold and stark, and so you'll allow it was useless making more stir about him. The old servant confirmed this statement, but muttered, I'd rather he'd gone in sailing for the doctor. I stood her, didn't tender the maester better nor him. And he weren't dead when I left, nor to desert. I insisted on the funeral being respectable. Mr. Heathcliff said I might have my own way there, too. Only he desired me to remember that the money for the whole affair came out of his pocket. He maintained a hard, careless deportment, indicative of neither joy nor sorrow. If anything, it expressed a flinty gratification at a piece of difficult work successfully executed. I observed once, indeed, something like exultation in his aspect. It was just when the people were bearing the coffin from the house. He had the hypocrisy to represent a mourner, and previous to following with Harriton, he lifted the unfortunate child onto the table and muttered, with peculiar gusto, Now, my bonny lad, you are mine, and we'll see if one tree won't grow as crooked as another, with the same wind to twist it. The unsuspecting thing was pleased at this speech, he played with Heathcliff's whiskers and stroked his cheek, but I divined its meaning and observed tartly. That boy must go back with me to Thrushcross Grange, sir. There is nothing in the world less yours than he is. Does Linton say so? He demanded. Of course, he has ordered me to take him, I replied. Well, said the scoundrel, we'll not argue the subject now, but I have a fancy to try my hand at rearing a young one. So intimate to your master that I must supply the place of this with my own if he attempt to remove it. I don't engage to let Hareton go undisputed, but I'll be pretty sure to make the other come. Remember to tell him. This hint was enough to bind our hands. I repeated its substance on my return, and Edgar Linton, little interested at the commencement, spoke no more of interfering. 
I'm not aware that he could have done it to any purpose, had he been ever so willing. The guest was now the master of Wuthering Heights. He held firm possession, and proved to the attorney, who, in his turn, proved it to Mr. Linton, that Earnshaw had mortgaged every yard of land he owned for cash to supply his mania for gaming, and he, Heathcliff, was the mortgagee. In that manner, Hereton, who should now be the first gentleman in the neighbourhood, was reduced to a state of complete dependence on his father's inveterate enemy, and lives in his own house as a servant, deprived of the advantage of wages, quite unable to right himself, because of his friendlessness and his ignorance that he has been wronged. End of chapter 17《The Twelve Years continued Mrs. Dean, following that dismal period were the happiest of my life. My greatest troubles in their passage rose from our little lady's trifling illnesses, which she had to experience in common with all children, rich and poor. For the rest, after the first six months, she grew like a larch, and could walk and talk too, in her own way, before the heath blossomed a second time over Mrs. Linton's dust. She was the most winning thing that ever brought sunshine into a desolate house, a real beauty in face, with the Earnshaw's handsome dark eyes, but the Linton's fair skin and small features, and yellow curling hair. Her spirit was high, though not rough, and qualified by a heart sensitive and lively to excess in its affections. That capacity for intense attachments reminded me of her mother. Still, she did not resemble her, for she could be soft and mild as a dove, and she had a gentle voice and pensive expression. Her anger was never furious, her love never fierce. It was deep and tender. However, it must be acknowledged she had faults to foil her gifts. A propensity to be saucy was one, and a perverse will that indulged children invariably acquire, whether they be good-tempered or cross. If a servant chanced to vex her, it was always, I shall tell papa, and if he reproved her, even by a look, you would have thought it a heart-breaking business. I don't believe he ever did speak a harsh word to her. He took her education entirely on himself, and made it an amusement. Fortunately, curiosity and a quick intellect made her an apt scholar, she learned rapidly and eagerly, and did honour to his teaching. Till she reached the age of thirteen, she had not once been beyond the range of the park by herself. Mr. Linton would take her with him a mile or so outside, on rare occasions, but he trusted her to no one else. Gimmerton was an unsubstantial name in her ears, the chapel the only building she had approached or entered, except her own home. Wuthering Heights and Mr. Heathcliff did not exist for her, she was a perfect recluse, and, apparently, perfectly contented. Sometimes, indeed, while surveying the country from her nursery window, she would observe, "'Alan, how long will it be before I can walk to the top of those hills? I wonder what lies on the other side. Is it the sea?' "'No, Miss Cathy,' I would answer. "'It is hills again, just like these.' "'And what are those golden rocks like when you stand under them?' she once asked. The abrupt descent of Penistone Crags particularly attracted her notice, especially when the setting sun shone on it, and the topmost heights, and the whole extent of landscape besides lay in shadow. I explained that they were bare masses of stone, with hardly enough earth in their clefts to nourish a stunted tree. And why are they bright so long after it is evening here? 
she pursued. Because they are a great deal higher up than we are, replied I. You could not climb them, they are too high and steep. In winter the frost is always there before it comes to us, and deep into summer I have found snow under that black hollow on the northeast side. Oh, you have been on them, she cried gleefully. Then I can go too, when I am a woman. Has papa been, Ellen? Papa would tell you, miss, I answered hastily, that they are not worth the trouble of visiting. The moors where you ramble with him are much nicer, and Thrushcross Park is the finest place in the world. But I know the park, and I don't know those, she murmured to herself. And I should delight to look round me from the brow of that tallest point. My little pony Minnie shall take me some time. One of the maids mentioning the fairy cave quite turned her head with a desire to fulfil this project. She teased Mr. Linton about it, and he promised she should have the journey when she got older. But Miss Catherine measured her age by months, and— Now am I old enough to go to Peniston Crags? was the constant question in her mouth. The road thither wound close by Wuthering Heights. Edgar had not the heart to pass it, so she received as constantly the answer— Not yet, love. Not yet. I said Mrs. Heathcliff lived above a dozen years after quitting her husband. Her family were of a delicate constitution. She and Edgar both lacked the ruddy health that you will generally meet in these parts. What her last illness was, I am not certain. I conjecture they died of the same thing, a kind of fever, slow at its commencement, but incurable, and rapidly consuming life towards the close. She wrote to inform her brother of the probable conclusion of a four months' indisposition under which she had suffered, and entreated him to come to her, if possible, for she had much to settle, and she wished to bid him adieu, and deliver Linton safely into his hands. Her hope was that Linton might be left with him, as he had been with her. His father, she would fain convince herself, had no desire to assume the burden of his maintenance or education. My master hesitated not a moment in complying with her request, reluctant as he was to leave home at ordinary calls. He flew to answer this, commanding Catherine to my peculiar vigilance in his absence, with reiterated orders that she must not wander out of the park. Even under my escort he did not calculate on her going unaccompanied. He was away three weeks. The first day or two my charge sat in a corner of the library, too sad for either reading or playing. In that quiet state she caused me little trouble. But it was succeeded by an interval of impatient fretful weariness, and, being too busy and too old then to run up and down amusing her, I hit on a method by which she might entertain herself. I used to send her on her travels round the grounds, now on foot and now on a pony, indulging her with a patient audience of all her real and imaginary adventures when she returned. The summer shone in full prime, and she took such a taste for this solitary rambling that she often contrived to remain out from breakfast till tea, and then the evenings were spent in recounting her fanciful tales. I did not fear her breaking bounds, because the gates were generally locked, and I thought she would scarcely venture forth alone if they had stood wide open. Unluckily, my confidence proved misplaced. Catherine came to me one morning at eight o'clock, and said she was that day an Arabian merchant going to cross the desert with his caravan, and I must give her plenty of provision for herself and beasts, a horse and three camels, personated by a large hound and a couple of pointers. I got together good stores of dainties and slung them in a basket on one side of the saddle, and she sprang up as gay as a fairy sheltered by her wide-brimmed hat and gauze veil from the July sun, and trotted off with a merry laugh, mocking my cautious counsel to avoid galloping, and come back early. The naughty thing never made her appearance at tea. One traveller, the hound, being an old dog and fond of its ease, returned, but neither Cathy nor the pony nor the two pointers were visible in any direction. I dispatched emissaries down this path and that path, and at last went wandering in search of her myself. There was a labourer working at a fence round a plantation on the borders of the grounds. I inquired of him if he had seen our young lady. I saw her at morn, he replied. She would have me to cut her hazel switch, and then she leapt her galloway over the hedge yonder, where it is lowest and galloped out of sight. You may guess how I felt at hearing this news. 
It struck me directly she must have started for Peniston Crags. What will become of her? I ejaculated, pushing through a gap which the man was repairing and making straight to the high road. I walked as if for a wager, mile after mile, till a turn brought me in view of the heights, but no Catherine could I detect far or near. The crags lie about a mile and a half beyond Mr. Heathcliff's place, and that is four from the Grange, so I began to fear night would fall ere I could reach them. And what if she should have slipped in clambering among them, I reflected, and been killed or broken some of her bones? My suspense was truly painful, and at first it gave me delightful relief to observe in hurrying by the farmhouse Charlie, the fiercest of the pointers, lying under a window with swelled head and bleeding ear. I opened the wicket and ran to the door, knocking vehemently for admittance. A woman whom I knew, and whom formerly lived at Gimmerton, answered. She had been servant there since the death of Mr. Earnshaw. Ah, said she, you are come a seeking, you little mistress. Don't be frightened. She's here safe, but I'm glad it isn't the master. He is not at home, then, is he? I panted, quite breathless with quick walking and alarm. No, no, she replied. Both he and Joseph are off, and I think they won't return this hour or more. Step in and rest you a bit. I entered and beheld my stray lamb seated on the hearth, rocking herself in a little chair that had been her mother's when a child. Her hat was hung against the wall, and she seemed perfectly at home, laughing and chattering in the best spirits imaginable to Hereton, now a great, strong lad of eighteen, who stared at her with considerable curiosity and astonishment, comprehending precious little of the fluent succession of remarks and questions which her tongue never ceased pouring forth. "'Very well, miss,' I exclaimed, concealing my joy under an angry countenance. "'This is your last ride till papa comes back. I'll not trust you over the threshold again, you naughty, naughty girl.' "'Aha! Ellen!' she cried gaily, jumping up and running to my side. "'I shall have a pretty story to tell to-night, and so you've found me out. Have you ever been here in your life before?' "'Put that hat on and home at once,' said I. "'I'm dreadfully grieved at you, Miss Cathy. You've done extremely wrong. It's no use pouting and crying. That won't repay the trouble I've had scouring the country after you. To think how Mr. Linton charged me to keep you in, and you stealing off so— it shows you are a cunning little fox, and nobody will put faith in you any more. What have I done? sobbed she, instantly checked. Papa charged me nothing. He'll not scold me, Ellen. He's never cross like you. Come, come, I repeated. I'll tie the ribbon. Now let us have no petulance. Oh, for shame, you thirteen years old and such a baby! This exclamation was caused by her pushing the hat from her head and retreating to the chimney out of my reach. Nay, said the servant. Don't be hard on the bonny lass, Mrs. Dean. We made her stop. She'd faint have ridden forward. A third you should be uneasy. Harriton offered to go with her, and I thought she should. It's a wild road over the hills. Harriton, during the discussion, stood with his hands in his pockets, too awkward for speech though he looked as if he did not relish my intrusion. "'How long am I to wait?' I continued, disregarding the woman's interference. "'It will be dark in ten minutes. Where is the pony, Miss Cathy? And where is Phoenix? I shall leave you unless you be quick, so please yourself.' "'The pony is in the yard,' she replied. "'And Phoenix is shut in there. He's bitten, and so is Charlie. I was going to tell you all about it. But you are in a bad temper and don't deserve to hear. I picked up her hat, and approached to reinstate it, but perceiving that the people of the house took her part, she commenced capering round the room, and on my giving chase ran like a mouse over and under and behind the furniture, rendering it ridiculous for me to pursue. Harriton and the woman laughed, and she joined them, and waxed more impertinent still, till I cried in great irritation. "'Well, Miss Cathy, if you were aware whose house this is, you'd be glad enough to get out. It's your father's, isn't it? said she, turning to Harriton. Nay, he replied, looking down and blushing bashfully. He could not stand a steady gaze from her eyes, though they were just his own. Whose then? Your master's? she asked. He coloured deeper, with a different feeling, muttered an oath, and turned away. 
Who is his master? Continued the tiresome girl, appealing to me. He talked about our house and our folk. I thought he had been the owner's son. And he never said miss. He should have done, shouldn't he, if he's a servant? Harriton grew black as thundercloud at this childish speech. I silently shook my questioner, and at last succeeded in equipping her for departure. Now get my horse, she said, addressing her unknown kinsman as she would one of the stable boys at the Grange. And you may come with me. I want to see where the goblin hunter rises in the marsh, and to hear about the fairishes, as you call them. But make haste. What's the matter? Get my horse, I say. I'll see thee down before I be thy servant, growled the lad. You'll see me what? asked Catherine in surprise. Damn the saucy witch, he replied. There, Miss Cathy, you see you have got into pretty company, I interposed. Nice words to be used to a young lady. Pray don't begin to dispute with him. Come, let us seek for Minnie ourselves, and be gone. But Ellen, cried she, staring fixed in astonishment. How dare he speak so to me? Mustn't he be made to do as I ask him? You wicked creature, I shall tell papa what you said. Now then. Harriton did not appear to feel this threat, so the tears sprang into her eyes with indignation. You bring the pony, she exclaimed, turning to the woman. And let my dog free this moment. Softly, miss, answered she addressed. You'll lose nothing by being civil. Though, Mr. Harriton, there, be not the master's son, he's your cousin, and I was never hired to serve you. He, my cousin, cried Cathy with a scornful laugh. Yes, indeed, responded her reprover. Oh, Ellen, don't let them say such things, she pursued in great trouble. Papa has gone to fetch my cousin from London. My cousin is a gentleman's son. That my— She stopped and wept outright, upset at the bare notion of relationship with such a clown. Hush, hush, I whispered. People can have many cousins, and of all sorts, Miss Cathy, without being any the worse for it. Only they needn't keep their company, if they be disagreeable and bad. He's not, he's not my cousin, Ellen. She went on, gathering fresh grief from reflection, and flinging herself into my arms for refuge from the idea. I was much vexed at her, and the servant, for their mutual revelations, having no doubt of Linton's approaching arrival, communicated by the former, being reported to Mr. Heathcliff, and feeling as confident that Catherine's first thought on her father's return would be to seek an explanation of the latter's assertion concerning her rude-bred kindred. Harriton, recovering from his disgust at being taken for a servant, seemed moved by her distress, and, having fetched the pony round to the door, he took to propitiate her, a fine crooked-legged terrier whelp from the kennel, and putting it into her hand, bid her whist, for he meant not. Pausing in her lamentations, she surveyed him with a glance of awe and horror, then burst forth anew. I could scarcely refrain from smiling at this antipathy to the poor fellow, who was a well-made, athletic youth, good-looking in features, and stout and healthy, but attired in garments befitting his daily occupations of working on the farm and lounging among the moors after rabbits and game. Still, I thought I could detect in his physiognomy a mind owning better qualities than his father ever possessed. Good things lost amid a wilderness of weeds, to be sure, whose rankness far overtopped their neglected growth, yet notwithstanding evidence of a wealthy soil that might yield luxuriant crops under other and favourable circumstances. Mr. Heathcliff, I believe, had not treated him physically ill, thanks to his fearless nature which offered no temptation to that course of oppression. He had none of the timid susceptibility that would have given zest to ill-treatment in Heathcliff's judgment. He appeared to have bent his malevolence on making him a brute. He was never taught to read or write, never rebuked for any bad habit which did not annoy his keeper, never led a single step towards virtue, or guarded by a single precept against vice. And from what I heard, Joseph contributed much to his deterioration by a narrow-minded partiality which prompted him to flatter and pet him, as a boy, because he was the head of the old family, 
and as he had been in the habit of accusing Catherine Earnshaw and Heathcliff when children of putting the master past his patience, and compelling him to seek solace in drink by what he termed their affled ways, so at present he laid the whole burden of Hereton's faults on the shoulders of the usurper of his property. If the lad swore, he wouldn't correct him, nor, however culpably he behaved. It gave Joseph satisfaction, apparently, to watch him go the worst lengths. He allowed that the lad was ruined, that his soul was abandoned to perdition, but then he reflected that Heathcliff must answer for it. Hareton's blood would be required at his hands, and there lay immense consolation in that thought. Joseph had instilled into him a pride of name, and of his lineage. He would, had he dared, have fostered hate between him and the present owner of the heights, but his dread of that owner amounted to superstition, and he confined his feelings regarding him to muttered innuendos and private combinations. I don't pretend to be intimately acquainted with the mode of living customary in those days at Wuthering Heights. I only speak from hearsay, for I saw little. The villagers affirmed Mr. Heathcliff was near, and a cruel hard landlord to his tenants, but the house inside had regained its ancient aspect of comfort under female management, and the scenes of riot common in Hindley's time were not now enacted within its walls. The master was too gloomy to seek companionship with any people, good or bad, and he is yet. This, however, is not making progress with my story. Miss Cathy rejected the peace-offering of the terrier and demanded her own dogs, Charlie and Phoenix. They came limping and hanging their heads, and we set out for home, sadly out of sorts, every one of us. I could not wring from my little lady how she had spent the day, except that, as I supposed, the goal of her pilgrimage was Peniston Crags, and she arrived without adventure to the gate of the farmhouse, where Hareton happened to issue forth, attended by some canine followers who attacked her train. They had a smart battle before their owners could separate them, that formed an introduction. Catherine told Hareton who she was, and where she was going, and asked him to show her the way, finally beguiling him to accompany her. He opened the mysteries of the fairy cave, and twenty other queer places. But, being in disgrace, I was not favoured with a description of the interesting objects she saw. I could gather, however, that her guide had been a favourite till she hurt his feelings by addressing him as a servant, and Heathcliff's housekeeper hurt hers by calling him her cousin. Then the language he had held to her rankled in her heart, she who was always love and darling and queen and angel with everybody at the Grange, to be insulted so shockingly by a stranger. She did not comprehend it, and hard work I had to obtain a promise that she would not lay the grievance before her father. I explained how he objected to the whole household at the Heights, and how sorry he would be to find she had been there. But I insisted most on the fact that if she revealed my negligence of his orders, he would perhaps be so angry that I should have to leave, and Cathy couldn't bear that prospect. She pledged her word, and kept it for my sake. After all, she was a sweet little girl. End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A letter, edged with black, announced the day of my master's return. Isabella was dead, and he wrote to bid me get mourning for his daughter, and arrange a room and other accommodations for his youthful nephew. Catherine ran wild with joy at the idea of welcoming her father back and indulged most sanguine anticipations of the innumerable excellencies of her real cousin. The evening of their expected arrival came, since early morning she had been busy ordering her own small affairs, and now attired in her new black frock, poor thing, her aunt's death impressed her with no definite sorrow, she obliged me by constant worrying to walk with her down through the grounds to meet them. "'Linton is just six months younger than I am,' she chattered as we strolled leisurely over the swells and hollows of mossy turf, under shadow of the trees. "'How delightful it will be to have him for a playfellow! Aunt Isabella sent Papa a beautiful lock of his hair. It was lighter than mine, more flaxen and quite as fine. I have it carefully preserved in a little glass box. 
and I've often thought what a pleasure it would be to see its owner. Oh, I am happy! And papa, dear, dear papa! Come, Ellen, let us run! Come, run! She ran and returned and ran again many times before my sober footsteps reached the gate, and then she seated herself on the grassy bank beside the path and tried to wait patiently. But that was impossible. She couldn't be still a minute. How long they are! she exclaimed. Ah, oh, I see some dust on the road. They are coming. No. When will they be here? May we not go a little way? Half a mile, Ellen, only just half a mile. Do say yes. To that clump of birches at the turn. I refused staunchly. At length her suspense was ended. The travelling carriage rolled in sight. Miss Cathy shrieked and stretched out her arms as soon as she caught her father's face looking from the window. He descended, nearly as eager as herself, and a considerable interval elapsed ere they had a thought to spare for any but themselves. While they exchanged caresses, I took a peep in to see after Linton. He was asleep in a corner, wrapped in a warm fur-lined cloak, as if it had been winter, a pale, delicate, effeminate boy, who might have been taken for my master's younger brother, so strong was the resemblance, but there was a sickly peevishness in his aspect that Edgar Linton never had. The latter saw me looking, and having shaken hands advised me to close the door and leave him undisturbed, for the journey had fatigued him. Cathy would fain have taken one glance, but her father told her to come, and they walked together up the park, while I hastened before to prepare the servants. "'Now, darling,' said Mr. Linton, addressing his daughter, as they halted at the bottom of the front steps, "'your cousin is not so strong and so merry as you are, and he has lost his mother, remember, a very short time since. Therefore don't expect him to play and run about with you directly.' and don't harass him much by talking let him be quiet this evening at least will you yes yes papa answered catherine but i do want to see him and he hasn't once looked out the carriage stopped and the sleeper being roused was lifted to the ground by his uncle this is your cousin cathy linton he said putting their little hands together she's fond of you already and mind you don't grieve her by crying to-night Try to be cheerful now. The travelling is at an end, and you have nothing to do but rest and amuse yourself as you please. Let me go to bed, then, answered the boy, shrinking from Catherine's salute, and he put his fingers to remove incipient tears. Come, come, there's a good child, I whispered, leading him in. You make her weep, too. See how sorry she is for you. I do not know whether it was sorrow for him, but his cousin put on as sad a countenance as himself, and returned to her father. All three entered, and mounted to the library, where tea was laid ready. I proceeded to remove Linton's cap and mantle, and placed him on a chair by the table. But he was no sooner seated than he began to cry afresh. My master inquired what was the matter. "'I can't sit on a chair,' sobbed the boy. "'Go to the sofa, then, and Ellen shall bring you some tea.' answered his uncle patiently. He had been greatly tried during the journey, I felt convinced, by his fretful ailing charge. Linton slowly trailed himself off and lay down. Cathy carried a footstool and her cup to his side. At first she sat silent, but that could not last. She had resolved to make a pet of her little cousin, and she would have him to be, and she commenced stroking his curls and kissing his cheek and offering him tea in her saucer like a baby. This pleased him, for he was not much better. He dried his eyes and lightened into a faint smile. "'Oh, he'll do very well,' said the master to me, after watching them a minute. "'Very well, if we can keep him, Ellen. The company of a child of his own age will instil new spirit into him soon, and by wishing for strength he'll gain it.' "'Aye, if we can keep him,' I mused to myself and saw misgivings came over me that there was slight hope of that. And then I thought, how ever will that weakling live at Wuthering Heights? Between his father and Hereton, what playmates and instructors they'll be! Our doubts were presently decided, even earlier than I expected. I had just taken the children upstairs, after tea was finished, and seen Linton asleep, 
he would not suffer me to leave him till that was the case. I had come down, and was standing by the table in the hall, lighting a bedroom candle for Mr. Edgar, when a maid stepped out of the kitchen and informed me that Mr. Heathcliff's servant Joseph was at the door, and wished to speak with the master. "'I shall ask him what he wants first, I said, in considerable trepidation. "'A very unlikely hour to be troubling people, and the instant they have returned from a long journey. "'I don't think the master can see him.' Joseph had advanced through the kitchen as I uttered these words, and now presented himself in the hall. He was donned in his Sunday garments, with his most sanctimonious and sourest face, and, holding his hat in one hand and his stick in the other, he proceeded to clean his shoes on the mat. "'Good evening, Joseph,' I said coldly. "'What business brings you here tonight? "'It's Mr. Linton I mun speak to.' he answered, waving me disdainfully aside. "'Mr. Linton is going to bed. Unless you have something particular to say, I'm sure he won't hear it now,' I continued. "'You had better sit down in there, and entrust your message to me.' "'Which is his ram?' pursued the fellow, surveying the range of closed doors. I perceived he was bent on refusing my mediation, so very reluctantly I went up to the library and announced the unseasonable visitor, advising that he should be dismissed till next day. Mr. Linton had no time to empower me to do so, for Joseph mounted close at my heels, and, pushing into the apartment, planted himself at the far side of the table, with his two fists clapped on the head of his stick, and began in an elevated tone, as if anticipating opposition. Heathcliff has sent me for his lad, and I want to go back, boat him. Edgar Linton was silent a minute. An expression of exceeding sorrow overcast his features. He would have pitied the child on his own account, but, recalling Isabella's hopes and fears, and anxious wishes for her son, and her commendations of him to his care, he grieved bitterly at the prospect of yielding him up, and searched in his heart how it might be avoided. No plan offered itself. The very exhibition of any desire to keep him would have rendered the claimant more peremptory. There was nothing left but to resign him. However, he was not going to rouse him from his sleep. "'Tell Mr. Heathcliff,' he answered calmly, "'that his son shall come to Wuthering Heights to-morrow. He is in bed, and too tired to go the distance now. You may also tell him that the mother of Linton desired him to remain under my guardianship, and at present his health is very precarious.' "'No,' said Joseph, giving a thud with his prop on the floor, and assuming an authoritative air. "No." That means not. Heathcliff makes no account of the mother, nor to norther, but he'll hurry his lad, and I won't take him. So now ye you know. You shall not to-night, answered Linton decisively. Walk down the stairs at once, and repeat to your master what I have said. Ellen, show him down. Go. And, aiding the indignant elder with a lift by the arm, he rid the room of him and closed the door. "'Very well,' shouted Joseph, as he slowly drew off. "'To morn he's come in cell, and thrust him out, if ye dare.'" End of chapter 19「Chapter 20 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To obviate the danger of this threat being fulfilled, Mr. Linton commissioned me to take the boy home early, on Catherine's pony, and, said he, As we shall now have no influence over his destiny, good or bad, you must say nothing of where he has gone to my daughter. She cannot associate with him hereafter, and it is better for her to remain in ignorance of his proximity, lest she should be restless and anxious to visit the heights. Merely tell her his father sent for him suddenly, and he has been obliged to leave us. Linton was very reluctant to be roused from his bed at five o'clock, and astonished to be informed that he must prepare for further travelling. But I softened off the matter by stating that he was going to spend some time with his father, Mr. Heathcliff, who wished to see him so much, he did not like to defer the pleasure till he should recover from his late journey. My father! he cried in strange perplexity. Mamma never told me I had a father. Where does he live? 
I'd rather stay with Uncle. He lives a little distance from the Grange, I replied, just beyond those hills, not so far, but you may walk over here when you get hearty, and you should be glad to go home and to see him. You must try to love him, as you did your mother, and then he will love you. But why have I not heard of him before? asked Linton. Why didn't Mamma and he live together, as other people do? He had business to keep him in the north, I answered, and your mother's health required her to reside in the south. And why didn't Mamma speak to me about him? persevered the child. She often talked of Uncle, and I learned to love him long ago. How am I to love Papa? I don't know him. Oh, all children love their parents, I said. Your mother perhaps thought you would want to be with him if she mentioned him often to you. Let us make haste. An early ride on such a beautiful morning is much preferable to an hour's more sleep. Is she to go with us? he demanded. The little girl I saw yesterday? Not now, replied I. Is uncle? he continued. No, I shall be your companion there. I said. Linton sank back on his pillow and fell into a brown study. I won't go without uncle, he cried at length. I can't tell where you mean to take me. I attempted to persuade him of the naughtiness of showing reluctance to meet his father. Still, he obstinately resisted any progress towards dressing, and I had to call for my master's assistance in coaxing him out of bed. The poor thing was finally got off, with several delusive assurances that his absence should be short, that Mr. Edgar and Cathy would visit him, and other promises equally ill-founded, which I invented and reiterated at intervals throughout the way. The pure heather-scented air, the bright sunshine, and the gentle canter of Minnie relieved his despondency after a while. He began to put questions concerning his new home and its inhabitants with greater interest and liveliness. Is Wuthering Heights as pleasant a place as Threshcross Grange? He inquired, turning to take a last glance into the valley, whence a light mist mounted and formed a fleecy cloud on the skirts of the blue. It is not so buried in trees, I replied, and it is not quite so large, but you can see the country beautifully all round, and the air is healthier for you, fresher and drier. You will, perhaps, think the building old and dark at first, though it is a respectable house, the next best in the neighbourhood, and you will have such nice rambles on the moors. Hereton Earnshaw, that is, Miss Cathy's other cousin, and so yours in a manner, will show you all the sweetest spots, and you can bring a book in fine weather, and make a green hollow your study, and now and then your uncle may join you in a walk. He does frequently walk out on the hills." "'And what is my father like?' he asked. "'Is he as young and handsome as uncle?' "'He is as young,' said I. "'But he has black hair and eyes, and looks sterner, "'and he is taller and bigger altogether. "'He'll not seem to you so gentle and kind at first, perhaps, "'because it is not his way. "'Still, mind you, be frank and cordial with him, "'and naturally he'll be fonder of you than any uncle, "'for you are his own.' Black hair and eyes, mused Linton. I can't fancy him. Then I am not like him, am I? Not much, I answered. Not a morsel, I thought, surveying with regret the white complexion and slim frame of my companion, and his large languid eyes, his mother's eyes, save that, unless a morbid touchiness kindled them a moment, they had not a vestige of her sparkling spirit. How strange that he should never come to see Mamma and me, he murmured. Has he ever seen me? If he has, I must have been a baby. I remember not a single thing about him. Why, Master Linton, said I, three hundred miles is a great distance, and ten years seem very different in length to a grown-up person compared with what they do to you. It is probable Mr. Heathcliff proposed going from summer to summer, but never found a convenient opportunity, and now it is too late. Don't trouble him with questions on the subject. It will disturb him for no good. 
the boy was fully occupied with his own cogitations for the remainder of the ride, till we halted before the farmhouse garden gate. I watched to catch his impressions in his countenance. He surveyed the carved front and low-browed lattices, the straggling gooseberry bushes and crooked firs, with solemn intentness, and then shook his head, his private feelings entirely disapproved of the exterior of his new abode, but he had sense to postpone complaining, there might be compensation within. Before he dismounted, I went and opened the door. It was half-past six, the family had just finished breakfast, the servant was clearing and wiping down the table. Joseph stood by his master's chair, telling some tale concerning a lame horse, and Hereton was preparing for the hayfield. "'Hello, Nelly,' said Mr. Heathcliff, when he saw me. "'I feared I should have to come down and fetch my property myself. You've brought it, have you? Let us see what we can make of it.' He got up and strode to the door. Hereton and Joseph followed in gaping curiosity. Poor Linton ran a frightened eye over the faces of the three. "'Surely,' said Joseph, after a grave inspection, "'he swap wi' ye, maester, and yon's his lass.' Heathcliff, having stared his son into an ague of confusion, uttered a scornful laugh. "'God, what a beauty! What a lovely, charming thing!' he exclaimed. "'Haven't they reared it on snails and sour milk, Nelly? Oh, damn my soul, but that's worse than I expected. And the devil knows I was not sanguine.' I bid the trembling and bewildered child get down and enter. He did not thoroughly comprehend the meaning of his father's speech, or whether it were intended for him. Indeed, he was not yet certain that the grim, sneering stranger was his father, but he clung to me with growing trepidation, and on Mr. Heathcliff's taking a seat and bidding him come hither, he hid his face on my shoulder and wept. Tut tut, said Heathcliff, stretching out a hand and dragging him roughly between his knees, and then holding up his head by the chin. None of that nonsense. We're not going to hurt thee, Linton. Isn't that thy name? Thou art thy mother's child entirely. Where is my share in thee, puling chicken? He took off the boy's cap, and pushed back his thick flaxen curls, felt his slender arms and his small fingers, during which examination Linton ceased crying, and lifted his great blue eyes to inspect the inspector. Do you know me? asked Heathcliff, having satisfied himself that the limbs were all equally frail and feeble. No said Linton, with a gaze of vacant fear. "'You've heard of me, I dare say?' "'No,' he replied again. "'No! What a shame of your mother never to waken your filial regard for me! You are my son, then, I'll tell you, and your mother was a wicked slut to leave you in ignorance of the sort of father you possessed. Now don't wince and colour up, though it is something to see you have not white blood. Be a good lad, and I'll do for you.' Nelly, if you be tired, you may sit down. If not, get home again. I guess you'll report what you hear and see to the cipher at the Grange, and this thing won't be settled while you linger about it. Well, replied I, I hope you'll be kind to the boy, Mr. Heathcliff, or you'll not keep him long, and he's all you have akin in the wide world that you will ever know. Remember. I'll be very kind to him, you needn't fear, he said, laughing. Only nobody else must be kind to him. I'm jealous of monopolizing his affection. And, to begin my kindness, Joseph, bring the lad some breakfast. Hareton, you infernal calf, be gone to your work. Yes, Nell, he added, when they had departed. My son is prospective owner of your place, and I should not wish him to die till I was certain of being his successor. Besides, he's mine, and I want the triumph of seeing my descendant fairly lord of their estates, my child hiring their children to till their father's lands for wages. That is the sole consideration which can make me endure the whelp. I despise him for himself, and hate him for the memories he revives. But that consideration is sufficient. He's as safe with me, and shall be tended as carefully as your master tends his own. I have a room upstairs furnished for him in handsome style. I've engaged a tutor also to come three times a week from twenty miles' distance to teach him what he pleases to learn. I've ordered Hareton to obey him, and, in fact, I've arranged everything with a view to preserve the superior and the gentleman in him above his associates. I do regret, however, that he so little deserves the trouble. If I wished any blessing in the world, it was to find him a worthy object of pride. 
and i'm bitterly disappointed with the way-faced whining wretch while he was speaking joseph returned bearing a basin of milk porridge and placed it before linton who stirred round the homely mess with a look of aversion and affirmed he could not eat it i saw the old man-servant shared largely in his master's scorn of the child though he was compelled to retain the sentiment in his heart because heathcliff plainly meant his underlings to hold him in honour cannot eat it repeated he peering in linton's face and subduing his voice to a whisper for fear of being overheard but maister hareton never ate naught else when he were a little un and what were good enough for him is good enough for ye i rather think i shan't eat it answered linton snappishly take it away joseph snatched up the food indignantly and brought it to us is there aught i as they victuals thrusting the tray under heathcliff's nose what should ail them he said why answered joseph yon dainty chap says he cannot eat em but i guess it's right his mother were just so we were almost too mucky to sow to corn for muck and her bread. Don't mention his mother to me, said the master angrily. Get him something that he can eat, that's all. What is his usual food, Nelly? I suggested boiled milk or tea, and the housekeeper received instructions to prepare some. Come, I reflected, his father's selfishness may contribute to his comfort. He perceives his delicate constitution and the necessity of treating him tolerably. I'll console Mr. Edgar by acquainting him with the turn Heathcliff's humour has taken. Having no excuse for lingering longer, I slipped out, while Linton was engaged in timidly rebuffing the advances of a friendly sheepdog. But he was too much on the alert to be cheated. As I closed the door, I heard a cry, and a frantic repetition of the words, Don't leave me! I'll not stay here! I'll not stay here! Then the latch was raised and fell. They did not suffer him to come forth. I mounted Minnie and urged her to a trot, and so my brief guardianship ended. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. We had sad work with little Cathy that day. She rose in high glee, eager to join her cousin, and such passionate tears and lamentations followed the news of his departure that Edgar himself was obliged to soothe her by affirming he should come back soon. He added, however, If I can get him, and there were no hopes of that. This promise poorly pacified her, but time was more potent, and though still at intervals she inquired of her father when Linton would return, before she did see him again, his features had waxed so dim in her memory that she did not recognise him. When I chanced to encounter the housekeeper of Wuthering Heights in paying business visits to Gimmerton, I used to ask how the young master got on, for he lived almost as secluded as Catherine herself, and was never to be seen. I could gather from her that he continued in weak health, and was a tiresome inmate. She said Mr. Heathcliff seemed to dislike him ever longer and worse, though he took some trouble to conceal it. He had an antipathy to the sound of his voice, and could not do at all with his sitting in the same room with him many minutes together. There seldom passed much talk between them. Linton learnt his lessons and spent his evenings in a small apartment they called the parlour, or else lay in bed all day, for he was constantly getting coughs and colds and aches and pains of some sort. "'And I am never no such a faint-hearted creature,' added the woman. "'No one so careful of his own. "'He will go on, if I leave the window open a bit late in the evening. "'Oh, it's killing and breathing a night air. "'And he must have a fire in the middle of summer, "'and Joseph's backer pipe is poison, "'and he must always have sweets and dainties, "'and always milk, milk forever, "'heeding not how the rest of us are pinched in the winter.' And there he'll sit, wrapped in his furred cloak in his chair by the fire, with some toast and water or other slop on the hob to sip at. And if Harriton, for petty, comes to amuse him, Harriton is not bad-natured, though he's rough. They're sure to part, one swearing and the other crying. I believe the master would relish Earnishaw's trashing him to a mummy, if he were not his son. 
and I'm certain he would be fit to turn him out of doors if he knew half the nursing he gives his old. But then he won't go into danger of temptation. He never enters the parlour, and should Linton show those ways in the house where he is, he sends him upstairs directly. I divined from this account that utter lack of sympathy had rendered young Heathcliff selfish and disagreeable if he were not so originally, and my interest in him, consequently, decayed, though still I was moved with a sense of grief at his lot, and a wish that he had been left with us. Mr. Edgar encouraged me to gain information. He thought a great deal about him, I fancy, and would have run some risk to see him, and he told me once to ask the housekeeper whether he ever came into the village. She said he had only been twice on horseback, accompanying his father, and both times he pretended to be quite knocked up for three or four days afterwards. That housekeeper left, if I recollect rightly, two years after he came, and another, whom I did not know, was her successor. She lives there still. Time wore on at the Grange in its former pleasant way, till Miss Cathy reached sixteen. On the anniversary of her birth, we never manifested any signs of rejoicing, because it was also the anniversary of my late mistress's death. Her father invariably spent the day alone in the library, and walked at dusk, as far as Gimmerton Kirkyard, where he would frequently prolong his stay beyond midnight. Therefore Catherine was thrown on her own resources for amusement. This twentieth of March was a beautiful spring day, and when her father had retired, my young lady came down dressed for going out, and said she asked to have a ramble on the edge of the moor with me. Mr. Linton had given her leave, if we went only a short distance and were back within the hour. "'So make haste, Ellen,' she cried. "'I know where I wish to go, where a colony of moor game are settled. I want to see whether they have made their nests yet.' "'That must be a good distance up,' I answered. "'They don't breed on the edge of the moor.' "'No, it's not,' she said. "'I've gone very near with papa.' I put on my bonnet and sallied out, thinking nothing more of the matter. She bounded before me and returned to my side, and was off again like a young greyhound, and, at first, I found plenty of entertainment in listening to the larks singing far and near, and enjoying the sweet, warm sunshine, and watching her, my pet and my delight, with her golden ringlets flying loose behind, and her bright cheek, as soft and pure in its bloom as a wild rose, and her eyes radiant with cloudless pleasure. She was a happy creature, and an angel in those days. It's a pity she could not be content. Well, said I, where are your moor game, Miss Cathy? We should be at them. The Grange Park fence is a great way off now. Oh, a little further, only a little further, Ellen, was her answer continually. Climb to that hillock, pass that bank, and by the time you reach the other side I shall have raised the birds. But there were so many hillocks and banks to climb and pass that, at length, I began to be weary, and told her we must halt, and retrace our steps. I shouted to her, as she had outstripped me a long way. She either did not hear or did not regard, for she still sprang on, and I was compelled to follow. Finally she dived into a hollow, and before I came in sight of her again, she was two miles nearer Wuthering Heights than her own home, and I beheld a couple of persons arrest her, one of whom I felt convinced was Mr. Heathcliff himself. Cathy had been caught in the act of plundering, or at least hunting out the nests of the grouse. The heights were Heathcliff's land, and he was reproving the poacher. "'I've neither taken any nor found any,' she said, as I toiled to them, expanding her hands in corroboration of the statement. "'I didn't mean to take them, but Papa told me there were quantities up here, and I wished to see the eggs.' Heathcliff glanced at me with an ill-meaning smile, expressing his acquaintance with the party, and, consequently, his malevolence towards it, and demanded who Papa was. "'Mr. Linton of Thrushcross Grange,' she replied, "'I thought you did not know me, or you wouldn't have spoken in that way.' "'You suppose Papa is highly esteemed and respected, then?' he said sarcastically. "'And what are you?' inquired Catherine, gazing curiously on the speaker. "'That man I've seen before. Is he your son?' She pointed to Hareton, the other individual, who had gained nothing but increased bulk and strength by the addition of two years to his age. He seemed as awkward and rough as ever. "'Miss Cathy,' I interrupted, 
It will be three hours instead of one that we are out presently. We really must go back. No, that man is not my son, answered Heathcliff, pushing me aside. But I have one, and you have seen him before, too. And though your nurse is in a hurry, I think both you and she would be the better for a little rest. Will you just turn this nab of heath and walk into my house? You'll get home earlier for the ease, and you shall receive a kind welcome. I whispered Catherine that she mustn't on any account accede to the proposal. It was entirely out of the question. Why? she asked aloud. I'm tired of running, and the ground is dewy. I can't sit here. Let us go, Ellen. Besides, he says I have seen his son. He's mistaken, I think. But I guess where he lives. At the farmhouse I visited in coming from Peniston Crags. Don't you? I do. Come, Nelly, hold your tongue. It will be a treat for her to look in on us. Hareton, get forwards with the lass. You shall walk with me, Nelly. No, she's not going to any such place, I cried, struggling to release my arm, which he had seized. But she was almost at the door-stones already, scampering round the brow at full speed. Her appointed companion did not pretend to escort her. He shied off by the roadside and vanished. Mr. Heathcliff, it's very wrong, I continued. You know you mean no good, and there she'll see Linton, and all will be told as soon as ever we return, and I shall have the blame. I want her to see Linton, he answered. He's looking better these few days, and it's not often he's fit to be seen, and we'll soon persuade her to keep the visit secret. Where is the harm of it? The harm of it is that her father would hate me if he found I suffered her to enter your house, and I am convinced you have a bad design in encouraging her to do so. I replied. My design is as honest as possible. I'll inform you of its whole scope. He said. That the two cousins may fall in love and get married. I'm acting generously to your master. His young chit has no expectations, and should she second my wishes, she'll be provided for at once as joint successor with Linton. If Linton died, I answered, and his life is quite uncertain, Catherine would be the heir. No, she would not, he said. There is no clause in the will to secure it so. His property would go to me, but, to prevent disputes, I desire their union, and am resolved to bring it about. And I am resolved she shall never approach your house with me again, I returned, as we reached the gate, where Miss Cathy waited our coming. Heathcliff bade me be quiet, and, proceeding us up the path, hastened to open the door. My young lady gave him several looks, as if she could not exactly make up her mind what to think of him. But now he smiled when he met her eye, and softened his voice in addressing her, and I was foolish enough to imagine the memory of her mother might disarm him from desiring her injury. Linton stood on the hearth. He had been out walking in the fields, for his cap was on, and he was calling to Joseph to bring him dry shoes. He had grown tall of his age, still wanting some months of sixteen. His features were pretty yet, and his eye and complexion brighter than I remembered them, though with merely temporary luster borrowed from the salubrious air and genial sun. Now, who is that? asked Mr. Heathcliff, turning to Cathy. Can you tell? Your son, she said, having doubtfully surveyed first one and then the other. Yes, yes, answered he. But is this the only time you have beheld him? Think. Ah, you have a short memory. Linton, don't you recall your cousin that you used to tease us so with wishing to see? What? Linton? cried Cathy, kindling into joyful surprise at the name. Is that little Linton? He's taller than I am. Are you Linton? The youth stepped forward and acknowledged himself. She kissed him fervently, and they gazed with wonder at the change time had wrought in the appearance of each. Catherine had reached her full height. Her figure was both plump and slender, elastic as steel, and her whole aspect sparkling with health and spirits. Linton's looks and movements were very languid, and his form extremely slight, but there was a grace in his manner that mitigated these defects, and rendered him not unpleasing. After exchanging numerous marks of fondness with him, his cousin went to Mr. Heathcliff, who lingered by the door, dividing his attention between the objects inside and those that lay without pretending, that is, to observe the latter, and really noting the former alone. "'And you are my uncle, then?' she cried, 
reaching up to salute him. I thought I liked you, though you were cross at first. Why don't you visit at the Grange with Linton? To live all these years such close neighbours and never see us is odd. What have you done so for? I visited it once or twice too often before you were born, he answered. There, damn it, if you have any kisses to spare, give them to Linton. They are thrown away on me. Naughty Ellen, exclaimed Catherine, flying to attack me next with her lavish caresses. Wicked Ellen, to try to hinder me from entering. But I'll take this walk every morning in future. May I, uncle? And sometimes bring papa. Won't you be glad to see us? Of course, replied the uncle, with a hardly suppressed grimace resulting from his deep aversion to both the proposed visitors. But stay, he continued, turning towards the young lady. Now I think of it, I'd better tell you. Mr. Linton has a prejudice against me. We quarrelled at one time of our lives with unchristian ferocity, and if you mention coming here to him, he'll put a veto on your visits altogether. Therefore you must not mention it, unless you be careless of seeing your cousin hereafter. You may come, if you will, but you must not mention it. Why did you quarrel? asked Catherine, considerably crestfallen. He thought me too poor to wed his sister, answered Heathcliff, and was grieved that I got her. His pride was hurt, and he'll never forgive it. That's wrong, said the young lady. Some time I'll tell him so. But Linton and I have no share in your quarrel. I'll not come here, then. He shall come to the Grange. It will be too far for me, murmured her cousin. To walk four miles would kill me. No, come here, Miss Catherine, now and then. Not every morning, but once or twice a week. The father launched towards his son a glance of bitter contempt. I am afraid, Nelly, I shall lose my labour, he muttered to me. Miss Catherine, as the ninny calls her, will discover his value and send him to the devil. Now, if it had been Hareton, do you know that twenty times a day I covet Hareton with all his degradation? I'd have loved the lad had he been someone else. But I think he's safe from her love. I'll pit him against that paltry creature unless it bestir itself briskly. We calculate it will scarcely last till it is eighteen. Ah, oh, confound the vapid thing! He's absorbed in drying his feet and never looks at her. Linton! Yes, father, answered the boy. Have you nothing to show your cousin anywhere about, not even a rabbit or a weasel's nest? Take her into the garden before you change your shoes, and into the stable to see your horse. Wouldn't you rather sit here? asked Linton, addressing Cathy in a tone which expressed reluctance to move again. I don't know, she replied, casting a longing look to the door, and evidently eager to be active. He kept his seat, and shrank closer to the fire. Heathcliff rose, and went into the kitchen, and from thence to the yard, calling out for Hareton. Hareton responded, and presently the two re-entered. The young man had been washing himself, as was visible by the glow on his cheeks and his wetted hair. Oh, I'll ask you, uncle, cried Miss Cathy, recollecting the housekeeper's assertion. That is not my cousin. Is he? Yes, he replied. Your mother's nephew. Don't you like him? Catherine looked queer. Is he not a handsome lad? He continued. The uncivil little thing stood on tiptoe and whispered a sentence in Heathcliff's ear. He laughed. Hareton darkened. I perceived he was very sensitive to suspected slights, and had obviously a dim notion of his inferiority. But his master, or guardian, chased the frown by exclaiming, You'll be the favourite among us, Hareton. She says you are a, what was it? Well, something very flattering. Here, you go with her round the farm, and behave like a gentleman, mind. Don't use any bad words, and don't stare when the young lady is not looking at you, and be ready to hide your face when she is, and when you speak, say your words slowly, and keep your hands out of your pockets. Be off, and entertain her as nicely as you can. He watched the couple walking past the window. Earnshaw had his countenance completely averted from his companion. He seemed studying the familiar landscape with a stranger's and an artist's interest. Catherine took a sly look at him, expressing small admiration. She then turned her attention to seeking out objects of amusement for herself, 
and tripped merrily on, lilting a tune to supply the lack of conversation. I've tied his tongue, observed Heathcliff. He'll not venture a single syllable all the time. Nelly, you recollect me at his age, nay, some years younger. Did I ever look so stupid, so gaumless, as Joseph calls it? Worse, I replied, because more sullen with it. I've a pleasure in him, he continued, reflecting aloud. He has satisfied my expectations. If he were a born fool, I should not enjoy it half so much. But he's no fool, and I can sympathize with all his feelings, having felt them myself. I know what he suffers now, for instance, exactly. It is merely a beginning of what he shall suffer, though. And he'll never be able to emerge from his bathos of coarseness and ignorance. I have got him faster than his scoundrel of a father secured me, and lower for he takes a pride in his brutishness. I've taught him to scorn everything extra-animal as silly and weak. Don't you think Hindley would be proud of his son if he could see him? Almost as proud as I am of mine. But there's this difference. One is gold put to the use of paving stones, and the other is tin polished to ape a service of silver. Mine has nothing valuable about it, yet I shall have the merit of making it go as far as such poor stuff can go. His had first-rate qualities, and they are lost, rendered worse than unavailing. I have nothing to regret. He would have more than any but I are aware of. And the best of it is, Hareton is damnably fond of me. You'll own that I've outmatched Hindley there. If the dead villain could rise from his grave to abuse me for his offspring's wrongs, I should have the fun of seeing the said offspring fight him back again, indignant that he should dare to rail at the one friend he has in the world. Heathcliff chuckled a fiendish laugh at the idea. I made no reply, because I saw that he expected none. Meantime, our young companion, who sat too removed from us to hear what was said, began to evince symptoms of uneasiness, probably repenting that he had denied himself the treat of Catherine's society for fear of a little fatigue. His father remarked the restless glances wandering to the window, and the hand irresolutely extended towards his cap. "'Get up, you idle boy!' he exclaimed with assumed heartiness. "'Away, after them. They are just at the corner, by the stand of hives.' Linton gathered his energies and left the hearth. The lattice was open, and, as he stepped out, I heard Cathy inquiring of her unsociable attendant what was that inscription over the door. Harriton stared up and scratched his head like a true clown. "'It's some damnable writing,' he answered. "'I cannot read it.' "'Can't read it?' cried Catherine. "'I can read it. It's English. But I want to know why it is there.' Linton giggled, the first appearance of mirth he had exhibited. "'He does not know his letters,' he said to his cousin. "'Could you believe in the existence of such a colossal dunce?' "'Is he all as he should be?' asked Miss Cathy seriously. "'Or is he simple? Not right? I've questioned him twice now, and each time he looked so stupid I think he does not understand me. I can hardly understand him, I'm sure.' Lenton repeated his laugh and glanced at Hareton tauntingly, who certainly did not seem quite clear of comprehension at that moment. "'There's nothing the matter but laziness. Is there, Earnshaw?' he said. "'My cousin fancies you are an idiot. There you experience the consequence of scorning book-learning, as you would say. Have you noticed, Catherine?' his frightful Yorkshire pronunciation. "'Why, where the devil is the use on it?' growled Hareton, more ready in answering his daily companion. He was about to enlarge further, but the two youngsters broke into a noisy fit of merriment, my giddy miss being delighted to discover that she might turn his strange talk to matter of amusement. "'Where's the use of the devil in that sentence?' tittered Linton. Papa told you not to say any bad words, and you can't open your mouth without one. Do try to behave like a gentleman. Now do. If thou weren't more a lass than a lad, I'd fell thee this minute, I would. Pitiful lath of a creator, retorted the angry boar, retreating, while his face burnt with mingled rage and mortification. 
for he was conscious of being insulted, and embarrassed how to resent it. Mr. Heathcliff, having overheard the conversation as well as I, smiled when he saw him go, but immediately afterwards cast a look of singular aversion on the flippant pair who remained chattering in the doorway, the boy finding animation enough while discussing Harriton's faults and deficiencies, and relating anecdotes of his goings-on, and the girl relishing his pert and spiteful sayings without considering the ill-nature they evinced. I began to dislike more than to compassionate Linton, and to excuse his father in some measure for holding him cheap. We stayed till afternoon. I could not tear Miss Cathy away sooner, but happily my master had not quitted his apartment and remained ignorant of our prolonged absence. As we walked home, I would fain have enlightened my charge on the characters of the people we had quitted, but she got it into her head that I was prejudiced against them. Aha! she cried. You take papa's side, Ellen. You are partial, I know. Or else you wouldn't have cheated me so many years into the notion that Linton lived a long way from here. I'm really extremely angry. Only I'm so pleased I can't show it. But you must hold your tongue about my uncle. He's my uncle, remember, and I'll scold papa for quarrelling with him. And so she ran on, till I relinquished the endeavour to convince her of her mistake. She did not mention the visit that night, because she did not see Mr. Linton. Next day it all came out, sadly to my chagrin, and still I was not altogether sorry. I thought the burden of directing and warning would be more efficiently borne by him than me. But he was too timid in giving satisfactory reasons for his wish that she should shun connection with the household of the Heights, and Catherine liked good reasons for every restraint that harassed her petted will. Papa! she exclaimed after the morning's salutations. Guess whom I saw yesterday in my walk on the moors. Ah, papa, you started. You've not done right, have you now? I saw. But listen, and you shall hear how I found you out. And Ellen, who is in league with you, and yet pretended to pity me so, when I kept hoping, and was always disappointed about Linton's coming back. She gave a faithful account of her excursion and its consequences, and my master, though he cast more than one reproachful look at me, said nothing till she had concluded. Then he drew her to him, and asked if she knew why he had concealed Linton's near neighbourhood from her. Could she think it was to deny her a pleasure that she might harmlessly enjoy? "'It was because you disliked Mr. Heathcliff,' she answered. "'Then you believe I care more for my own feelings than yours, Cathy? he said. "'No, it was not because I disliked Mr. Heathcliff, but because Mr. Heathcliff disliked me, and is a most diabolical man, delighting to wrong and ruin those he hates if they give him the slightest opportunity.' I knew that you could not keep up an acquaintance with your cousin without being brought into contact with him, and I knew he would detest you on my account. So for your own good, and nothing else, I took precaution that you should not see Linton again. I meant to explain this some time as you grew older, and I'm sorry I delayed it. But Mr. Heathcliff was quite cordial, papa, observed Catherine, not at all convinced. And he didn't object to our seeing each other. He said I might come to his house when I pleased. Only I must not tell you, because you had quarrelled with him, and would not forgive him for marrying Aunt Isabella. And you won't. You are the one to be blamed. He is willing to let us be friends at least, Linton and I, and you are not. My master, perceiving that she would not take his word for her uncle-in-law's evil disposition, gave a hasty sketch of his conduct to Isabella and the manner in which Wuthering Heights became his property. He could not bear to discourse long upon the topic, for though he spoke little of it, he still felt the same horror and detestation of his ancient enemy that had occupied his heart ever since Mrs. Linton's death. She might have been living yet if it had not been for him, was his constant bitter reflection, and, in his eyes, Heathcliff seemed a murderer. Miss Cathy, conversant with no bad deeds except her own slight acts of disobedience, injustice, and passion, arising from hot temper and thoughtlessness, and repented of on the day they were committed, was amazed at the blackness of spirit that could brood on and cover revenge for years, and deliberately prosecute its plans without a visitation of remorse. She appeared so deeply impressed and shocked at this new view of human nature, excluded from all her studies and all her ideas till now, 
that Mr. Edgar deemed it unnecessary to pursue the subject. He merely added, You will know hereafter, darling, why I wish you to avoid his house and family. Now return to your old employments and amusements, and think no more about them. Catherine kissed her father, and sat down quietly to her lessons for a couple of hours, according to custom. Then she accompanied him into the grounds, and the whole day passed as usual. But in the evening, when she had retired to her room, and I went to help her to undress, I found her crying, on her knees by the bedside. "'Oh, fie, silly child!' I exclaimed. "'If you had any real griefs, you'd be ashamed to waste a tear on this little contrariety. You never had one shadow of substantial sorrow, Miss Catherine. Suppose for a minute that Master and I were dead, and you were by yourself in the world. How would you feel then?' Compare the present occasion with such an affliction as that, and be thankful for the friends you have, instead of coveting more. "'I'm not crying for myself, Ellen,' she answered. "'It's for him. He expected to see me again to-morrow, and there he'll be so disappointed, and he'll wait for me, and I shan't come.' "'Nonsense,' said I. "'Do you imagine he has thought as much of you as you have of him? Hasn't he Harriton for a companion?' Not one in a hundred would weep at losing a relation they had just seen twice, for two afternoons. Linton will conjecture how it is, and trouble himself no further about you. But may I not write a note to tell him why I cannot come? She asked, rising to her feet. And just send those books I promised to lend him. His books are not as nice as mine, and he wanted to have them extremely, when I told them how interesting they were. May I not, Ellen? "'No, indeed, no, indeed,' replied I with decision. "'Then he would write to you, and there'd never be an end of it. "'No, Miss Catherine, the acquaintance must be dropped entirely. "'So Papa expects, and I shall see that it is done.' "'But how can one little note?' she recommenced, putting on an imploring countenance. "'Silence!' I interrupted. "'We'll not begin with your little notes. Get into bed.' She threw at me a very naughty look, so naughty that I would not kiss her good night at first. I covered her up, and shut her door, in great displeasure. But, repenting half-way, I returned softly, and lo, there was Miss standing at the table with a bit of blank paper before her, and a pencil in her hand, which she guiltily slipped out of sight on my entrance. "'You'll get nobody to take that, Catherine,' I said. "'If you write it,' and at present I shall put out your candle. I set the extinguisher on the flame, receiving as I did so a slap on my hand and a petulant, Cross thing! I then quitted her again, and she drew the bolt in one of her worst, most peevish humours. The letter was finished, and forwarded to its destination by a milk-fetcher who came from the village. But that I didn't learn till some time afterwards. Weeks passed on, and Cathy recovered her temper, though she grew wondrous fond of stealing off to corners by herself, and often, if I came near her suddenly while reading, she would start and bend over the book, evidently desirous to hide it, and I detected edges of loose paper sticking out beyond the leaves. She also got a trick of coming down early in the morning and lingering about the kitchen, as if she were expecting the arrival of something, and she had a small drawer in a cabinet in the library, which she would trifle over for hours, and whose key she took special care to remove when she left it. One day, as she inspected this drawer, I observed that the playthings and trinkets which recently formed its contents were transmuted into bits of folded paper. My curiosity and suspicions were roused. I determined to take a peep at her mysterious treasures, so, at night, as soon as she and my master were safe upstairs, I searched and readily found among my house keys one that would fit the lock. Having opened, I emptied the whole contents into my apron, and took them with me to examine at leisure in my own chamber, though I could not but suspect, I was still surprised to discover that they were a mass of correspondence, daily almost it must have been, from Linton Heathcliff, answers to documents forwarded by her. The earlier dated were embarrassed and short, gradually, however, they expanded into copious love-letters, Foolish, as the age of the writer rendered natural, yet with touches here and there which I thought were borrowed from a more experienced source. Some of them struck me as singularly odd compounds of ardour and flatness, 
commencing in strong feeling and concluding in the affected, wordy style that a schoolboy might use to a fancied, incorporeal sweetheart. Whether they satisfied Cathy I don't know, but they appeared very worthless trash to me. After turning over as many as I thought proper, I tied them in a handkerchief and set them aside, relocking the vacant drawer. Following her habit, my young lady descended early and visited the kitchen. I watched her go to the door on the arrival of a certain little boy, and, while the dairymaid filled his can, she tucked something into his jacket pocket and plucked something out. I went round by the garden and laid wait for the messenger, who fought valorously to defend his trust, and we spilt the milk between us. But I succeeded in abstracting the epistle, and, threatening serious consequences if he did not look sharp home, I remained under the wall and perused Miss Cathy's affectionate composition. It was more simple and more eloquent than her cousin's, very pretty and very silly. I shook my head and went meditating into the house. The day being wet, she could not divert herself with rambling about the park, so, at the conclusion of her morning studies, she resorted to the solace of the drawer. Her father sat reading at the table, and I, on purpose, had sought a bit of work in some unripped fringes of the window curtain, keeping my eye steadily fixed on her proceedings. Never did any bird flying back to a plundered nest, which it had left brimful of chirping young ones, express more complete despair in its anguished cries and flutterings than she by her single, oh, and then the change that transfigured her late happy countenance. Mr. Linton looked up. "'What's the matter, love? Have you hurt yourself?' he said. His tone and look assured her he had not been the discoverer of the hoard. "'No, papa!' she gasped. "'Alan! Alan, come upstairs! I'm sick!' I obeyed her summons and accompanied her out. "'Oh, Ellen, you have got them!' she commenced immediately, dropping on her knees, when we were enclosed alone. "'Oh, give them to me, and I'll never, never do so again! Don't tell papa! You have not told papa, Ellen. Say you have not. I've been exceedingly naughty, but I won't do it any more.' With a grave severity in my manner, I begged her stand up. "'So,' I exclaimed, "'Miss Catherine, you are tolerably far on, it seems. You may well be ashamed of them. A fine bundle of trash you study in your leisure hours, to be sure. Why, it's good enough to be printed. And what do you suppose the master will think when I display it before him? I haven't shown it yet, but you needn't imagine I shall keep your ridiculous secrets. For shame, and you must have led the way in writing such absurdities. He would not have thought of beginning, I'm certain. I didn't, I didn't sobbed Cathy, fit to break her heart. "'I didn't once think of loving him till—' "'Loving!' cried I, as scornfully as I could utter the word. "'Loving! Did anybody ever hear the like? I might just as well talk of loving the miller who comes once a year to buy our corn. Pretty loving indeed, and both times together you have seen Linton hardly four hours in your life. Now, here is the babyish trash. I'm going with it to the library— and we'll see what your father says to such loving. She sprang at her precious epistles, but I hold them above my head, and then she poured out further frantic entreaties that I would burn them, do anything rather than show them, and being really fully as much inclined to laugh as scold, for I esteemed it all girlish vanity, I at length relented in a measure and asked, If I consent to burn them, Will you promise faithfully neither to send nor receive a letter again, nor a book? For I perceive you have sent him books, nor locks of hair, nor rings, nor playthings. We don't send playthings, cried Catherine, her pride overcoming her shame. Nor anything at all, then, my lady, I said. Unless you will, here I go. I promise, Ellen, she cried, catching my dress. Oh, put them in the fire, do, do but when I proceeded to open a place with the poker the sacrifice was too painful to be borne. She earnestly supplicated that I would spare her one or two. One or two, Ellen, to keep for Linton's sake. I unknotted the handkerchief and commenced dropping them in from an angle, and the flame curled up the chimney. I will have one, you cruel wretch, 
she screamed, darting her hand into the fire and drawing forth some half-consumed fragments at the expense of her fingers. "'Very well, and I will have some to exhibit to Papa,' I answered, shaking back the rest into the bundle and turning anew to the door. She emptied her blackened pieces into the flames and motioned me to finish the immolation. It was done. I stirred up the ashes and interred them under a shovelful of coals, and she, mutely, and with a sense of intense injury, retired to her private apartment. I descended to tell my master that the young lady's qualm of sickness was almost gone, but I judged it best for her to lie down a while. She wouldn't dine, but she reappeared at tea, pale and red about the eyes, and marvellously subdued in outward aspect. Next morning I answered the letter by a slip of paper, inscribed, Master Heathcliff is requested to send no more notes to Miss Linton, as she will not receive them. And henceforth the little boy came with vacant pockets. End of chapter 21Chapter 22 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Summer drew to an end, and early autumn. It was past Michaelmas, but the harvest was late that year, and a few of our fields were still uncleared. Mr. Linton and his daughter would frequently walk out among the reapers. At the carrying of the last sheaves they stayed till dusk, and the evening happening to be chill and damp, my master caught a bad cold that settled obstinately on his lungs, and confined him indoors throughout the whole of the winter, nearly without intermission. Poor Cathy, frightened from her little romance, had been considerably sadder and duller since its abandonment, and her father insisted on her reading less and taking more exercise. She had his companionship no longer. I esteemed it a duty to supply its lack, as much as possible, with mine, an inefficient substitute— for I could only spare two or three hours from my numerous diurnal occupations to follow her footsteps, and then my society was obviously less desirable than his. On an afternoon in October, or the beginning of November, a fresh watery afternoon, when the turf and plants were rustling with moist withered leaves, and the cold blue sky was half hidden by clouds, dark grey streamers rapidly mounting from the west and boding abundant rain, I requested my young lady to forego her rambling, because I was certain of showers. She refused, and I unwillingly donned a cloak, and took my umbrella to accompany her on a stroll to the bottom of the park, a formal walk, which she generally affected, if low-spirited. And that she invariably was when Mr. Edgar had been worse than ordinary, a thing never known from his confession, but guessed both by her and me from his increased silence and the melancholy of his countenance. She went sadly on, there was no running or bounding now, though the chill wind might well have tempted her to race, and often from the side of my eye I could detect her raising a hand and brushing something off her cheek. I gazed round for a means of diverting her thoughts. On one side of the road rose a high rough bank, where hazels and stunted oaks, with their roots half exposed, held uncertain tenure. The soil was too loose for the latter, and strong winds had blown some merely horizontal. In summer, Miss Catherine delighted to climb among these trunks and sit in the branches, swinging twenty feet above the ground, and I, pleased with her agility and her light, childish heart, still considered it proper to scold every time I caught her at such an elevation, but so that she knew there was no necessity for descending. From dinner to tea she would lie in her breeze-rocked cradle, doing nothing except singing old songs, my nursery law, to herself, or watching the birds, joint tenants, feed and entice their young ones to fly, or nestling with closed lids, half thinking, half dreaming, happier than words can express. "'Look, miss,' I exclaimed, pointing to a nook under the roots of one twisted tree. "'Winter is not here yet. There's a little flower up yonder, the last bud from the multitude of bluebells that clouded those turf steps in July with a lilac mist. Will you clamber up and pluck it to show papa?' Cathy stared a long time at the lonely blossom, trembling in its earthy shelter, and replied at length, "'No, I'll not touch it. But it looks melancholy, does it not, Ellen?' "'Yes,' I observed. "'About as starved and suckless as you. Your cheeks are bloodless. Let us take hold of hands and run. 
You're so low, I dare say I shall keep up with you. No, she repeated, and continued sauntering on, pausing at intervals to muse over a bit of moss, or a tuft of blanched grass, or a fungus spreading its bright orange among the heaps of brown foliage, and ever and anon her hand was lifted to her averted face. Catherine, why are you crying, love? I asked, approaching and putting my arm over her shoulder. You mustn't cry because Papa has a cold. Be thankful it is nothing worse. She now put no further restraint on her tears. Her breath was stifled by sobs. Oh, it will be something worse, she said. And what shall I do when Papa and you leave me and I am by myself? I can't forget your words, Ellen. They are always in my ear. How life will be changed! How dreary the world will be when Papa and you are dead! None can tell whether you won't die before us, I replied. It's wrong to anticipate evil. We'll hope there are years and years to come before any of us go. Master is young, and I am strong, and hardly forty-five. My mother lived till eighty, a canty dame to the last, and suppose Mr. Linton was spared till he saw sixty. That would be more years than you have counted, miss. And would it not be foolish to mourn a calamity above twenty years beforehand? But Aunt Isabella was younger than Papa, she remarked, gazing up with timid hope to seek further consolation. Aunt Isabella had not you and me to nurse her, I replied. She wasn't as happy as Master. She hadn't as much to live for. All you need do is to wait well on your father— and cheer him by letting him see you cheerful, and avoid giving him anxiety on any subject. Mind that, Cathy. I'll not disguise, but you might kill him if you were wild and reckless, and cherished a foolish, fanciful affection for the son of a person who would be glad to have him in his grave, and allowed him to discover that you fretted over the separation he has judged it expedient to make. I fret about nothing on earth except Papa's illness, answered my companion. I care for nothing in comparison with Papa. And I'll never, never, oh, never, while I have my senses, do an act or say a word to vex him. I love him better than myself, Ellen, and I know it by this. I pray every night that I may live after him, because I would rather be miserable than that he should be. That proves I love him better than myself. Good words, I replied. But deeds must prove it also, and after he is well, remember you don't forget resolutions formed in the hour of fear. As we talked, we neared a door that opened on the road, and my young lady, lightening into sunshine again, climbed up and seated herself on the top of the wall, reaching over to gather some hips that bloomed scarlet on the summit branches of the wild rose trees shadowing the highway side. The lower fruit had disappeared but only birds could touch the upper, except from Cathy's present station. In stretching to pull them, her hat fell off, and as the door was locked, she proposed scrambling down to recover it. I bid her be cautious lest she got a fall, and she nimbly disappeared. But the return was no such easy matter. The stones were smooth and neatly cemented, and the rose-bushes and blackberry stragglers could yield no assistance in reascending. I, like a fool, didn't recollect that— till I heard her laughing and exclaiming, "'Ellen, you'll have to fetch the key, or else I must run round to the porter's lodge. I can't scale the ramparts on this side.' "'Stay where you are,' I answered. "'I have my bundle of keys in my pocket. Perhaps I may manage to open it. If not, I'll go.' Catherine amused herself with dancing to and fro before the door, while I tried all the large keys in succession. I had applied the last and found that none would do— so, repeating my desire that she would remain there, I was about to hurry home as fast as I could, when an approaching sound arrested me. It was the trot of a horse. Cathy's dance stopped also. "'Who is that?' I whispered. "'Ellen, I wish you could open the door,' whispered back my companion anxiously. "'Oh, Miss Linton,' cried a deep voice, the riders. "'I'm glad to meet you. Don't be in haste to enter, for I have an explanation to ask and obtain.' "'I shan't speak to you, Mr. Heathcliff,' answered Catherine. "'Papa says you are a wicked man, and you hate both him and me, and Ellen says the same.' "'That is nothing to the purpose,' said Heathcliff. He it was. 
i don't hate my son i suppose and it is concerning him that i demand your attention yes you have cause to blush two or three months since were you not in the habit of writing to linton making love in play eh you deserved both of you flogging for that you especially the elder and less sensitive as it turns out i've got your letters and if you give me any pertness i'll send them to your father i presume you grew weary of the amusement and dropped it didn't you well you dropped linton with it into a slew of despond he was in earnest in love really as true as i live he's dying for you breaking his heart at your fickleness not figuratively but actually though hareton has made him a standing jest for six weeks and i have used more serious measures and attempted to frighten him out of his idiotcy he gets worse daily and he'll be under the sod before summer unless you restore him how can you lie so glaringly to the poor child i called from the inside pray ride on how can you deliberately get up such paltry falsehoods miss cathy i'll knock the lock off with a stone you won't believe that vile nonsense you can feel in yourself it is impossible that a person should die for love of a stranger i was not aware there were eavesdroppers muttered the detected villain worthy mrs dean i like you but i don't like your double dealing he added aloud how could you lie so glaringly as to affirm i hated the poor child and invent bugbear stories to terrify her from my doorstones catherine linton the very name warms me my bonny lass i shall be from home all this week go and see if i have not spoken truth do there's a darling just imagine your father in my place and linton in yours then think how you would value your careless lover if he refused to stir a step to comfort you when your father himself entreated him and don't from pure stupidity fall into the same error i swear on my salvation he's going to his grave and none but you can save him the lock gave way and i issued out i swear linton is dying repeated heathcliff looking hard at me and grief and disappointment are hastening his death nelly if you won't let her go you can walk over yourself but i shall not return till this time next week and i think your master himself would scarcely object to her visiting her cousin come in said i taking cathy by the arm and half forcing her to re-enter for she lingered viewing with troubled eyes the features of the speaker too stern to express his inward deceit he pushed his horse close and bending down observed miss catherine i own to you that i have little patience with linton and hareton and joseph have less i own that he's with a harsh set he pines for kindness as well as love and a kind word from you would be his best medicine don't mind mrs dean's cruel cautions but be generous and contrive to see him he dreams of you day and night and cannot be persuaded that you don't hate him since you neither write nor call i closed the door and rolled a stone to assist the loosened lock in holding it and spreading my umbrella i drew my charge underneath for the rain began to drive through the moaning branches of the trees and warned us to avoid delay our hurry prevented any comment on the encounter with heathcliff as we stretched towards home but i divined instinctively that catherine's heart was clouded now in double darkness her features were so sad they did not seem hers she evidently regarded what she had heard as every syllable true the master had retired to rest before we came in cathy stole to his room to inquire how he was he had fallen asleep she returned and asked me to sit with her in the library we took our tea together, and afterwards she lay down on the rug, and told me not to talk, for she was weary. I got a book and pretended to read. As soon as she supposed me absorbed in my occupation, she recommenced her silent weeping. It appeared at present her favourite diversion. I suffered her to enjoy it a while, then I expostulated, deriding and ridiculing all Mr. Heathcliff's assertions about his son, as if I were certain she would coincide alas i hadn't skill to counteract the effect his account had produced it was just what he intended you may be right ellen she answered but i shall never feel at ease till i know and i must tell linton it is not my fault that i don't write and convince him that i shall not change what use were anger and protestations against her silly credulity 
We parted that night, hostile, but next day beheld me on the road to Wuthering Heights, by the side of my willful young mistress's pony. I couldn't bear to witness her sorrow, to see her pale, dejected countenance and heavy eyes, and I yielded, in the faint hope that Linton himself might prove, by his reception of us, how little of the tale was founded on fact. End of chapter 22《Chapter Twenty Three of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The rainy night had ushered in a misty morning, half frost, half drizzle, and temporary brooks crossed our path, gurgling from the uplands. My feet were thoroughly wetted. I was cross and low, exactly the humour suited for making the most of these disagreeable things. We entered the farmhouse by the kitchen way, to ascertain whether Mr. Heathcliff were really absent, because I put slight faith in his own affirmation. Joseph seemed sitting in a sort of Elysium alone, beside a roaring fire, a quart of ale on the table near him, bristling with large pieces of toasted oatcake, and his black short pipe in his mouth. Catherine ran to the hearth to warm herself. I asked if the master was in— my question remained so long unanswered that I thought the old man had grown deaf and repeated it louder. Nay, he snarled, or rather screamed through his nose. Nay, ye mun go back where ye coom fro. Joseph, cried a peevish voice simultaneously with me from the inner room. Oh, how often am I to call you? There are only a few red ashes now. Joseph, come this moment. Vigorous puffs and a resolute stare into the grate declared he had no ear for this appeal. The housekeeper and Hareton were invisible, one gone on an errand, and the other at his work, probably. We knew Linton's tones and entered. Oh, I hope you'll die in a garret. Starve to death said the boy, mistaking our approach for that of his negligent attendant. He stopped on observing his error. His cousin flew to him. "'Is that you, Miss Linton?' he said, raising his head from the arm of the great chair in which he reclined. "'No, don't kiss me. It takes my breath. Oh, dear me. Papa said you would call,' continued he, after recovering a little from Catherine's embrace, while she stood by looking very contrite. "'Will you shut the door, if you please? You left it open, and those... those detestable creatures won't bring coals to the fire. Oh, it's so cold.' I stirred up the cinders and fetched a scuttleful myself. The invalid complained of being covered with ashes, but he had a tiresome cough and looked feverish and ill, so I did not rebuke his temper. "'Well, Linton,' murmured Catherine, when his corrugated brow relaxed, "'are you glad to see me? Can I do you any good?' "'Why didn't you come before?' he asked. "'You should have come instead of writing. It tired me dreadfully writing those long letters.' I'd far rather have talked to you. Now I can neither bear to talk nor anything else. Oh, I wonder where Zilla is. Will you... Looking at me. Step into the kitchen and see? I had received no thanks for my other service, and being unwilling to run to and fro at his behest, I replied, Nobody is out there but Joseph. "'I want to drink!' he exclaimed fretfully, turning away. "'Zilla is constantly gadding off to Gimmerton since Papa went. "'It's miserable, and I'm obliged to come here. "'They resolved never to hear me upstairs.' "'Is your father attentive to you, Master Heathcliff?' "'I asked, perceiving Catherine to be checked in her friendly advances.' 
attentive. He makes them a little more attentive, at least, he cried. Oh, the wretches. Do you know, Miss Linton, that brute Harriton laughs at me? Oh, I hate him. Indeed, I hate them all. They are odious beings. Kathy began searching for some water. She lighted on a pitcher in the dresser, filled a tumbler, and brought it. He bid her add a spoonful of wine from a bottle on the table, and having swallowed a small portion, appeared more tranquil, and said she was very kind. "'And are you glad to see me?' asked she, reiterating her former question, and pleased to detect the faint dawn of a smile. Oh, "'Yes, I am. It's something new to hear a voice like yours,' he replied. "'Oh, but I have been vexed, because you wouldn't come. And Papa swore it was owing to me.' Oh, he called me a pitiful, snuffling, worthless thing, and said you despised me, and if he had been in my place, he would be more the master of the Grange than your father by this time. But you don't despise me, do you, miss? I wish you would say Catherine, or Cathy, interrupted my young lady. Despise you? No. Next to Papa and Ellen, I love you better than anybody living. I don't love Mr. Heathcliff, though, and I dare not come when he returns. Will he stay away many days? Uh, not many, answered Linton. But he goes on to the moors frequently, since the shooting season commenced, and you might spend an hour or two with me in his absence. Do say you will. I think I should not be peevish with you. You'd not provoke me, and you'd always be ready to help me, wouldn't you? Yes, said Catherine, stroking his long, soft hair. If I could only get Papa's consent, I'd spend half my time with you. Pretty Linton, I wish you were my brother. And then you would like me as well as your father, observed he, more cheerfully. But papa says you would love me better than him and all the world, if you were my wife. So I'd rather you were that. No, I should never love anybody better than papa, she returned gravely. And people hate their wives sometimes, but not their sisters and brothers. And if you were the latter, you would live with us, and papa would be as fond of you as he is of me. Linton denied that people ever hated their wives, but Cathy affirmed they did, and, in her wisdom, instanced his own father's aversion to her aunt. I endeavoured to stop her thoughtless tongue. I couldn't succeed till everything she knew was out. Master Heathcliff, much irritated, asserted her relation was false. Papa told me, and papa does not tell falsehoods she answered pertly. "'My papa scorns yours!' cried Linton. He, "'He calls him a sneaking fool!' "'Yours is a wicked man,' retorted Catherine. "'And you are very naughty to dare to repeat what he says. He must be wicked to have made Aunt Isabella leave him as she did.' "'She didn't leave him,' said the boy. "'You shan't contradict me.' "'She did!' cried my young lady. Well, I'll tell you something, said Linton. Your mother hated your father. N now then. Oh! exclaimed Catherine, too enraged to continue. And she loved mine, added he. You little liar! I hate you now, she panted, and her face grew red with passion. She did, she did, sang Linton, sinking into the recess of his chair, and leaning back his head to enjoy the agitation of the other disputant who stood behind. Hush, Master Heathcliff, I said. That's your father's tale too, I suppose. It isn't. Y you hold your tongue, he answered. 
she did she did catherine she did she did kathy beside herself gave the chair a violent push and caused him to fall against one arm he was immediately seized by a suffocating cough that soon ended his triumph it lasted so long that it frightened even me as to his cousin she wept with all her might aghast at the mischief she had done though she said nothing i held him till the fit exhausted itself then he thrust me away and leant his head down silently catherine quelled her lamentations also took a seat opposite and looked solemnly into the fire how do you feel now master heathcliff i inquired after waiting ten minutes i wish she felt as i do he replied spiteful cruel thing Hareton never touches me he never struck me in his life and i was better to-day and there his voice died in a whimper i didn't strike you muttered cathy chewing her lip to prevent another burst of emotion he sighed and moaned like one under great suffering and kept it up for a quarter of an hour on purpose to distress his cousin apparently for whenever he caught a stifled sob from her he put renewed pain and pathos into the inflections of his voice i'm sorry i hurt you linton she said at length racked beyond endurance but i couldn't have been hurt by that little push and i had no idea that you could either you're not much are you linton don't let me go home thinking i've done you harm answer speak to me i can't speak to you he murmured you've hurt me so that i shall lie awake all night choking with this cough if you had it you'd know what it was but you'll be comfortably asleep while i'm in agony and nobody near me i wonder how you would like to pass those fearful nights <sighs> and he began to wail aloud for very pity of himself since you are in the habit of passing dreadful nights i said it won't be miss who spoils your ease you'd be the same had she never come however she shall not disturb you again and perhaps you'll get quieter when we leave you must i go asked catherine dolefully bending over him do you want me to go linton you can't alter what you've done he replied pettishly shrinking from her uh, unless you alter it for the worse by uh, teasing me into a fever well then i must go she repeated let me alone at least said he i can't bear your talking she lingered and resisted my persuasions to departure a tiresome while but as he neither looked up nor spoke she finally made a movement to the door and i followed we were recalled by a scream linton had slid from his seat on to the hearthstone and lay writhing in the mere perverseness of an indulged plague of a child determined to be as grievous and harassing as it can i thoroughly gauged his disposition from his behaviour and saw at once it would be folly to attempt humouring him not so my companion she ran back in terror knelt down and cried and soothed and entreated till he grew quiet from lack of breath by no means from compunction at distressing her i shall lift him on to the settle i said and he may roll about as he pleases we can't stop to watch him i hope you are satisfied miss cathy that you are not the person to benefit him and that his condition of health is not occasioned by attachment to you now then there he is come away as soon as he knows there is nobody by to care for his nonsense he'll be glad to lie still she placed a cushion under his head and offered him some water he rejected the latter and tossed uneasily on the former as if it were a stone or a block of wood she tried to put it more comfortably i can't do with that he said it's not high enough catherine brought another to lay above it that's too high 
murmured the provoking thing. "'How must I arrange it, then?' she asked despairingly. He twined himself up to her, as she half knelt by the settle and converted her shoulder into a support. "'No, that won't do,' I said. "'You'll be content with the cushion, Master Heathcliff. Miss has wasted too much time on you already. We cannot remain five minutes longer.' "'Yes, yes, we can,' replied Cathy. "'He's good and patient now. He's beginning to think I shall have far greater misery than he will to-night, if I believe he is the worse for my visit, and then I dare not come again. Tell the truth about it, Linton, for I mustn't come if I have hurt you.' "'You must come. You must cure me,' he answered. "'You ought to come because you have hurt me. You know you have extremely. I was not as ill when you entered as I am at present, was I? But you've made yourself ill by crying and being in a passion. I didn't do it all, said his cousin. However, we'll be friends now. And you want me. You would wish to see me sometimes, really? I told you I did, he replied impatiently. Uh, Sit on the settle, and let me lean on your knee. That's as Mamma used to do. Whole afternoons together. Sit quite still, and don't talk. But you may sing a song if you can sing, or you may say a nice, long, interesting ballad. One of those you promised to teach me, or a story. Oh, I'd rather have a ballad, though. Begin. Catherine repeated the longest she could remember. The employment pleased both mightily. Linton would have another, and after that another, notwithstanding my strenuous objections. And so they went on until the clock struck twelve, and we heard Herriton in the court returning for his dinner. A and tomorrow, Catherine. "'Will you be here to-morrow?' asked young Heathcliff, holding her frock as she rose reluctantly. "'No,' I answered, "'nor next day neither.' She, however, gave a different response evidently, for his forehead cleared as she stooped and whispered in his ear. "'You won't go to-morrow, recollect, miss,' I commenced, when we were out of the house. "'You are not dreaming of it, are you?' She smiled. "'Oh, I'll take good care,' I continued. "'I'll have that lock mended, and you can escape by no way else.' "'I can get over the wall,' she said, laughing. "'The Grange is not a prison, Ellen, and you are not my jailer. "'And besides, I'm almost seventeen. I'm a woman. "'And I'm certain Linton would recover quickly if he had me to look after him. "'I'm older than he is, you know, and wiser. Less childish, am I not?' And he'll soon do as I direct him, with some slight coaxing. He's a pretty little darling when he's good. I'd make such a pet of him if he were mine. We should never quarrel, should we, after we were used to each other? Don't you like him, Ellen? Like him? I exclaimed. The worst-tempered bit of a sickly slip that ever struggled into its teens. Happily, as Mr. Heathcliff conjectured, he'll not win twenty— I doubt whether he'll see spring indeed, and small loss to his family whenever he drops off, and lucky it is for us that his father took him, the kinder he was treated the more tedious and selfish he'd be. I'm glad you have no chance of having him for a husband, Miss Catherine. My companion waxed serious at hearing this speech. To speak of his death so regardlessly wounded her feelings. He's younger than I she answered, after a protracted pause of meditation. "'And he ought to live the longest. He will. He must live as long as I do. He's as strong now as when he first came into the North. I'm positive of that. It's only a cold that ails him, the same as Papa has. You say Papa will get better, and why shouldn't he?' "'Well, well,' I cried. "'After all, we needn't trouble ourselves. For listen, miss, and mind—' I'll keep my word. If you attempt going to Wuthering Heights again, with or without me, I shall inform Mr. Linton, and, unless he allow it, the intimacy with your cousin must not be revived. 
It has been revived, muttered Cathy sulkily. Must not be continued, then, I said. We'll see, was her reply, and she set off at a gallop, leaving me to toil in the rear. We both reached home before our dinner-time. My master supposed we had been wandering through the park, and therefore he demanded no explanation of our absence. As soon as I entered, I hastened to change my soaked shoes and stockings, but sitting such a while at the heights had done the mischief. On the succeeding morning I was laid up, and during three weeks I remained incapacitated for attending to my duties, a calamity never experienced prior to that period, and never, I am thankful to say, since. My little mistress behaved like an angel in coming to wait on me, and cheer my solitude. The confinement brought me exceedingly low. It is wearisome to a stirring, active body, but few have slighter reasons for complaint than I had. The moment Catherine left Mr. Linton's room she appeared at my bedside. Her day was divided between us, no amusement usurped a minute. She neglected her meals, her studies, and her play, and she was the fondest nurse that ever watched. She must have had a warm heart, when she loved her father so, to give so much to me. I said her days were divided between us, but the master retired early, and I generally needed nothing after six o'clock, thus the evening was her own. Poor thing! I never considered what she did with herself after tea, and though frequently, when she looked in to bid me good-night, I remarked a fresh colour in her cheeks, and a pinkness over her slender fingers. Instead of fancying the line borrowed from a cold ride across the moors, I laid it to the charge of a hot fire in the library. End of chapter 23《ハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデーのハッピーバースデー and imagining my sort of books did not suit her, I bid her please herself in the choice of what she perused. She selected one of her own favourites, and got forward steadily about an hour. Then came frequent questions. "'Ellen, are not you tired? Hadn't you better lie down now? You'll be sick keeping up so long, Ellen.' "'No, no, dear. I'm not tired,' I returned continually. Perceiving me immovable, she essayed another method of showing her disrelish for her occupation. It changed to yawning and stretching, and— Oh, Ellen, I'm tired. Give over, then, and talk, I answered. That was worse. She fretted and sighed, and looked at her watch till eight, and finally went to her room, completely overdone with sleep. Judging by her peevish, heavy look, and the constant rubbing she inflicted on her eyes— the following night she seemed more impatient still, and on the third from recovering my company she complained of a headache and left me. I thought her conduct odd, and having remained alone a long while, I resolved on going and inquiring whether she were better, and asking her to come and lie on the sofa instead of upstairs in the dark. No Catherine could I discover upstairs, and none below. The servants affirmed they had not seen her, I listened at Mr. Edgar's door. All was silence. I returned to her apartment, extinguished my candle, and seated myself in the window. The moon shone bright, a sprinkling of snow covered the ground, and I reflected that she might possibly have taken it into her head to walk about the garden for refreshment. I did detect a figure creeping along the inner fence of the park, but it was not my young mistress. On its emerging into the light, I recognised one of the grooms. He stood a considerable period, viewing the carriage road through the grounds, then started off at a brisk pace, as if he had detected something, and reappeared presently, leading Mrs. Pony. And there she was, just dismounted, and walking by its side. The man took his charge stealthily across the grass towards the stable. Cathy entered by the casement window of the drawing-room, 
and glided noiselessly up to where I awaited her. She put the door gently to, slipped off her snowy shoes, untied her hat, and was proceeding, unconscious of my espionage, to lay aside her mantle, when I suddenly rose and revealed myself. The surprise petrified her an instant. She uttered an inarticulate exclamation, and stood fixed. "'My dear Miss Catherine,' I began, too vividly impressed by her recent kindness to break into a scold, "'where have you been riding out at this hour? And why should you try to deceive me by telling a tale? Where have you been? Speak!' "'To the bottom of the park,' she stammered. "'I didn't tell a tale.' "'And nowhere else?' I demanded. "'No,' was the muttered reply. "'Oh, Catherine,' I cried sorrowfully, "'you know you have been doing wrong, "'or you wouldn't be driven to uttering an untruth to me. "'That does grieve me. "'I'd rather be three months ill than hear you frame a deliberate lie.' She sprang forward, and bursting into tears, threw her arms round my neck. "'Well, Ellen, I'm so afraid of you being angry,' she said. "'Promise not to be angry, and you shall know the very truth. I hate to hide it.' We sat down in the window-seat. I assured her I would not scold, whatever her secret might be, and I guessed it, of course, so she commenced. "'I've been to Wuthering Heights, Ellen, and I've never missed going a day since you fell ill.' except thrice before, and twice after you left your room. I gave Michael books and pictures to prepare Minnie every evening, and to put her back in the stable. You mustn't scold him either, mind. I was at the heights by half-past six, and generally stayed till half-past eight, and then galloped home. It was not to amuse myself that I went. I was often wretched all the time. Now and then I was happy, once in a week, perhaps. At first I expected there would be sad work persuading you to let me keep my word to Linton, for I had engaged to call again next day, when we quitted him. But as you stayed upstairs on the morrow I escaped that trouble. While Michael was refastening the lock of the park door in the afternoon, I got possession of the key, and told him how my cousin wished me to visit him because he was sick, and couldn't come to the Grange, and how papa would object to my going. And then I negotiated with him about the pony. He is fond of reading, and he thinks of leaving soon to get married, so he offered if I would lend him books out of the library to do what I wished. But I preferred giving him my own, and that satisfied him better. On my second visit Linton seemed in lively spirits, and Zilla—that is their housekeeper—made us a clean room and a good fire, and told us that, as Joseph was out at a prayer-meeting and Hareton Earnshaw was off with his dogs, robbing our woods of pheasants, as I heard afterwards, we might do what we liked. She brought me some warm wine and gingerbread, and appeared exceedingly good-natured, and Linton sat in the armchair, and I in the little rocking-chair in the hearthstone, and we laughed and talked so merrily and found so much to say, we planned where we would go and what we would do in summer. I needn't repeat that, because you would call it silly. One time, however, we were near quarrelling. He said the pleasantest manner of spending a hot July day was lying from morning till evening on a bank of heath in the middle of the moors, with the bees humming dreamily about among the bloom, and the lark singing high up overhead, and the blue sky and bright sun shining steadily and cloudlessly. That was his most perfect idea of heaven's happiness. Mine was rocking in a rustling green tree, with a west wind blowing, and bright white clouds flitting rapidly above and not only larks, but throstles and blackbirds, and linnets, and cuckoos pouring out music on every side, and the moors seen at a distance, broken into cool dusky dells, but close by great swells of long grass undulating in waves to the breeze, and woods and sounding water, and the whole world awake and wild with joy. He wanted all to lie in an ecstasy of peace. I wanted all to sparkle and dance in a glorious jubilee. I said his heaven would be only half alive, and he said mine would be drunk. I said I should fall asleep in his, and he said he could not breathe in mine, and began to grow very snappish. At last we agreed to try both, as soon as the right weather came, and then we kissed each other and were friends. After sitting still an hour, I looked at the great room with its smooth uncarpeted floor, and thought how nice it would be to play in if we removed the table. 
and I asked Linton to call Zilla in to help us, and we'd have a game at Blindman's Bluff. She should try to catch us. You used to, you know, Ellen. He wouldn't. There was no pleasure in it, he said. But he consented to play at ball with me. We found two in a cupboard among a heap of old toys, tops and hoops and battledoors and shuttlecocks. One was marked C, and the other H. I wished to have the C, because that stood for Catherine, and the H might be for Heathcliff, his name. But the bran came out of H, and Linton didn't like it. I beat him constantly, and he got cross again, and coughed, and returned to his chair. That night, though, he easily recovered his good humour. He was charmed with two or three pretty songs, your songs, Ellen, and when I was obliged to go, he begged and entreated me to come the following evening, and I promised. Minnie and I went flying home as light as air, and I dreamt of Wuthering Heights, and my sweet darling cousin till morning. On the morrow I was sad, partly because you were poorly, and partly that I wished my father knew, and approved of my excursions. But it was beautiful moonlight after tea, and as I rode on the gloom cleared. I shall have another happy evening, I thought to myself, and what delights me more my pretty Linton will. I trotted up their garden, and was turning round to the back, when that fellow Earnshaw met me, took my bridle, and bid me go in by the front entrance. He patted Minnie's neck, and said she was a bonny beast, and appeared as if he wanted me to speak to him. I only told him to leave my horse alone, or else it would kick him. He answered in his vulgar accent. It wouldn't do much hurt if it did. And surveyed its legs with a smile. I was half inclined to make it try. However, he moved off to open the door, and as he raised the latch, he looked up to the inscription above, and said with a stupid mixture of awkwardness and elation, Miss Catherine, I can read yon no. Wonderful! I exclaimed. Pray let us hear you. You are grown clever. He spelt and drawled over by syllables the name. Hareton. Earnshaw. And the figures? I cried encouragingly, perceiving that he came to a dead halt. I cannot tell them yet, he answered. Oh, you dunce! I said, laughing heartily at his failure. The fool stared with a grin hovering about his lips, and a scowl gathering over his eyes, as if uncertain whether he might not join in my mirth, whether it were not pleasant familiarity, or what it really was, contempt. I settled his doubts by suddenly retrieving my gravity, and desiring him to walk away, for I came to see Linton, not him. He reddened, I saw that by the moonlight, dropped his hand from the latch and skulked off, a picture of mortified vanity. He imagined himself to be as accomplished as Linton, I suppose, because he could spell his own name, and was marvellously discomfited that I didn't think the same. "'Stop, Miss Catherine, dear,' I interrupted. I shall not scold, but I don't like your conduct there. If you had remembered that Hereton was your cousin as much as Master Heathcliff, you would have felt how improper it was to behave in that way. At least it was praiseworthy ambition for him to desire to be as accomplished as Linton, and probably he did not learn merely to show off. You had made him ashamed of his ignorance before, I have no doubt, and he wished to remedy it and please you. To sneer at his imperfect attempt was very bad breeding. Had you been brought up in his circumstances, would you be less rude? He was as quick and as intelligent a child as ever you were, and I'm hurt that he should be despised now, because that base Heathcliff has treated him so unjustly. Well, Ellen, you won't cry about it, will you? She exclaimed, surprised at my earnestness. But wait, and you shall hear if he conned his ABC to please me and if it were worth while being civil to the brute. I entered. Linton was lying on the settle, and half got up to welcome me. <sighs> I'm ill tonight, Catherine, love, he said. And you must have all the talk, and let me listen. Come and sit by me. I was sure you wouldn't break your word, and I'll make you promise again before you go. I knew now that I mustn't tease him, as he was ill, and I spoke softly and put no questions, and avoided irritating him in any way. I had brought some of my nicest books for him, 
He asked me to read a little of one, and I was about to comply, when Earnshaw burst the door open, having gathered venom with reflection. He advanced direct to us, seized Linton by the arm, and swung him off the seat. "'Get to thy own room,' he said, in a voice almost inarticulate with passion, and his face looked swelled and furious. "'Take her there if she comes to see thee. Thou shalt keep me out of this. Be gone with you both!' He swore at us, and left Linton no time to answer, nearly throwing him into the kitchen, and he clenched his fist as I followed, seemingly longing to knock me down. I was afraid for a moment, and I let one volume fall. He kicked it after me and shut us out. I heard a malignant crackly laugh by the fire, and turning, beheld that odious Joseph standing rubbing his bony hands and quivering. "'I was sure he'd serve ye out.' He's a grand lad. He's getting to right spirit in him. He knows, ay, he knows, as well as I do, who should be to maester yonder. Eh, eh, eh. He made his gift properly. Eh, eh, eh. Where must we go? I asked of my cousin, disregarding the old wretch's mockery. Linton was white and trembling. He was not pretty then, Ellen. Oh, no. He looked frightful, for his thin face and large eyes were wrought into an expression of frantic, powerless fury. He grasped the handle of the door and shook it. It was fastened inside. "'If you don't let me in, I'll kill you! If you don't let me in, I'll kill you!' He rather shrieked than said. "'Devil, devil! I'll kill you! I'll kill you!' Joseph uttered his croaking laugh again. "'There, that's the father,' he cried. "'That's father. We've all a summit on either side in us. "'Never heed, Hareton, lad. Do not be feared. He cannot get at thee.' I took hold of Linton's hands and tried to pull him away, but he shrieked so shockingly that I dared not proceed. At last his cries were choked by a dreadful fit of coughing. Blood gushed from his mouth and he fell on the ground. I ran into the yard, sick with terror, and called for Zilla as loud as I could. She soon heard me. She was milking the cows in a shed behind the barn, and hurrying from her work, she inquired what there was to do. I hadn't breath to explain. Dragging her in, I looked about for Linton. Earnshaw had come out to examine the mischief he had caused, and he was then conveying the poor thing upstairs. Zilla and I ascended after him, but he stopped me at the top of the steps, and said I shouldn't go in. I must go home. I exclaimed that he had killed Linton, and I would enter. Joseph locked the door, and declared I should do— No such stuff. And asked me whether I were— Bound to be as mad as him. I stood crying till the housekeeper reappeared. She affirmed he would be better in a bit, but he couldn't do with that shrieking and din, and she took me and nearly carried me into the house. Ellen, I was ready to tear my hair off my head. I sobbed and wept so that my eyes were almost blind, and the ruffian you have such sympathy with stood opposite, presuming every now and then to bid me wished, and denying that it was his fault, and finally, frightened by my assertions that I would tell papa, and that he should be put in prison and hanged, he commenced blubbering himself, and hurried out to hide his cowardly agitation. Still I was not rid of him. When at length they compelled me to depart, and I had got some hundred yards off the premises, he suddenly issued from the shadow of the roadside, and checked Minnie, and took hold of me. "'Miss Catherine, I'm ill-grieved,' he began. "'But it's rather too bad.' I gave him a cut with my whip, thinking perhaps he would murder me. He let go, thundering one of his horrid curses, and I galloped home more than half out of my senses. I didn't bid you good-night that evening, and I didn't go to Wuthering Heights the next. I wished to go exceedingly but I was strangely excited, and dreaded to hear that Linton was dead sometimes, and sometimes shuddered at the thought of encountering Hareton. On the third day I took courage—at least I couldn't bear longer suspense—and stole off once more. I went at five o'clock and walked, fancying I might manage to creep into the house and up to Linton's room unobserved. However, the dogs gave notice of my approach. Zilla received me, and saying, the lad was mending nicely, showed me into a small, tidy, carpeted apartment, 
where to my inexpressible joy I beheld Linton laid on a little sofa, reading one of my books. But he would neither speak to me, nor look at me, through a whole hour, Ellen. He has such an unhappy temper. And what quite confounded me when he did open his mouth, it was to utter the falsehood that I had occasioned the uproar, and Hareton was not to blame. Unable to reply except passionately, I got up and walked from the room. He sent after me a faint, Catherine. He did not reckon on being answered so, but I wouldn't turn back, and the morrow was the second day on which I stayed at home, nearly determined to visit him no more. But it was so miserable going to bed and getting up and never hearing anything about him, that my resolution melted into air before it was properly formed. It had appeared wrong to take the journey once, now it seemed wrong to refrain. Michael came to ask if he must saddle Minnie. I said yes, and considered myself doing a duty as she bore me over the hills. I was forced to pass the front windows to get to the court. It was no use trying to conceal my presence. "'Young master is in the house,' said Zilla, as she saw me making for the parlour. I went in. Earnshaw was there also, but he quitted the room directly. Linton sat in the great armchair half asleep. Walking up to the fire, I began in a serious tone, partly meaning it to be true. "'As you don't like me, Linton, and as you think I come on purpose to hurt you, and pretend that I do so every time, this is our last meeting. Let us say good-bye, and tell Mr. Heathcliff that you have no wish to see me, and that he mustn't invent any more falsehoods on the subject.' Uh, "'Sit down and take your hat off, Catherine,' he answered. "'You are so much happier than I am. You ought to be better. Papa talks enough of my defects, and shows enough scorn of me to make it natural I should doubt myself. I doubt whether I am not altogether as worthless as he calls me, frequently, and then I feel so cross and bitter. I hate everybody. Oh, I am worthless, and bad in temper, and bad in spirit, almost always. And if you choose, you may say good-bye. You'll get rid of an annoyance. Only, Catherine, do me this justice. Believe that if I might be as sweet and as kind and as good as you are, I would be, as willingly and more so, than as happy and as healthy. And believe that your kindness has made me love you deeper than if I deserved your love. And though I couldn't and cannot help showing my nature to you, I regret it and repent it, and shall regret and repent it till I die." I felt he spoke the truth, and I felt I must forgive him. And though we should quarrel the next moment, I must forgive him again. We were reconciled. But we cried, both of us, the whole time I stayed. Not entirely for sorrow. Yet I was sorry Linton had that distorted nature. He'll never let his friends be at ease, and he'll never be at ease himself. I have always gone to his little parlour since that night, because his father returned the day after. About three times, I think, we have been merry and hopeful, as we were the first evening. The rest of my visits were dreary and troubled. Now with his selfishness and spite, and now with his sufferings. But I have learned to endure the former with nearly as little resentment as the latter. Mr. Heathcliff purposely avoids me. I have hardly seen him at all. Last Sunday, indeed, coming earlier than usual, I heard him abusing poor Linton cruelly for his conduct of the night before. I can't tell how he knew of it, unless he listened. Linton had certainly behaved provokingly. However, it was the business of nobody but me, and I interrupted Mr. Heathcliff's lecture by entering and telling him so. He burst into a laugh, and went away, saying he was glad I took that view of the matter. Since then I have told Linton he must whisper his bitter things. Now, Ellen, you have heard all. 
I can't be prevented from going to Wuthering Heights, except by inflicting misery on two people. Whereas, if you'll only not tell Papa, my going need disturb the tranquillity of none. You'll not tell, will you? It will be very heartless if you do. I'll make up my mind on that point by tomorrow, Miss Catherine, I replied. It requires some study, and so I'll leave you to your rest, and go think it over. I thought it over aloud, in my master's presence, walking straight from her room to his, and relating the whole story, with the exception of her conversations with her cousin, and any mention of Hareton. Mr. Linton was alarmed and distressed, more than he would acknowledge to me. In the morning Catherine learnt my betrayal of her confidence, and she learnt also that her secret visits were to end. In vain she wept and writhed against the interdict, and implored her father to have pity on Linton. All she got to comfort her was a promise that he would write and give him leave to come to the Grange when he pleased, but explaining that he must no longer expect to see Catherine at Wuthering Heights. Perhaps, had he been aware of his nephew's disposition and state of health, he would have seen fit to withhold even that slight consolation. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. These things happened last winter, sir, said Mrs. Dean, hardly more than a year ago. Last winter I did not think, at another twelve months' end, I should be amusing a stranger to the family with relating them. Yet who knows how long you'll be a stranger? You're too young to rest always contented living by yourself, and I some way fancy no one could see Catherine Linton and not love her. You smile, but why do you look so lively and interested when I talk about her? And why have you asked me to hang her picture over your fireplace? And why— Stop, my good friend, I cried. It may be very possible that I should love her, but would she love me? I doubt it too much to venture my tranquillity by running into temptation. And then, my home is not here. I am of the busy world, and to its arms I must return. Go on. Was Catherine obedient to her father's commands? She was, continued the housekeeper. Her affection for him was still the chief sentiment in her heart, and he spoke without anger. He spoke in the deep tenderness of one about to leave his treasure amid perils and foes, where his remembered words would be the only aid that he could bequeath to guide her. He said to me a few days afterwards, I wish my nephew would write, Ellen, or call. Tell me sincerely what you think of him. Is he changed for the better? Or is there a prospect of improvement as he grows to a man? He's very delicate, sir, I replied, and scarcely likely to reach manhood. But this I can say, he does not resemble his father. And if Miss Catherine had the misfortune to marry him, he would not be beyond her control, unless she were extremely and foolishly indulgent. However, master, you will have plenty of time to get acquainted with him and see whether he would suit her. It wants four years and more to his being of age. Edgar sighed, and, walking to the window, looked out towards Gimmerton Kirk. It was a misty afternoon, but the February sun shone dimly, and we could just distinguish the two fir trees in the yard and the sparely scattered gravestones. I've prayed often he half soliloquised, for the approach of what is coming. And now I begin to shrink and fear it. I thought the memory of the hour I came down that glen of bridegroom would be less sweet than the anticipation that I was soon, in a few months, or possibly weeks, to be carried up and laid in its lonely hollow. Ellen, I've been very happy with my little Cathy, through winter nights and summer days, she was a living hope at my side. But I've been as happy musing by myself among these stones, under that old church, lying through the long June evenings on the green mound of her mother's grave, and wishing, yearning for the time when I might lie beneath it. What can I do for Cathy? 
how must I quit her? I'd not care one moment for Linton being Heathcliff's son, nor for his taking her from me, if he could console her for my loss. I'd not care that Heathcliff gained his ends and triumphed in robbing me of my last blessing. But should Linton be unworthy, only a feeble tool of his father, I cannot abandon her to him. And, hard though it be to crush her buoyant spirit, I must persevere in making her sad while I live, and leaving her solitary when I die. Darling, I'd rather resign her to God and lay her in the earth before me. Resign her to God as it is, sir, I answered, and if we should lose you, which may he forbid, under his providence, I'll stand her friend and counsellor to the last. Miss Catherine is a good girl. I don't fear that she will go wilfully wrong, and people who do their duty are always finally rewarded. Spring advanced, yet my master gathered no real strength, though he resumed his walks in the grounds with his daughter. To her inexperienced notions this itself was a sign of convalescence, and then his cheek was often flushed, and his eyes were bright. She felt sure of his recovering. On her seventeenth birthday he did not visit the churchyard. It was raining, and I observed. "'You'll surely not go out to-night, sir?' he answered. "'No. I'll defer it this year a little longer.' He wrote again to Linton, expressing his great desire to see him, and, had the invalid been presentable, I've no doubt his father would have permitted him to come. As it was, being instructed, he returned an answer, intimating that Mr. Heathcliff objected to his calling at the Grange. But his uncle's kind remembrance delighted him, and he hoped to meet him sometimes in his rambles, and personally to petition that his cousin and he might not remain long so utterly divided. That part of his letter was simple, and probably his own. Heathcliff knew he could plead eloquently for Catherine's company then. "'I do not ask,' he said, "'that she may visit me here. "'But am I never to see her, "'because my father forbids me to go to her home, "'and you forbid her to come to mine? "'Do now and then ride with her towards the heights.' and let us exchange a few words in your presence. We have done nothing to deserve this separation, and you are not angry with me. You have no reason to dislike me. You allow yourself. Dear uncle, send me a kind note tomorrow, and leave to join you anywhere you please, except at thrust cross grange i believe an interview would convince you that my father's character is not mine he affirms i am more your nephew than his son and though i have faults which render me unworthy of catherine she has excused them and for her sake you should also you inquire after my health. It is better. But while I remain cut off from all hope and doomed to solitude or society of those who never did and never will like me, how can I be cheerful and well? Edgar, though he felt for the boy, could not consent to grant his request, because he could not accompany Catherine. He said, in summer, perhaps, they might meet. Meantime, he wished him to continue writing at intervals, and engaged to give him what advice and comfort he was able by letter, being well aware of his hard position in his family. Linton complied, and had he been unrestrained, would probably have spoiled all by filling his epistles with complaints and lamentations. But his father kept a sharp watch over him, and, of course, insisted on every line that my master sent being shown, so, instead of penning his peculiar personal sufferings and distresses, the themes constantly uppermost on his thoughts, 
he harped on the cruel obligation of being held asunder from his friend and love, and gently intimated that Mr. Linton must allow an interview soon, or he should fear he was purposely deceiving him with empty promises. Cathy was a powerful ally at home, and between them they at length persuaded my master to acquiesce in their having a ride or a walk together about once a week, under my guardianship, and on the moors nearest the Grange, for June found him still declining. Though he had set aside yearly a portion of his income for my young lady's fortune, he had a natural desire that she might retain, or at least return in a short time to, the house of her ancestors, and he considered her only prospect of doing that was by a union with his heir. He had no idea that the latter was failing almost as fast as himself, nor had any one, I believe, no doctor visited the heights, and no one saw Master Heathcliff to make report of his condition among us. I, for my part, began to fancy my forebodings were false, and that he must be actually rallying, when he mentioned riding and walking on the moors, and seemed so earnest in pursuing his object. I could not picture a father treating a dying child as tyrannically and wickedly as I afterwards learned Heathcliff had treated him— to compel this apparent eagerness, his efforts redoubling the more imminently his avaricious and unfeeling plans were threatened with defeat by death. End of chapter 25「Chapter 26 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Summer was already past its prime, when Edgar reluctantly yielded his assent to their entreaties, and Catherine and I set out on our first ride to join her cousin. It was a close, sultry day, devoid of sunshine, but with a sky too dappled and hazy to threaten rain, and our place of meeting had been fixed at the guidestone, by the crossroads. On arriving there, however, a little herd-boy, dispatched as a messenger, told us that Master Little were just of the side of heights, and he be much obliged to us to go on a bit further. Then Master Linton had forgot the first injunction of his uncle, I observed. He bid us keep on the Grange land, and here we are off at once. Well, we'll turn our horses' heads round when we reach him, answered my companion. Our excursion shall lie towards home. But when we reached him, and that was scarcely a quarter of a mile from his own door, we found he had no horse, and we were forced to dismount and leave ours to graze. He lay on the heath, awaiting our approach, and did not rise till we came within a few yards. Then he walked so feebly, and looked so pale, that I immediately exclaimed, "'Why, Master Heathcliff, you are not fit for enjoying a ramble this morning. How ill you do look!' Catherine surveyed him with grief and astonishment. She changed the ejaculation of joy on her lips to one of alarm, and the congratulation on their long-postponed meeting to an anxious inquiry, whether he were worse than usual. No, better, better, he panted, trembling, and retaining her hand as if he needed its support, while his large blue eyes wandered timidly over her the hollowness round them transforming to haggard wildness the languid expression they once possessed. "'But you have been worse,' persisted his cousin. "'Worse than when I saw you last. You are thinner, and—' Uh, 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 "'I'm tired,' he interrupted hurriedly. "'It is too hot for walking. Let us rest here. And in the morning I often feel sick.' Papa says I grow so fast. Badly satisfied, Cathy sat down, and he reclined beside her. This is something like your paradise, said she, making an effort at cheerfulness. You recollect the two days we agreed to spend in the place and way each thought pleasantest. This is nearly yours, only there are clouds. But then they are so soft and mellow, it is nicer than sunshine. Next week, if you can, we'll ride down to the Grange Park, and try mine." Linton did not appear to remember what she talked of, and he had evidently great difficulty in sustaining any kind of conversation. His lack of interest in the subjects she started, and his equal incapacity to contribute to her entertainment, 
were so obvious that she could not conceal her disappointment. An indefinite alteration had come over his whole person and manner. The pettishness that might be caressed into fondness had yielded to a listless apathy. There was less of the peevish temper of a child which frets and teases on purpose to be soothed, and more of the self-absorbed moroseness of a confirmed invalid, repelling consolation, and ready to regard the good-humoured mirth of others as an insult. Catherine perceived, as well as I did, that he held it rather a punishment than a gratification to endure our company, and she made no scruple of proposing presently to depart. That proposal unexpectedly roused Linton from his lethargy and threw him into a strange state of agitation. He glanced fearfully towards the heights, begging she would remain another half-hour at least. "'But I think,' said Cathy, "'you'd be more comfortable at home than sitting here. And I cannot amuse you to-day, I see, by my tales and songs and chatter. You have grown wiser than I in these six months. You have little taste for my diversions now. Or else, if I could amuse you, I'd willingly stay." "'Stay to rest yourself,' he replied. "'And, Catherine, don't think or say that I'm very unwell. It is the heavy weather and heat that makes me dull, and I walked about before you came. A great deal for me. Tell Uncle I'm in tolerable health, will you?" "'I'll tell him that you say so, Linton. I couldn't affirm that you are,' observed my young lady, wondering at his pertinacious assertion of what was evidently an untruth. "'And be here again next Thursday,' continued he, shunning her puzzled gaze. "'And give him my thanks for permitting you to come. My best thanks, Catherine. And—' And if you did meet my father, and he asked you about me, don't lead him to suppose that I've been extremely silent and stupid. Don't look sad and downcast as you are doing. He'll be angry." "'I care nothing for his anger,' exclaimed Cathy, imagining she would be its object. "'But I do,' said her cousin, shuddering. "'Don't provoke him against me, Catherine, for he is very hard.' "'Is he severe to you, Master Heathcliff?' I inquired. "'Has he grown weary of indulgence and passed from passive to active hatred?' Linton looked at me, but did not answer, and, after keeping her seat by his side another ten minutes, during which his head fell drowsily on his breast, and he uttered nothing except suppressed moans of exhaustion or pain, Cathy began to seek solace in looking for bilberries and sharing the produce of her researches with me. She did not offer them to him, for she saw further notice would only weary and annoy. "'Is it half an hour now, Ellen?' she whispered in my ear at last. "'I can't tell why we should stay. He's asleep, and Papa will be wanting us back.' "'Well, we must not leave him asleep,' I answered. "'Wait till he wakes, and be patient. You were mighty eager to set off, but your longing to see poor Linton has soon evaporated.' "'Why did he wish to see me?' returned Catherine. "'In his crossest humours formerly I liked him better than I do in his present curious mood. It's just as if it were a task he was compelled to perform, this interview, for fear his father should scold him. But I'm hardly going to come to give Mr. Heathcliff pleasure, whatever reason he may have for ordering Linton to undergo this penance. And though I'm glad he's better in health, I'm sorry he's so much less pleasant, and so much less affectionate to me." "'You think he is better in health, then?' I said. "'Yes,' she answered, "'because he always made such a great deal of his sufferings, you know. He is not tolerably well, as he told me to tell Papa, but he's better very likely." "'There you differ with me, Miss Cathy,' I remarked. I should conjecture him to be far worse." Linton here started from his slumber in bewildered terror, and asked if any one had called his name. "'No,' said Catherine. "'Unless in dreams. 
I cannot conceive how you manage to doze out of doors in the morning. I, I, I thought I heard my father. He gasped, glancing up to the frowning nab above us. You are sure nobody spoke? Quite sure, replied his cousin. Only Ellen and I were disputing concerning your health. Are you truly stronger, Linton, than when we were separated in winter? If you be, I am certain one thing is not stronger. Your regard for me. Speak. Are you? The tears gushed from Linton's eyes as he answered. Yes. Yes, I am. And still under the spell of the imaginary voice, his gaze wandered up and down to detect its owner. Cathy rose. For today we must part, she said. And I won't conceal that I have been sadly disappointed with our meeting, though I'll mention it to nobody but you. Not that I stand in awe of Mr. Heathcliff. Hush, murmured Linton. For God's sake, hush! He's coming. And he clung to Catherine's arm, striving to detain her. But at that announcement she hastily disengaged herself, and whistled to Minnie, who obeyed her like a dog. I'll be here next Thursday, she cried, springing to the saddle. Good-bye. Quick, Ellen. And so we left him, scarcely conscious of our departure, so absorbed was he in anticipating his father's approach. Before we reached home, Catherine's displeasure softened into a perplexed sensation of pity and regret, largely blended with vague, uneasy doubts about Linton's actual circumstances, physical and social, in which I partook, though I counselled her not to say much, for a second journey would make us better judges. My master requested an account of our ongoings. His nephew's offering of thanks was duly delivered, Miss Cathy gently touching on the rest. I also threw little light on his inquiries, for I hardly knew what to hide and what to reveal. End of chapter 26 Chapter Twenty Seven of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seven days glided away, every one marking its course by the henceforth rapid alteration of Edgar Linton's state. The havoc that months had previously wrought was now emulated by the inroads of hours. Catherine, we would fain have deluded yet, but her own quick spirit refused to delude her. It divined in secret, and brooded on the dreadful probability, gradually ripening into certainty. She had not the heart to mention her ride, when Thursday came round. I mentioned it for her, and obtained permission to order her out of doors, for the library, where her father stopped a short time daily, the brief period he could bear to sit up, and his chamber had become her whole world. She grudged each moment that did not find her bending over his pillow, or seated by his side. Her countenance grew wan with watching and sorrow, and my master gladly dismissed her to what he flattered himself would be a happy change of scene and society, drawing comfort from the hope that she would not now be left entirely alone after his death. He had a fixed idea, I guessed by several observations he let fall, that, as his nephew resembled him in person, he would resemble him in mind, for Linton's letters bore few or no indications of his defective character, and I, through pardonable weakness, refrained from correcting the error, asking myself what good there would be in disturbing his last moments with information that he had neither power nor opportunity to turn to account. We deferred our excursion till the afternoon, a golden afternoon of August, every breath from the hills so full of life, that it seemed whoever respired it, though dying, might revive. Catherine's face was just like the landscape, shadows and sunshine flitting over it in rapid succession, but the shadows rested longer, and the sunshine was more transient, and her poor little heart reproached itself for even that passing forgetfulness of its cares. We discerned Linton watching at the same spot he had selected before, my young mistress alighted, and told me that, as she was resolved to stay a very little while, I had better hold the pony and remain on horseback, but I dissented, 
I wouldn't risk losing sight of the charge committed to me a minute, so we climbed the slope of Heath together. Master Heathcliff received us with greater animation on this occasion, not the animation of high spirits, though, nor yet of joy. It looked more like fear. It is late, he said, speaking short and with difficulty. Is not your father very ill? I thought you wouldn't come. Why won't you be candid? cried Catherine, swallowing her greeting. Why care not you say at once you don't want me? It is strange, Linton, that for the second time you have brought me here on purpose, apparently to distress us both, and for no reason besides. Linton shivered, and glanced at her, half supplicating, half ashamed, but his cousin's patience was not sufficient to endure this enigmatical behaviour. "'My father is very ill,' she said. "'And why am I called from his bedside? Why didn't you send to absolve me from my promise, when you wished I wouldn't keep it? Come, I desire an explanation. Playing and trifling are completely banished out of my mind, and I can't dance attendance on your affectations now.' "'My affections!' he murmured. "'What are they? For heaven's sake, Catherine, don't look so angry. Despise me as much as you please. I am a worthless, cowardly wretch. I can't be scorned enough, but I'm too mean for your anger. Hate my father.' and spare me for contempt. Nonsense! cried Catherine in a passion. Foolish, silly boy! And there he trembles, as if I were really going to touch him. You needn't bespeak contempt, Linton. Anybody will have it spontaneously at your service. Get off! I shall return home. It is folly dragging you from the hearthstone and pretending— What do we pretend? Let go my frock! If I pitied you for crying and looking so very frightened, you should spurn such pity. Ellen, tell him how disgraceful this conduct is. Rise and don't degrade yourself into an abject reptile. Don't! With streaming face and an expression of agony, Linton had thrown his nerveless frame along the ground. He seemed convulsed with exquisite terror. <gasps> he sobbed. I cannot bear it. Catherine. Catherine, I'm a traitor, too, and I dare not tell you. But leave me, and I shall be killed. Dear Catherine, my life is in your hands, and you have said you loved me. And if you did, it wouldn't harm you. You'll not go, then. Kind, sweet, good Catherine, and perhaps you will consent, and he'll let me die with you. My young lady, on witnessing his intense anguish, stooped to raise him. The old feeling of indulgent tenderness overcame her vexation, and she grew thoroughly moved and alarmed. Consent to what? she asked. To stay? Tell me the meaning of this strange talk, and I will. You contradict your own words, and distract me. Be calm and frank, and confess at once all that weighs on your heart. You wouldn't injure me, Linton, would you? You wouldn't let any enemy hurt me if you could prevent it. I'll believe you are a coward for yourself, but not a cowardly betrayer of your best friend. But my father threatened me, gasped the boy, clasping his attenuated fingers. And I dread him. I dread him. I dare not tell. Oh, well, said Catherine with scornful compassion. Keep your secret. I'm no coward. Save yourself. I'm not afraid. Her magnanimity provoked his tears. He wept wildly, kissing her supporting hands, and yet could not summon courage to speak out. I was cogitating what the mystery might be and determined Catherine should never suffer to benefit him or any one else by my good will, when, hearing a rustle among the ling, I looked up, and saw Mr. Heathcliff almost close upon us, descending the heights. He didn't cast a glance towards my companions, though they were sufficiently near for Linton's sobs to be audible, 
but, hailing me in the most hearty tone he assumed to none besides, and the sincerity of which I couldn't avoid doubting, he said, It is something to see you so near to my house, Nelly. How are you at the Grange? Let us hear. The rumour goes, he added in a lower tone, that Edgar Linton is on his deathbed. Perhaps they exaggerate his illness? No, my master is dying, I replied. It is true enough. A sad thing it will be for us all, but a blessing for him. How long will he last, do you think? He asked. I don't know, I said. Because, he continued, looking at the two young people, who were fixed under his eye, Linton appeared as if he could not venture to stir or raise his head, and Catherine could not move on his account. Because that lad yonder seems determined to beat me, and I'd thank his uncle to be quick and go before him. Hello, has the whelp been playing that game long? I did give him some lessons about snivelling. Is he pretty lively with Miss Linton generally? Lively? No, he has shown the greatest distress, I answered. To see him, I should say, that instead of rambling with his sweetheart on the hills, he ought to be in bed, under the hands of a doctor. He shall be in a day or two, muttered Heathcliff. But first, get up, Linton, get up, he shouted. Don't grovel on the ground there, up this moment. Linton had sunk prostrate again in another paroxysm of helpless fear caused by his father's glance towards him. I suppose. There was nothing else to produce such humiliation. He made several efforts to obey, but his little strength was annihilated for the time, and he fell back again with a moan. Mr. Heathcliff advanced and lifted him to lean against a ridge of turf. Now, said he, with curbed ferocity, I'm getting angry, and if you don't command that paltry spirit of yours, damn you, get up directly. I will, father. He panted. Only let me alone, or I shall faint. I've done as you wished, I'm sure. Catherine will tell you that I, that I have been cheerful. Ah, keep by me, Catherine. Give me your hand. Take mine, said his father. Stand on your feet. There now, she'll lend you her arm. That's right, look at her. You would imagine I was the devil himself, Miss Linton, to excite such horror. Be so kind as to walk home with him, will you? He shudders if I touch him. Linton, dear, whispered Catherine, I can't go to Wuthering Heights. Papa has forbidden me. He'll not harm you. Why are you so afraid? I can never re-enter that house, he answered. I'm not to re-enter it without you. Stop, cried his father. We'll respect Catherine's filial scruples. Nelly, take him in, and I'll follow your advice concerning the doctor without delay. You'll do well, replied I, but I must remain with my mistress to mind your son is not my business. You are very stiff, said Heathcliff. I know that, but you'll force me to pinch the baby and make it scream before it moves your charity. Come then, my hero, are you willing to return escorted by me? He approached once more, and made as if he would seize the fragile being, but, shrinking back, Linton clung to his cousin, and implored her to accompany him, with a frantic importunity that admitted no denial. However, I disapproved. I couldn't hinder her. Indeed, how could she have refused him herself? What was filling him with dread we had no means of discerning. But there he was, powerless under its grip, and any addition seemed capable of shocking him into idiocy. We reached the threshold. Catherine walked in, and I stood waiting till she had conducted the invalid to a chair, expecting her out immediately, when Mr. Heathcliff, pushing me forward, exclaimed, my house is not stricken with the plague, Nelly, and I have a mind to be hospitable to-day. Sit down and allow me to shut the door. He shut and locked it also. I started. You shall have tea before you go home, he added. I am by myself. Hareton is gone with some cattle to the Lees, and Zilla and Joseph are off on a journey of pleasure, and though I'm used to being alone, I'd rather have some interesting company if I can get it. Miss Linton, take your seat by him. 
i give you what i have the present is hardly worth accepting but i have nothing else to offer it is linton i mean how she does stare it's odd what a savage feeling i have to anything that seems afraid of me had i been born where laws are less strict and tastes less dainty i should treat myself to a slow vivisection of those two as an evening's amusement he drew in his breath struck the table and swore to himself by hell i hate them i am not afraid of you exclaimed catherine who could not hear the latter part of his speech she stepped close up her black eyes flashing with passion and resolution give me that key i will have it she said i wouldn't eat or drink here if i was starving heathcliff had the key in his hand that remained on the table he looked up seized with a sort of surprise at her boldness or possibly reminded by her voice and glance of the person from whom she inherited it she snatched at the instrument and half succeeded in getting it out of his loosened fingers but her action recalled him to the present he recovered it speedily now catherine linton he said stand off or i shall knock you down and that will make mrs dean mad regardless of this warning she captured his closed hand and its contents again we will go she repeated exerting her utmost efforts to cause the iron muscles to relax and finding that her nails made no impression she applied her teeth pretty sharply heathcliff glanced at me a glance that kept me from interfering a moment catherine was too intent on his fingers to notice his face he opened them suddenly and resigned the object of dispute but ere she had well secured it he seized her with the liberated hand and pulling her on his knee administered with the other a shower of terrific slaps on both sides of the head each sufficient to have fulfilled his threat had she been able to fall at this diabolical violence i rushed on him furiously you villain i began to cry you villain a touch on the chest silenced me i am stout and soon put out of breath and what with that and the rage i staggered dizzily back and felt ready to suffocate or to burst a blood vessel the scene was over in two minutes catherine released put her two hands to her temples and looked just as if she were not sure whether her ears were off or on she trembled like a reed poor thing and leant against the table perfectly bewildered i know how to chastise children you see said the scoundrel grimly as he stooped to repossess himself of the key which had dropped to the floor go to linton now as i told you and cry at your ease i shall be your father to-morrow all the father you'll have in a few days and you shall have plenty of that you can bear plenty you're no weakling you shall have a daily taste if i catch such a devil of a temper in your eyes again cathy ran to me instead of linton and knelt down and put her burning cheek on my lap weeping aloud her cousin had shrunk into a corner of the settle as quiet as a mouse congratulating himself i dare say that the correction had alighted on another than him mr heathcliff perceiving us all confounded rose and expeditiously made the tea himself the cups and saucers were laid ready he poured it out and handed me a cup wash away your spleen he said and help your own naughty pet and mine it is not poisoned though i prepared it i'm going out to seek your horses our first thought on his departure was to force an exit somewhere we tried the kitchen door but that was fastened outside we looked at the windows they were too narrow for even cathy's little figure master linton i cried seeing we were regularly imprisoned you know what your diabolical father is after and you shall tell us or i'll box your ears as he has done your cousins yes linton you must tell said catherine it was for your sake i came and it will be wickedly ungrateful if you refuse give me some tea i'm thirsty and then i'll tell you he answered mrs dean go away i don't like you standing over me now catherine you are letting your tears fall into my cup i won't drink that give me another catherine pushed another to him and wiped her face i felt disgusted at the little wretch's composure since he was no longer in terror for himself 
The anguish he had exhibited on the moor subsided as soon as ever he entered Wuthering Heights, so I guessed he had been menaced with an awful visitation of wrath if he failed in decoying us there, and that accomplished, he had no further immediate fears. Papa wants us to be married, he continued, after sipping some of the liquid. And he knows your papa wouldn't let us marry now. And he's afraid of my dying if we wait. So we are to be married in the morning, and you are to stay here all night. And if you do as he wishes, you shall return home next day and take me with you. Take you with her, pitiful changeling, I exclaimed. You marry. Why, the man is mad, or he thinks us fools, every one. And do you imagine that beautiful young lady, that healthy, hearty girl, will tie herself to a little perishing monkey like you? Are you cherishing the notion that anybody, let alone Miss Catherine Linton, would have you for a husband? You want whipping for bringing us in here at all, with your dastardly puling tricks, and don't look so silly now. I've a very good mind to shake you severely for your contemptible treachery and your imbecile conceit. I did give him a slight shaking, but it brought on the cough, and he took to his ordinary resource of moaning and weeping, and Catherine rebuked me. Stay all night? No, she said, looking slowly round. Ellen, I'll burn that door down, but I'll get out. And she would have commenced the execution of her threat directly, but Linton was up in alarm for his dear self again. He clasped her in his two feeble arms, sobbing. Won't you have me and save me? Not let me come to the Grange? Oh, darling Catherine, you mustn't go and leave after all. You must obey my father. You must. I must obey my own, she replied, and relieve him from this cruel suspense. The whole night? What would he think? He'll be distressed already. I'll either break or burn away out of the house. Be quiet. You're in no danger. But if you hinder me, Linton, I love Papa better than you. The mortal terror he felt of Mr. Heathcliff's anger restored to the boy his coward's eloquence. Catherine was near distraught. Still, she persisted that she must go home, and tried entreaty in her turn, persuading him to subdue his selfish agony. While they were thus occupied, our jailer re-entered. "'Your beasts have trotted off,' he said. "'And now, Linton, snivelling again? What has she been doing to you?' Come, come, have done and get to bed. In a month or two, my lad, you'll be able to pay her back her present tyrannies with a vigorous hand. You're pining for pure love, are you? Nothing else in the world, and she shall have you. There, to bed. Zilla won't be here to-night. You must undress yourself. Hush! Hold your noise. Once in your own room, I'll not come near you. You needn't fear. By chance, you've managed tolerably. I'll look to the rest. He spoke these words, holding the door open for his son to pass, and the latter achieved his exit exactly as a spaniel might, which suspected the person who attended on it of designing a spiteful squeeze. The lock was re-secured. Heathcliff approached the fire, where my mistress and I stood silent. Catherine looked up, and instinctively raised her hand to her cheek. His neighbourhood revived a painful sensation. Anybody else would have been incapable of regarding the childish act with sternness, but he scowled on her and muttered, Oh, you are not afraid of me. Your courage is well disguised. You seem damnably afraid. I am afraid now, she replied, because if I stay, Papa will be miserable. And how can I endure making him miserable when he, when he, Mr. Heathcliff, let me go home. I promised to marry Linton. Papa would like me to, and I love him. Why should you wish to force me to do what I'll willingly do of myself? Let him dare to force you, I cried. 
there's law in this land, thank God. There is, though we be in an out-of-the-way place. I'd inform if he were my own son, and it's felony without benefit of clergy. Silence, said the ruffian. To the devil with your clamour. I don't want you to speak. Miss Linton, I shall enjoy myself remarkably in thinking your father will be miserable. I shall not sleep for satisfaction. You could have hit on no surer way of fixing your residence under my roof for the next twenty-four hours than informing me that such an event would follow. As to your promise to marry Linton, I'll take care you shall keep it, for you shall not quit this place till it is fulfilled. "'Send Ellen, then, to let papa know I'm safe!' exclaimed Catherine, weeping bitterly. "'Or marry me now! Poor papa! Ellen, he'll think we're lost! What shall we do?' "'Not he! He'll think you are tired of waiting on him, and run off for a little amusement,' answered Heathcliff. "'You cannot deny that you entered my house of your own accord, in contempt of his injunctions to the contrary.' and it is quite natural that you should desire amusement at your age and that you would weary of nursing a sick man and that man only your father catherine his happiest days were over when your days began he cursed you i dare say for coming into the world i did at least and it would just do if he cursed you as he went out of it i'd join him i don't love you how should i weep away as far as I can see, it will be your chief diversion hereafter, unless Linton make amends for other losses, and your provident parent appears to fancy he may. His letters of advice and consolation entertained me vastly. In his last he recommended my jewel to be careful of his, and kind to her when he got her. Careful and kind, that's paternal but linton requires his whole stock of care and kindness for himself linton can play the little tyrant well he'll undertake to torture any number of cats if their teeth be drawn and their claws pared he'll be able to tell his uncle fine tales of his kindness when you get home i assure you you're right there i said explain your son's character show his resemblance to yourself and then i hope miss cathy will think twice before she takes the cockatrice i don't much mind speaking of his amiable qualities now he answered because she must either accept him or remain a prisoner and you along with her till your master dies i can detain you both quite concealed here if you doubt encourage her to retract her word and you'll have an opportunity of judging i'll not retract my word said catherine i'll marry him within this hour if i may go to thrushcross grange afterwards mr heathcliff you're a cruel man but you're not a fiend and you won't from mere malice destroy irrevocably all my happiness if papa thought i had left him on purpose and if he died before i returned could i bear to live i've given over crying but I'm going to kneel here at your knee, and I'll not get up, and I'll not take my eyes from your face till you look back at me. No, don't turn away. Do look. You'll see nothing to provoke you. I don't hate you. I'm not angry that you struck me. Have you never loved anybody in all your life, Uncle? Never. Ah, oh, you must look once. I'm so wretched, you can't help being sorry and pitying me. Keep your F's fingers off, and move or I'll kick you, cried Heathcliff, brutally repulsing her. I'd rather be hugged by a snake. How the devil can you dream of fawning on me? I detest you. He shrugged his shoulders, shook himself indeed, as if his flesh crept with aversion, and thrust back his chair, while I got up and opened my mouth to commence a downright torrent of abuse but I was rendered dumb in the middle of the first sentence by a threat that I should be shown into a room by myself the very next syllable I uttered. It was growing dark. We heard a sound of voices at the garden gate. Our host hurried out instantly. He had his wits about him. We had not. There was a talk of two or three minutes, and he returned alone. "'I thought it had been your cousin Hareton,' I observed to Catherine. "'I wish he would arrive.' Who knows but he might take our part? It was three servants sent to seek you from the Grange, said Heathcliff, overhearing me. 
you should have opened a lattice and called out but i could swear that chit is glad you didn't she's glad to be obliged to stay i'm certain at learning the chance we had missed we both gave vent to our grief without control and he allowed us to wail on till nine o'clock then he bid us go upstairs through the kitchen to zillah's chamber and i whispered my companion to obey perhaps we might contrive to get through the window there or into a garret and out by its skylight the window however was narrow like those below and the garret trap was safe from our attempts for we were fastened in as before we neither of us lay down catherine took her station by the lattice and watched anxiously for morning a deep sigh being the only answer i could obtain to my frequent entreaties that she would try to rest i seated myself in a chair and rocked to and fro passing harsh judgment on my many derelictions of duty from which it struck me then all the misfortunes of my employers sprang it was not the case in reality i am aware but it was in my imagination that dismal night and i thought heathcliff himself less guilty than i at seven o'clock he came and inquired if miss linton had risen she ran to the door immediately and answered yes here then he said opening it and pulling her out i rose to follow but he turned the lock again i demanded my release be patient he replied i'll send up your breakfast in a while i thumped on the panels and rattled the latch angrily and catherine asked why i was still shut up he answered i must try to endure it another hour and then went away i endured it two or three hours at length i heard a footstep not heathcliff's i brought you something to eat said a voice open door complying eagerly i beheld hareton laden with food enough to last me all day take it he added thrusting the tray into my hand stay one minute i began nay cried he and retired regardless of any prayers i could put forth to detain him and there i remained enclosed the whole day and the whole of the next night and another and another five nights and four days i remained altogether seeing nobody but hareton once every morning and he was a model of a jailer surly and dumb and deaf to every attempt at moving his sense of justice or compassion End of chapter 27Chapter 28 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the fifth morning, or rather afternoon, a different step approached, lighter and shorter, and this time the person entered the room. It was Zillah, donned in her scarlet shawl, with a black silk bonnet on her head, and a willow basket swung to her arm. Ah, oh, dear! Mrs. Dean! she exclaimed well there is a talk about you at gimmerton i never thought but you were sunk in the black horse marsh and missy with you till master told me you'd been found and he lodged you here what and you must have got on an island sure and how long were you in the hole did master save you mrs dean but you're not so thin you've not been so poorly have you your master is a true scoundrel i replied but he shall answer for it he needn't have raised that tale it shall be all laid bare what do you mean asked zillah it's not his tale they tell it in the village about your being lost in the marsh and i calls to earnshaw when i come in eh there's queer things mr hareton happened since i went off it's a sad pity of that likely young lass and can't nelly dean he said and I thought he had not heard aught. So I told him the rumour. The master listened, and he just smiled to himself, and said, If they had been in the marsh, they are out now, Zilla. Nellie Dean is lodged at this minute in your room. You can tell her to flit when you go up. Here is the key. The bog water got in her head, and she would have run home quite flighty, but I fixed her till she came round to her senses. You can bid her go to the Grange at once, if she be able, and carry a message from me, that her young lady will follow in time to attend the squire's funeral. 
Mr. Edgar is not dead, I gasped. Oh, Zilla, Zilla! No, no, sit you down, my good mistress, she replied. You're right sickly yet. He's not dead. Dr. Kenneth thinks he may last another day. I met him on the road and asked. Instead of sitting down, I snatched my outdoor things and hastened below, for the way was free. On entering the house, I looked about for someone to give information of Catherine. The place was filled with sunshine, and the door stood wide open, but nobody seemed at hand. As I hesitated whether to go off at once or return to seek my mistress, a slight cough drew my attention to the hearth. Linton lay on the settle, sole tenant, sucking a stick of sugar candy and pursuing my movements with apathetic eyes. "'Where is Miss Catherine?' I demanded sternly, supposing I could frighten him into giving intelligence by catching him thus alone. He sucked on like an innocent. "'Is she gone?' I said. "'No,' he replied. "'She's upstairs. She's not to go. We won't let her.' "'You won't let her, little idiot!' I exclaimed. "'Direct me to her room immediately, or I'll make you sing out sharply.' "'Papa would make you sing out if you attempted to get there,' he answered. "'He says I'm not as soft with Catherine. She's my wife. "'And it's shameful that she should wish to leave me. "'She says she hates me and wants me to die, that she may have my money. "'But she shan't have it, and she shan't go home. "'She never shall.' She may cry and be sick as much as she pleases. He resumed his former occupation, closing his lids as if he meant to drop asleep. Master Heathcliff, I resumed, have you forgotten all Catherine's kindness to you last winter, when you affirmed you loved her, and when she brought you books and sung you songs, and came many a time through the wind and snow to see you? She wept to miss one evening, because you would be disappointed, and you felt then that she was a hundred times too good to you, and now you believe the lies your father tells, though you know he detests you both, and you join him against her. That's fine gratitude, is it not? The corner of Linton's mouth fell, and he took the sugar candy from his lips. Did she come to Wuthering Heights because she hates you? I continued. Think for yourself. As to your money, she does not even know that you will have any. And you say she's sick, and yet you leave her alone, up there in a strange house. You who have felt what it is to be so neglected. You could pity your own sufferings, and she pitied them too. But you won't pity hers. I shed tears, Master Heathcliff, you see, an elderly woman and a servant merely, and you, after pretending such affection and having reason to worship her almost, store every tear you have for yourself and lie there quite at ease. Ah, oh, you're a heartless, selfish boy. I can stay with her, he answered crossly. I'll not stay by myself. She cries so I can't bear it, and she won't give over. Though I say I'll call my father, I did call him once, and he threatened to strangle her if she was not quiet. But she began again the instant he left the room, moaning and grieving all night long, though I screamed for vexation that I couldn't sleep. Is Mr. Heathcliff out? I inquired, perceiving that the wretched creature had no power to sympathise with his cousin's mental tortures. "'He's in the court,' he replied, "'talking to Uncle Kenneth, who says Uncle is dying, truly at last. I'm glad, for I shall be master of the Grange after him. Catherine always spoke of it as her house. It isn't hers.' It's mine. Papa says everything she has is mine. All her nice books are mine. She offered to give me them and her pretty birds and her pony, Minnie, if I would get the key of our room and let her out. But I told her she had nothing to give. They were all, all mine. And then she cried and took a little picture from her neck, 
and said, I should have that. Two pictures in a gold case. On one side, her mother, and on the other, uncle, when they were young. That was yesterday. I said they were mine, too, and tried to get them from her. The spiteful thing wouldn't let me. She pushed me off and hurt me. I shrieked out. That frightened her. She heard Papa coming, and she broke the hinges and divided the case and gave me her mother's portrait. The other she attempted to hide, but Papa asked what was the matter, and I explained it. He took the other I had away and ordered her to resign hers to me. She refused, and he he struck her down and wrenched it off the chain and crushed it with his foot and were you pleased to see her struck i asked having my designs in encouraging his talk i winked he answered i wink to see my father strike a dog or a horse he does it so hard yet i was glad at first she deserved punishing for punishing me but when papa was gone she made me come to the window and showed me her cheek cut on the inside against her teeth and her mouth filling with blood and then she gathered up the bits of the picture and went and sat down with her face to the wall and she has never spoken to me since and i sometimes think she can't speak for pain i don't like to think so but she's a naughty thing for crying continually and she looks so pale and wild i'm afraid of her and you can get the key if you choose i said yes when I am upstairs, he answered, but I can't walk upstairs now. In what apartment is it? I asked. Oh, he cried. I shan't tell you where it is. It is our secret. Nobody, neither Hareton nor Zilla, is to know. There, I, you've tired me. Go away. Go away. And he turned his face on to his arm and shut his eyes again. I considered it best to depart without seeing Mr. Heathcliff and bring a rescue for my young lady from the Grange. On reaching it, the astonishment of my fellow servants to see me and their joy also was intense, and when they heard that their little mistress was safe, two or three were about to hurry up and shout the news at Mr. Edgar's door, but I bespoke the announcement of it myself. How changed I found him, even in those few days! He lay an image of sadness and resignation awaiting his death. Very young he looked, though his actual age was thirty-nine. One would have called him ten years younger at least. He thought of Catherine, for he murmured her name. I touched his hand and spoke. "'Catherine is coming, dim master,' I whispered. "'She is alive and well, and will be here, I hope, to-night.' I trembled at the first effects of this intelligence— he half rose up, looked eagerly round the apartment, and then sank back in a swoon. As soon as he recovered, I related our compulsory visit and detention at the heights. I said Heathcliff forced me to go in, which was not quite true. I uttered as little as possible against Linton, nor did I describe all his father's brutal conduct, my intentions being to add no bitterness, if I could help it, to his already overflowing cup. He divined that one of his enemy's purposes was to secure the personal property as well as the estate to his son, or rather himself, yet why he did not wait till his decease was a puzzle to my master, because ignorant how nearly he and his nephew would quit the world together. However, he felt that his will had better be altered. Instead of leaving Catherine's fortunes at her own disposal, he determined to put it in the hands of trustees for her use during life, and for her children, if she had any, after her. By that means it could not fall to Mr. Heathcliff should Linton die. 
Having received his orders, I dispatched a man to fetch the attorney, and four more provided with serviceable weapons to demand my young lady of her jailer. Both parties were delayed very late. The single servant returned first. He said Mr. Green, the lawyer, was out when he arrived at his house, and he had to wait two hours for his re-entrance. And then Mr. Green told him he had a little business in the village that must be done, but he would be at Thrushcross Grange before morning. The four men came back unaccompanied also. They brought word that Catherine was ill, too ill to quit her room, and Heathcliff would not suffer them to see her. I scolded the stupid fellows well for listening to that tale, which I would not carry to my master, resolving to take a whole bevy up to the heights at daylight, and storm it literally, unless the prisoner were quietly surrendered to us. Her father shall see her, I vowed, and vowed again, if that devil be killed on his own doorstones in trying to prevent it. Happily, I was spared the journey and the trouble. I had gone downstairs at three o'clock to fetch a jug of water, and was passing through the hall with it in my hand, when a sharp knock at the front door made me jump. "'Oh, it is green,' I said, recollecting myself. "'Only green.' And I went on, intending to send somebody else to open it. But the knock was repeated, not loud, and still, importunately. I put the jug on the banister, and hastened to admit him myself— the harvest moon shone clear outside. It was not the attorney. My own sweet little mistress sprang on my neck, sobbing. Ellen! Ellen! Is papa alive? Yes, I cried. Yes, my angel, he is. God be thanked, you are safe with us again. She wanted to run, breathless as she was, upstairs to Mr. Linton's room, but I compelled her to sit down on a chair, and made her drink, and washed her pale face, chafing it into a faint colour with my apron. Then I said I must go first, and tell of her arrival, imploring her to say she should be happy with young Heathcliff. She stared, but soon comprehending why I counselled her to utter the falsehood, she assured me she would not complain. I couldn't abide to be present at their meeting— I stood outside the chamber door a quarter of an hour, and hardly ventured near the bed then. All was composed, however. Catherine's despair was as silent as her father's joy. She supported him calmly, in appearance, and he fixed on her features his raised eyes that seemed dilating with ecstasy. He died blissfully, Mr. Lockwood. He died so, kissing her cheek, he murmured. I am going to her, and you... Darling child, shall come to us. And never stirred or spoke again, but continued that rapt, radiant gaze till his pulse imperceptibly stopped and his soul departed. None could have noticed the exact minute of his death. It was so entirely without a struggle. Whether Catherine had spent her tears, or whether the grief were too weighty to let them flow, she sat there, dry-eyed, till the sun rose. She sat till noon, and would still have remained brooding over that deathbed, but I insisted on her coming away, and taking some repose. It was well I succeeded in removing her, for at dinner-time appeared the lawyer, having called at Wuthering Heights to get his instructions how to behave. He had sold himself to Mr. Heathcliff. That was the cause of his delay in obeying my master's summons. Fortunately, no thought of worldly affairs crossed the latter's mind to disturb him after his daughter's arrival. Mr. Green took upon himself to order everything and everybody about the place. He gave all the servants but me notice to quit. He would have carried his delegated authority to the point of insisting that Edgar Linton should not be buried beside his wife, but in the chapel with his family. There was the will, however, to hinder that— and my loud protestations against any infringement of its directions. The funeral was hurried over. Catherine, Mrs. Linton Heathcliff now, was suffered to stay at the Grange till her father's corpse had quitted it. She told me that her anguish had at last spurred Linton to incur the risk of liberating her. She heard the men I sent disputing at the door, and she gathered the sense of Heathcliff's answer. It drove her desperate. Linton, who had been conveyed up to the little parlour soon after I left, was terrified into fetching the key before his father reascended. He had the cunning to unlock and relock the door without shutting it, and when he should have gone to bed, he begged to sleep with Hereton, and his petition was granted for once. Catherine stole out before break of day, 
She dared not try the doors, lest the dogs should raise an alarm. She visited the empty chambers and examined their windows, and, luckily, lighting on her mother's, she got easily out of its lattice and on to the ground by means of the fir-tree close by. Her accomplice suffered for his share in the escape, notwithstanding his timid contrivances. End of chapter 28《Chapter Twenty Nine of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The evening after the funeral, my young lady and I were seated in the library, now musing mournfully, one of us despairingly, on our loss, now venturing conjectures as to the gloomy future. We had just agreed the best destiny which could await Catherine could be a permission to continue resident at the Grange at least during Linton's life, he being allowed to join her there, and I to remain as housekeeper. That seemed rather too favourable an arrangement to be hoped for, and yet I did hope, and began to cheer up under the prospect of retaining my home and my employment, and, above all, my beloved young mistress, when a servant, one of the discarded ones, not yet departed, rushed hastily in, and said, That devil Heathcliff! was coming through the court, should he fasten the door in his face. If we had been mad enough to order that proceeding, we had not time. He made no ceremony of knocking or announcing his name. He was master, and availed himself of the master's privilege to walk straight in, without saying a word. The sound of our informant's voice directed him to the library. He entered, and motioning him out, shut the door. It was the same room into which he had been ushered, as a guest, eighteen years before. The same moon shone through the window, and the same autumn landscape lay outside. We had not yet lighted a candle, but all the apartment was visible, even to the portraits on the wall. The splendid head of Mrs. Linton, and the graceful one of her husband, Heathcliff advanced to the hearth. Time had little altered his person either. There was the same man, his dark face rather sallower and more composed, his frame a stone or two heavier, perhaps, and no other difference. Catherine had risen with an impulse to dash out when she saw him. Stop, he said, arresting her by the arm. No more runnings away. Where would you go? I'm come to fetch you home, and I hope you'll be a dutiful daughter and not encourage my son to further disobedience. I was embarrassed how to punish him when I discovered his part in the business. He's such a cobweb, a pinch would annihilate him. But you'll see by his look that he has received his due. I brought him down one evening, the day before yesterday, and just set him in a chair, and never touched him afterwards. I sent Hareton out, and we had the room to ourselves. In two hours I called Joseph to carry him up again, and since then my presence is as potent on his nerves as a ghost, and I fancy he sees me often, though I am not near. Hareton says he wakes and shrieks in the night by the hour together, and calls you to protect him from me and whether you like your precious mate or not, you must come. He's your concern now. I yield all my interest in him to you. Why not let Catherine continue here, I pleaded, and send Master Linton to her? As you hate them both, you'd not miss them. They can only be a daily plague to your unnatural heart. I'm seeking a tenant for the Grange, he answered, and I want my children about me, to be sure. Besides, that lass owes me her services for her bread. I'm not going to nurture her in luxury and idleness after Linton is gone. Make haste and get ready now, and don't oblige me to compel you. I shall, said Catherine. Linton is all I have to love in the world. And though you have done what you could to make him hateful to me, and me to him, you cannot make us hate each other. And I defy you to hurt him when I am by, and I defy you to frighten me. You are a boastful champion, replied Heathcliff. But I don't like you well enough to hurt him. You shall get the full benefit of the torment as long as it lasts. It is not I who will make him hateful to you. It is his own sweet spirit. He's as bitter as gall at your desertion and its consequences. Don't expect thanks for this noble devotion. I heard him draw a pleasant picture to Zilla of what he would do if he were as strong as I. The inclination is there and his very weakness will sharpen his wits to find a substitute for strength. I know he has a bad nature, said Catherine, 
he's your son. But I'm glad I've a better to forgive it. And I know he loves me, and for that reason I love him. Mr. Heathcliff, you have nobody to love you. And however miserable you make us, we shall still have the revenge of thinking that your cruelty arises from your greater misery. You are miserable, are you not? Lonely, like the devil, and envious like him. Nobody loves you. Nobody will cry for you when you die. I wouldn't be you." Catherine spoke with a kind of dreary triumph. She seemed to have made up her mind to enter into the spirit of her future family, and draw pleasure from the griefs of her enemies. "'You shall be sorry to be yourself presently,' said her father-in-law. "'If you stand there another minute, be gone, witch, and get your things.' She scornfully withdrew. In her absence I began to beg for Zilla's place at the heights, offering to resign mine to her, but he would suffer it on no account. He bid me be silent, and then, for the first time, allowed himself a glance round the room, and a look at the pictures. Having studied Mrs. Linton's, he said, I shall have that home, not because I need it, but— He turned abruptly to the fire, and continued, with what, for lack of a better word, I must call a smile. I'll tell you what I did yesterday. I got the sexton, who was digging Linton's grave, to remove the earth off her coffin lid, and I opened it. I thought once I would have stayed there. When I saw her face again, it is hers yet. He had hard work to stir me, but he said it would change if the air blew on it, and so I struck one side of the coffin loose and covered it up. Not Linton's side, damn him, I wish he'd been soldered in lead. And I bribed the sexton to pull it away when I'm laid there, and slide mine out too. I'll have it made so, and then by the time Linton gets to us, he'll not know which is which. You were very wicked, Mr. Heathcliff, I exclaimed. Were you not ashamed to disturb the dead? I disturbed nobody, Nelly, he replied and I gave some ease to myself. I shall be a great deal more comfortable now, and you'll have a better chance of keeping me underground when I get there. Disturbed her? No, she has disturbed me, night and day, through eighteen years, incessantly, remorselessly, till yesternight, and yesternight I was tranquil. I dreamt I was sleeping the last sleep by that sleeper, with my heart stopped and my cheek frozen against hers. And if she had been dissolved into earth, or worse, what would you have dreamt of then, I said? Of dissolving with her, and being more happy still. He answered. Do you suppose I dread any change of that sort? I expected such a transformation on raising the lid, but I'm better pleased that it should not commence till I share it. Besides, unless I had received a distinct impression of her passionless features, that strange feeling would hardly have been removed. It began oddly. You know I was wild after she died, and eternally, from dawn to dawn, praying her to return to me her spirit. I have a strong faith in ghosts. I have a conviction that they can and do exist among us. The day she was buried there came a fall of snow. In the evening I went to the churchyard. It blew bleak as winter, all round was solitary. I didn't fear that her fool of a husband would wander up the glen so late, and no one else had business to bring them there. Being alone, and conscious two yards of loose earth was the sole barrier between us, I said to myself, I'll have her in my arms again. If she be cold, I'll think it is this north wind that chills me, and if she be motionless, it is sleep. I got a spade from the tool-house and began to delve with all my might. It scraped the coffin. I fell to work with my hands. The wood commenced cracking about the screws. I was on the point of attaining my object when it seemed that I heard a sigh from some one above, close at the edge of the grave, and bending down. If I can only get this off, I muttered, I wish they may shovel in the earth over us both, and I wrenched at it more desperately still. There was another sigh, close at my ear. 
i appeared to feel the warm breath of it displacing the sleet-laden wind i knew no living thing in flesh and blood was by but as certainly as you perceive the approach to some substantial body in the dark though it cannot be discerned so certainly i felt that cathy was there not under me but on the earth a sudden sense of relief flowed from my heart through every limb i relinquished my labour of agony and turned consoled at once unspeakably consoled her presence was with me it remained while i refilled the grave and led me home you may laugh if you will but i was sure i should see her there i was sure she was with me and i could not help talking to her having reached the heights i rushed eagerly to the door it was fastened and i remember that accursed earnshaw and my wife opposed my entrance i remember stopping to kick the breath out of him and then hurrying upstairs to my room and hers i looked round impatiently i felt her by me i could almost see her and yet i could not i ought to have sweat blood then from the anguish of my yearning from the fervour of my supplications to have but one glimpse i had not one she showed herself as she often was in life a devil to me and since then sometimes more and sometimes less i have been the sport of that intolerable torture infernal keeping my nerves at such a stretch that if they had not resembled catgut they would long ago have relaxed to the feebleness of linton's when i sat in the house with hareton it seemed that on going out i should meet her when i walked on the moors i should meet her coming in when i went from home i hastened to return she must be somewhere at the heights i was certain and when i slept in her chamber i was beaten out of that i couldn't lie there for the moment i closed my eyes she was either outside the window or sliding back the panels or entering the room or even resting her darling head on the same pillow as she did when a child and i must open my lids to see and so i opened and closed them a hundred times a night to be always disappointed it racked me i have often groaned aloud till that old rascal joseph no doubt believed that my conscience was playing the fiend inside of me now since i've seen her i'm pacified a little it was a strange way of killing not by inches but by fractions of hairbreadths to beguile me with the spectre of a hope through eighteen years mr heathcliff paused and wiped his forehead his hair clung to it wet with perspiration his eyes were fixed on the red embers of the fire the brows not contracted but raised next to the temples diminishing the grim aspect of his countenance but imparting a peculiar look of trouble and a painful appearance of mental tension towards one absorbing subject he only half addressed me and i maintained silence i didn't like to hear him talk after a short period he resumed his meditation on the picture took it down and leant it against the sofa to contemplate it at better advantage and when so occupied catherine entered announcing that she was ready when her pony should be saddled send that over to-morrow said heathcliff to me then turning to her he added you may do without your pony it is a fine evening and you'll need no ponies at wuthering heights for what journeys you take your own feet will serve you come along good-bye ellen whispered my dear little mistress as she kissed me her lips felt like ice come and see me ellen don't forget take care you do no such thing mrs dean said her new father when i wish to speak to you i'll come here i want none of your prying at my house he signed her to precede him and casting back a look that cut my heart she obeyed i watched them from the window walk down the garden heathcliff fixed catherine's arm under his though she disputed the act at first evidently and with rapid strides he hurried her into the alley whose trees concealed them End of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of wuthering heights by emily bronte 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I have paid a visit to the Heights, but I have not seen her since she left. Joseph held the door in his hand when I called to ask after her, and wouldn't let me pass. He said Mrs. Linton was thrang, and the master was not in. Zilla had told me something of the way they go on, otherwise I should hardly know who was dead and who was living. She thinks Catherine haughty, and does not like her. I can guess by her talk. My young lady asked some aid of her when she first came, but Mr. Heathcliff told her to follow her own business, and let his daughter-in-law look after herself. And Zilla willingly acquiesced, being a narrow-minded, selfish woman. Catherine evinced a child's annoyance at this neglect, repaid it with contempt, and thus enlisted my informant among her enemies, as securely as if she had done her some great wrong. I had a long talk with Zilla, about six weeks ago, a little before you came, one day when we foregathered on the moor, and this is what she told me. The first thing Mrs. Linton did, she said, on her arrival at the Heights, was to run upstairs, without even wishing good evening to me and Joseph. She shut herself into Linton's room and remained till morning. Then, while the master and Earnshaw were at breakfast, she entered the house, and asked, all in a quiver, if the doctor might be sent for. Her cousin was very ill. "'We know that,' answered Heathcliff. "'But his life is not worth a farthing, and I won't spend a farthing on him.' "'But I cannot tell how to do,' she said. "'And if nobody will help me, he'll die.' "'Walk out of the room.' cried the master. And let me never hear a word more about him. None here care what becomes of him. If you do, act the nurse. If you do not, lock him up and leave him. Then she began to bother me, and I said I had enough plague with the tiresome thing. We each had our tasks, and hers was to wait on Linton. Mr. Heathcliff bid me leave the labour to her. How they managed together I can't tell. I fancy he fretted a great deal, and moaned hislin night and day and she had precious little rest, one could guess, by her white face and heavy eyes. She sometimes came into the kitchen all wildered like and looked as if she would fain beg assistance. But I was not going to disobey the master. I never dared disobey him, Mrs. Dean, and though I thought it wrong that Kenneth should not be sent for, it was no concern of mine either to advise or complain, and I always refused to meddle. Once or twice after we had gone to bed, I happened to open my door again and see her sitting crying on the stairs top, and then I've shut myself in quick, for fear of being moved to interfere. I did pity her then, I'm sure. Still, I didn't wish to lose my place, you know. At last, one night, she came boldly into my chamber and frightened me out of my wits by saying, Tell Mr. Heathcliff that his son is dying. I'm sure he is this time. Get up instantly and tell him. Having uttered this speech, she vanished again. I lay a quarter of an hour listening and trembling. Nothing stirred. The house was quiet. She's mistaken, I said to myself. He's got over it. I needn't disturb them. I began to doze. But my sleep was marred a second time by a sharp ringing of the bell, the only bell we have, put up on purpose for Linton, and the master called me to see what was the matter, and informed them that he wouldn't have that noise repeated. I delivered Catherine's message. He cursed to himself, and in a few minutes came out with a lighted candle, and proceeded to their room. I followed. Mrs. Heathcliff was seated by the bedside, with her hands folded on her knees. Her father-in-law went up, held the candle to Linton's face, looked at him, and touched him. Afterwards he turned to her. Now, Catherine, he said, how do you feel? She was dumb. How do you feel, Catherine? He repeated. He's safe. And I'm free. She answered. I should feel well. But, she continued with a bitterness she couldn't conceal, you have left me so long to struggle against death alone, that I feel and see only death. I feel like death. And she looked like it, too. I gave her a little wine. Hareton and Joseph, who had been wakened by the ringing and the sound of feet, and heard our talk from outside, now entered. Joseph was fain, I believe, for the lad's removal, 
Hareton seemed a thought bothered, though he was more taken up with staring at Catherine than thinking of Linton. But the master bid him get off to bed again. We didn't want his help. He afterwards made Joseph remove the body to his chamber, and told me to return to mine, and Mrs. Heathcliff remained by herself. In the morning he sent me to tell her she must come down to breakfast. She had undressed and appeared going to sleep, and said she was ill, at which I hardly wondered. I informed Mr. Heathcliff, and he replied, Well, let her be till after the funeral, and go up now and then to get her what is needful, and as soon as she seems better, tell me. Cathy stayed upstairs a fortnight, according to Zilla, who visited her twice a day, and would have been rather more friendly, but her attempts at increasing kindness were proudly and promptly repelled. Heathcliff went up once to show her Linton's will. He had bequeathed the whole of his, and what had been her, movable property, to his father. The poor creature was threatened, or coaxed, into that act during her week's absence, when his uncle died. The lands, being a minor, he could not meddle with. However, Mr. Heathcliff had claimed and kept them in his wife's right, and his also. I suppose legally, at any rate, Catherine, destitute of cash and friends, cannot disturb his possession. Nobody, said Zilla, ever approached her door except that once but I, and nobody asked anything about her. The first occasion of her coming down into the house was on a Sunday afternoon. She had cried out when I carried up her dinner that she couldn't bear any longer being in the cold, and I told her that the master was going to thrush cross Grange, and Earnshaw and I needn't hinder her from descending. So as soon as she heard Heathcliff's horse trot off, she made her appearance, dawned in black, and her yellow curls combed back behind her ears as plain as a Quaker. She couldn't comb them out. Joseph and I generally go to chapel on Sundays. The Kirk, you know, has no minister now, explained Mrs. Dean and they call it the Methodist or Baptist place. I can't say which it is. At Gimmerton, a chapel. Joseph had gone, she continued, but I thought proper to bide at home. Young folks are always the better for the elders overlooking, and Hareton, with all his bashfulness, isn't a model of nice behaviour. I let him know that his cousin would very likely sit with us, and she had been always used to see the Sabbath respected. So he had as good leave his guns and bits of indoor work alone, while she stayed. He coloured up at this news, and cast his eyes over his hands and clothes. The train oil and gunpowder was shoved out of sight in a minute. I saw he meant to give her his company, and I guessed by his way he wanted to be presentable, so laughing, as I durst not laugh when the master is by, I offered to help him, if he would, and joked at his confusion. He grew sullen and began to swear. Now, Mrs. Dean, Zilla went on, seeing me not pleased by her manner, you happen to think your young lady too fine for Mr. Hareton, and happen you're right, but I own I should love well to bring her pride a peg lower, and what will all her learning and her daintiness do for her now? She's as poor as you or I, poor, I'll be bound. You're saying, and I'm doing my little all that road. Hareton allowed Zilla to give him her aid, and she flattered him into a good humour, so, when Catherine came, half forgetting her former insults, he tried to make himself agreeable by the housekeeper's account. Mrs. walked in, she said, as chill as an icicle, and as high as a princess. I got up and offered her my seat in the armchair. No, she turned up her nose at my civility. And Shaw rose, too, and bid her come to the settle, and sit close by the fire. He was sure she was starved. I've been starved a month, and more," she answered, resting on the word as scornful as she could. And she got a chair for herself and placed it at a distance from both of us. Having sat till she was warm, she began to look around and discovered a number of books on the dresser. She was instantly upon her feet again, stretching to reach them, but they were too high up. Her cousin, after watching her endeavours a while, at last summoned courage to help her. She held her frock, and he filled it with the first that came to hand. That was a great advance for the lad. She didn't thank him, still he felt gratified that she had accepted his assistance, and ventured to stand behind as she examined them, and even to stoop and point out what struck his fancy in certain old pictures which they contained. 
nor was he daunted by the saucy style in which she jerked the page from his finger. He contented himself with going a bit farther back and looking at her instead of the book. She continued reading or seeking for something to read. His attention became by degrees quite centred in the study of her thick, silky curls. Her face he couldn't see, and she couldn't see him, and perhaps not quite awake to what he did, but attracted like a child to a candle. At last he proceeded from staring to touching. He put out his hand and stroked one curl as gently as if it were a bird. He might have struck a knife into her neck. She started round in such a taking. "'Get away this moment! How dare you touch me! Why are you stopping there?' she cried in a tone of disgust. "'I can't endure you. I'll go upstairs again if you come near me.' Mr. Hareton recoiled, looking as foolish as he could do. He sat down in the settle very quiet, and she continued turning over her volumes another half-hour. Finally Earnshaw crossed over and whispered to me, "'Will you ask her to read to us, Zilla? I'm stalled of doing naught, and I do like—I could like to hear her. Do not say I wanted it, but ask of yourself." "'Mr. Hareton wishes you would read to us, ma'am,' I said immediately. "'He'd take it very kindly. He'd be much obliged.' She frowned, and, looking up, answered, "'Mr. Hareton, and the whole set of you, will be good enough to understand that I reject any pretense at kindness you have the hypocrisy to offer. I despise you and will have nothing to say to any of you. When I would have given my life for one kind word, even to see one of your faces, you all kept off. But I won't complain to you. I'm driven down here by the cold, not either to amuse you or enjoy your society." "'What could I have done?' began Earnshaw. "'How was I to blame?' "'Oh, you are an exception,' answered Mrs. Heathcliff. I never missed such a concern as you. But I offered more than once and asked, he said, kindling up at her pertness. I asked Mr. Heathcliff to let me wake for you. Be silent. I'll go out of doors or anywhere, rather than have your disagreeable voice in my ear, said my lady. Hareton muttered she might go to hell for him, and unslinging his gun, restraining himself from his Sunday occupations no longer, he talked now freely enough, and she presently saw fit to retreat to her solitude. But the frost had set in, and in spite of her pride she was forced to condescend to our company more and more. However, I took care there should be no further scorning of my good nature ever since. I've been as stiff as herself, and she has no lover or liker among us, and she does not deserve one. Let them say the least word to her and she'll curl back without respect of any one. She'll snap the master himself as good as dares him to thrash her, and the more hurt she gets, the more venomous she grows." At first, on hearing this account from Zilla, I determined to leave my situation, take a cottage, and get Catherine to come and live with me. But Mr. Heathcliff would as soon permit that as he would set up Hareton in an independent house, and I can see no remedy at present unless she could marry again, and that scheme it does not come within my province to arrange." Thus ended Mrs. Dean's story. Notwithstanding the doctor's prophecy, I am rapidly recovering strength, and though it be only the second week in January, I propose getting out on horseback in a day or two, and riding over to Wuthering Heights, to inform my landlord that I shall spend the next six months in London, and if he likes, he may look out for another tenant to take the place after October. I would not pass another winter here for much. End of chapter 30、Chapter、Thirty One of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Yesterday was bright, calm, and frosty. I went to the Heights as I proposed. My housekeeper entreated me to bear a little note from her to her young lady, and I did not refuse, for the worthy woman was not conscious of anything odd in her request. The front door stood open, but the jealous gate was fastened as at my last visit. I knocked and invoked Earnshaw from among the garden beds. He unchained it, and I entered. 
the fellow is as handsome a rustic as need be seen. I took particular notice of him this time, but then he does his best apparently to make the least of his advantages. I asked if Mr. Heathcliff were at home. He answered no, but he would be in at dinner-time. It was eleven o'clock, and I announced my intention of going in and waiting for him, at which he immediately flung down his tools and accompanied me in the office of watchdog, not as a substitute for the host. We entered together. Catherine was there, making herself useful in preparing some vegetables for the approaching meal. She looked more sulky and less spirited than when I had seen her first. She hardly raised her eyes to notice me, and continued her employment with the same disregard to common forms of politeness as before, never returning my bow and good morning by the slightest acknowledgment. She does not seem so amiable, I thought, as Mrs. Dean would persuade me to believe. She's a beauty, it is true, but not an angel. Earnshaw surlily bid her remove her things to the kitchen. Remove them yourself, she said, pushing them from her as soon as she had done, and retiring to a stool by the window, where she began to carve figures of birds and beasts out of the turnip parings in her lap. I approached her, pretending to desire a view of the garden, and, as I fancied, adroitly dropped Mrs. Dean's note onto her knee, unnoticed by Hareton. But she asked aloud, What is that? and chucked it off. A letter from your old acquaintance, the housekeeper at the Grange, I answered, annoyed at her exposing my kind deed, and fearful lest it should be imagined a missive of my own. She would gladly have gathered it up at this information, but Hareton beat her. He seized and put it in his waistcoat, saying Mr. Heathcliff should look at it first. Thereat Catherine silently turned her face from us, and very stealthily drew out her pocket-handkerchief, and applied it to her eyes and her cousin, after struggling a while to keep down his softer feelings, pulled out the letter, and flung it on the floor beside her, as ungraciously as he could. Catherine caught and perused it eagerly. Then she put a few questions to me concerning the inmates, rational and irrational, of her former home, and gazing towards the hills, murmured in soliloquy, I should like to be riding Minnie down there. I should like to be climbing up there. Oh, I'm tired. I'm stalled, Hareton. And she leant her pretty head back against the sill, with half a yawn and half a sigh, and lapsed into an aspect of abstracted sadness, neither caring nor knowing whether we remarked her. Mrs. Heathcliff, I said, after sitting some time mute, you are not aware that I am an acquaintance of yours, so intimate that I think it strange you won't come and speak to me. My housekeeper never wearies of talking about and praising you and she'll be greatly disappointed if I return with no news of or from you, except that you received her letter and said nothing. She appeared to wonder at this speech, and asked, Does Ellen like you? Yes, very well, I replied unhesitatingly. You must tell her, she continued, that I would answer her letter, but I have no materials for writing, not even a book from which I might tear a leaf. No books? I exclaimed. How do you contrive to live here without them, if I may take the liberty to inquire? Though provided with a large library, I am frequently very dull at the Grange. Take my books away, and I shall be desperate. I was always reading when I had them, said Catherine, and Mr. Heathcliff never reads, so he took it into his head to destroy my books. I have not had a glimpse of one for weeks. Only once I searched through Joseph's store of theology to his great irritation. And once, Hareton, I came upon a secret stock in your room, some Latin and Greek, and some tales and poetry, all old friends. I brought the last here, and you gathered them as a magpie gathers silver spoons for the mere love of stealing. They are of no use to you, or else you concealed them in the bad spirit that as you cannot enjoy them, nobody else shall. Perhaps your envy counselled Mr. Heathcliff to rob me of my treasures? but I've most of them written on my brain and printed in my heart, and you cannot deprive me of those." Earnshaw blushed crimson when his cousin made this revelation of his private literary accumulations, and stammered an indignant denial of her accusations. "'Mr. Hareton is desirous of increasing his amount of knowledge,' I said, coming to his rescue. "'He is not envious, but emulous of your attainments. He'll be a clever scholar in a few years.' "'And he wants me to sink into a dunce meantime.' answered Catherine. Yes, I hear him trying to spell and read to himself, and pretty blunders he makes. 
I wish you would repeat Chevy Chase as you did yesterday. It was extremely funny. I heard you, and I heard you turning over the dictionary to seek out the hard words, and then cursing because you couldn't read their explanations." The young man evidently thought it too bad that he should be laughed at for his ignorance, and then laughed at for trying to remove it. I had a similar notion, and remembering Mrs. Dean's anecdote of his first attempt at enlightening the darkness in which he had been reared, I observed, "'But, Mrs. Heathcliff, we have each had a commencement, and each stumbled and tottered on the threshold. Had our teachers scorned instead of aiding us, we should stumble and totter yet.' Oh, she replied, I don't wish to limit his acquirements. Still he has no right to appropriate what is mine, and to make it ridiculous to me with his vile mistakes and mispronunciations. Those books, both prose and verse, are consecrated to me by other associations, and I hate to have them debased and profaned in his mouth. Besides of all, he has selected my favourite pieces, that I love the most to repeat, as if out of deliberate malice. Hareton's chest heaved in silence a minute. He laboured under a severe sense of mortification and wrath, which it was no easy task to suppress. I rose, and, from a gentlemanly idea of relieving his embarrassment, took up my station in the doorway, surveying the external prospect as I stood. He followed my example, and left the room, but presently reappeared, bearing half a dozen volumes in his hands, which he threw into Catherine's lap, exclaiming, "'Take them!' I'll never want to hear or read or think of them again." "'I won't have them now,' she answered. "'I shall connect them with you, and hate them.' She opened one that had obviously been often turned over, and read a portion in the drawling tone of a beginner, then laughed and threw it from her. "'And listen,' she continued provokingly, commencing a verse of an old ballad in the same fashion. But his self-love would endure no further torment. I heard, and not altogether disapprovingly, a manual check given to her saucy tongue. The little wretch had done her utmost to hurt her cousin's sensitive though uncultivated feelings, and a physical argument was the only mode he had of balancing the account, and repaying its effects on the inflictor. He afterwards gathered the books, and hurled them on the fire. I read in his countenance what anguish it was to offer that sacrifice to spleen. I fancied that as they consumed, he recalled the pleasure they had already imparted and the triumph and ever-increasing pleasure he had anticipated from them, and I fancied I guessed the incitement to his secret studies also. He had been content with daily labour and rough animal enjoyments, till Catherine crossed his path. Shame at her scorn, and hope of her approval, were his first prompters to higher pursuits, and instead of guarding him from one and winning him to the other, his endeavours to raise himself had produced just the contrary result. "'Yes, that's all the good that such a brute as you can get from them,' cried Catherine, sucking her damaged lip, and watching the conflagration with indignant eyes. "'You'd better hold your tongue now,' he answered fiercely, and his agitation precluded further speech. He advanced hastily to the entrance, where I made way for him to pass, but ere he had crossed the door-stones, Mr. Heathcliff, coming up the causeway, encountered him, and laying hold of his shoulder, asked, "'What's to do now, my lad?' Naught, naught, he said, and broke away to enjoy his grief and anger in solitude. Heathcliff gazed after him, and sighed. It will be odd if I thwart myself, he muttered, unconscious that I was behind him. But when I look for his father in his face, I find her every day more. How the devil is he so like, I can hardly bear to see him. He bent his eyes to the ground, and walked moodily in. There was a restless, anxious expression in his countenance I had never remarked there before, and he looked sparer in person. His daughter-in-law, on perceiving him through the window, immediately escaped to the kitchen, so that I remained alone. "'I'm glad to see you out of doors again, Mr. Lockwood,' he said, in reply to my greeting. "'From selfish motives, partly. I don't think I could readily supply your loss in this desolation. I've wondered more than once what brought you here.' An idle whim, I fear, sir, was my answer. Or else an idle whim is going to spirit me away. I shall set out for London next week, and I must give you warning that I feel no disposition to retain Thrushcross Grange beyond the twelve months I agreed to rent it. I believe I shall not live there any more. Oh, indeed. You're tired of being banished from the world, are you? He said. But if you be coming to plead off paying for a place you won't occupy, your journey is useless. 
I never relent in exacting my due from any one. I'm coming to plead off nothing about it, I exclaimed, considerably irritated. Should you wish it, I'll settle with you now. And I drew my notebook from my pocket. No, no, he replied coolly. You'll leave sufficient behind to cover your debts if you fail to return. I'm not in such a hurry. Sit down and take your dinner with us. A guest that is safe from repeating his visit can generally be made welcome. Catherine, bring the things in. Where are you? Catherine reappeared, bearing a tray of knives and forks. You may get your dinner with Joseph, muttered Heathcliff aside, and remain in the kitchen till he is gone. She obeyed his directions very punctually. Perhaps she had no temptation to transgress. Living among clowns and misanthropists, she probably cannot appreciate a better class of people when she meets them. With Mr. Heathcliff, grim and saturnine on the one hand, and Hareton absolutely dumb on the other, I made a somewhat cheerless meal, and bade adieu early. I would have departed by the back way, to get a last glimpse of Catherine, and annoy old Joseph, but Hareton received orders to lead up my horse, and my host himself escorted me to the door, so I could not fulfil my wish. How dreary life gets over in that house, I reflected, while riding down the road. What a realisation of something more romantic than a fairy tale it would have been for Mrs. Linton Heathcliff, had she and I struck up an attachment, as her good nurse desired, and migrated together into the stirring atmosphere of the town. End of chapter 31《ハッピーバースデー》の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の And he remarked, hmm, Yon's for Gimmerton. Nah, they're all as three week after other folk with their harvest. Gimmerton, I repeated. My residence in that locality had already grown dim and dreamy. Ah, I know. How far is it from this? Happen <sighs> fourteen mile o'er the hills, and a rough road, he answered. A sudden impulse seized me to visit Thrushcross Grange. It was scarcely noon. And I conceived that I might as well pass the night under my own roof as in an inn. Besides, I could spare a day easily to arrange matters with my landlord, and thus save myself the trouble of invading the neighbourhood again. Having rested a while, I directed my servant to inquire the way to the village, and with great fatigue to our beasts, we managed the distance in some three hours. I left him there and proceeded down the valley alone. The grey church looked greyer, and the lonely churchyard lonelier. I distinguished a moor sheep cropping the short turf on the graves. It was sweet, warm weather, too warm for travelling, but the heat did not hinder me from enjoying the delightful scenery, above and below. Had I seen it nearer August, I am sure it would have tempted me to waste a month among its solitudes. In winter, nothing more dreary, in summer, nothing more divine, than those glens shut in by hills, and those bluff bold swells of heath. I reached the grange before sunset. And knocked for admittance, but the family had retreated into the back premises, I judged, by one thin blue wreath curling from the kitchen chimney, and they did not hear. I rode into the court. Under the porch, a girl of nine or ten sat knitting, and an old woman reclined on the house steps, smoking a meditative pipe. Is Mrs. Dean within? I demanded of the dame. Mistress Dean? Nay,、nice. she answered. She doesn't buy there, she's up at the heights. Are you the housekeeper then? I continued. Eh, or keep the house, she replied. Well, I'm Mr. Lockwood, the master. Are there any rooms to lodge me in, I wonder? I wish to stay all night. The master? she cried in astonishment. Wait, whoever knew you were coming? You said you sent word. There's not no the dry nor mitzel about the place. Now there isn't. She threw down her pipe and bustled in. The girl followed, and I entered too. Soon perceiving that her report was true, and, moreover, that I had almost upset her wits by my unwelcome apparition, I bade her be composed. I would go out for a walk, 
and meantime she must try to prepare a corner of the sitting-room for me to sup in, and a bedroom to sleep in. No sweeping and dusting, only good fire and dry sheets were necessary. She seemed willing to do her best, though she thrust the hearth-brush into the grate in mistake for the poker, and malappropriated several other articles of her craft. But I retired, confiding in her energy for a resting-place against my return. Wuthering Heights was the goal of my proposed excursion. An afterthought brought me back when I had quitted the court. "'All well at the Heights?' I inquired of the woman. "'Eh, for out he now,' she answered, scurrying away with a pan of hot cinders. I would have asked why Mrs. Dean had deserted the Grange, but it was impossible to delay her at such a crisis, so I turned away and made my exit, rambling leisurely along, with the glow of a sinking sun behind and the mild glory of a rising moon in front, one fading and the other brightening, as I quitted the park and climbed the stony by-road branching off to Mr. Heathcliff's dwelling. Before I arrived in sight of it, all that remained of day was a beamless amber light along the west, but I could see every pebble on the path, and every blade of grass, by that splendid moon. I had neither to climb the gate, nor to knock. It yielded to my hand. That is an improvement, I thought. And I noticed another by the aid of my nostrils, a fragrance of stocks and wallflowers wafted on the air from among the homely fruit-trees. Both doors and lattices were open, and yet, as is usually the case in a coal district, a fine red fire illumined the chimney. The comfort which the eye derives from it renders the extra heat endurable. But the house of Wuthering Heights is so large that the inmates have plenty of space for withdrawing out of its influence, and accordingly what inmates there were had stationed themselves not far from one of the windows. I could both see them and hear them talk before I entered, and looked and listened in consequence, being moved thereto by a mingled sense of curiosity and envy that grew as I lingered. Contrary! said a voice as sweet as a silver bell. That for the third time, you dunce! I'm not going to tell you again. Recollect, or I'll pull your hair. Contrary, then, answered another, in deep but softened tones. And now kiss me, for minding so well. No, read it over first correctly, without a single mistake. The male speaker began to read. He was a young man, respectably dressed, and seated at a table, having a book before him. His handsome features glowed with pleasure, and his eyes kept impatiently wandering from the page to a small white hand over his shoulder, which recalled him by a smart slap on the cheek whenever its owner detected such signs of inattention. Its owner stood behind, her light shining ringlets blending at intervals with his brown looks, as she bent to superintend his studies, and her face, it was lucky he could not see her face, or he would never have been so steady. I could, and I bit my lip in spite, at having thrown away the chance I might have had of doing something besides staring at its smiting beauty. The task was done, not free from further blunders, but the pupil claimed a reward, and received at least five kisses, which, however, he generously returned. Then they came to the door, and from their conversation I judged they were about to issue out, and have a walk on the moors. I supposed I should be condemned in Hareton Earnshaw's heart, if not by his mouth, to the lowest pit in the infernal regions, if I showed my unfortunate person in his neighbourhood then, and feeling very mean and malignant, I skulked round to seek refuge in the kitchen. There was unobstructed admittance on that side also, and at the door sat my old friend Nellie Dean, sewing and singing a song, which was often interrupted from within by harsh words of scorn and intolerance, uttered in far from musical accents. I'd rather, by the hoof, have him swearing in me lugs from morn to neat. No hair can ye half-siver, said the tenant of the kitchen, in answer to an unheard speech of Nelly's. It's a blazing shame that I cannot open the blessed book, but ye set up them glories to Saturn, and all to flee some wickednesses that ever were born in the world. Oh, you're a right note, and shoes another and that poor lad will be lost atween ye. Poor lad, he added with a groan. He's witched, I'm sartain aunt. O oh, Lord, judge him, for there's no the law, nor justice among we rulers. No, or we should be sitting in flaming faggots, I suppose, retorted the singer. But wish, old man, and read your Bible like a Christian, and never mind me. This is Fairy Annie's wedding, a bonny tune. It goes to a dance. 
Mrs. Dean was about to recommence when I advanced, and recognising me directly, she jumped to her feet, crying, Why, bless you, Mr. Lockwood, how could you think of returning in this way? All shut up at Thrushcross Grange, you should have given us notice. I've arranged to be accommodated there, for as long as I shall stay, I answered. I depart again to-morrow. And how are you transplanted here, Mrs. Dean? Tell me that. Zilla left, and Mr. Heathcliff wished me to come, soon after you went to London, and stay till you returned. But step in, pray. Have you walked from Gimmerton this evening? From the Grange, I replied. And while they make me lodging room there, I want to finish my business with your master, because I don't think of having another opportunity in a hurry. What business, sir? said Nelly, conducting me into the house. He's gone out at present, and won't return soon. About the rent, I answered. Oh, then it is with Mrs. Heathcliff you must settle, she observed. Or rather with me. She has not learnt to manage her affairs yet, and I act for her. There's nobody else. I looked surprised. Ah, oh, you have not heard of Heathcliff's death, I see, she continued. Heathcliff dead? I exclaimed, astonished. How long ago? Three months since. But sit down, and let me take your hat, and I'll tell you about it. Stop, you have had nothing to eat, have you? I want nothing. I have ordered supper at home. You sit down too. I never dreamt of his dying. Let me hear how it came to pass. You say you don't expect them back for some time, the young people? No, I have to scold them every evening for their late rambles, but they don't care for me. At least have a drink of our old ale. It will do you good. You seem weary. She hastened to fetch it before I could refuse, and I heard Joseph asking whether it weren't a crying scandal that she should have followers at her time of life, and then to get them jocks out of the maister's cellar. He fears shame to bide still and see it. She did not stay to retaliate, but re-entered in a minute, bearing a reaming silver pint, whose contents I lauded with becoming earnestness, and afterwards she furnished me with the sequel of Heathcliff's history. He had a queer end, as she expressed it. I was summoned to Wuthering Heights, within a fortnight of your leaving us, she said, and I obeyed joyfully, for Catherine's sake. My first interview with her grieved and shocked me. She had altered so much since our separation. Mr. Heathcliff did not explain his reasons for taking a new mind about my coming here. He only told me he wanted me, and he was tired of seeing Catherine. I must make the little parlour my sitting-room, and keep her with me. It was enough if he were obliged to see her once or twice a day. She seemed pleased at this arrangement, and, by degrees, I smuggled over a great number of books and other articles that had formed her amusement at the Grange, and flattered myself we should get on in tolerable comfort. The delusion did not last long, Catherine, contented at first, in a brief space, grew irritable and restless. For one thing, she was forbidden to move out of the garden, and it fretted her sadly to be confined to its narrow bounds as spring drew on. For another, in following the house, I was forced to quit her frequently, and she complained of loneliness. She preferred quarrelling with Joseph in the kitchen to sitting at peace in her solitude. I did not mind their skirmishes, but Hareton was often obliged to seek the kitchen also, when the master wanted to have the house to himself, and though in the beginning she either left it at his approach, or quietly joined in my occupations, and shunned remarking or addressing him, and though he was always as sullen and silent as possible, after a while she changed her behaviour, and became incapable of letting him alone, talking at him, commenting on his stupidity and idleness, expressing her wonder how he could endure the life he lived, how he could sit a whole evening staring into the fire and dozing. "'He's just like a dog, is he not, Ellen?' she once observed. "'Or a cart-horse. He does his work, eats his food, and sleeps eternally. What a blank, dreary mind he must have! Do you ever dream, Hareton? And if you do, what is it about? But you can't speak to me.' Then she looked at him, but he would neither open his mouth nor look again. "'He's perhaps dreaming now,' she continued. "'He twitched his shoulder as Juno twitches hers. Ask him, Ellen.' "'Mr. Hareton will ask the master to send you upstairs if you don't behave,' I said. He had not only twitched his shoulder but clenched his fist, as if tempted to use it. 
"'I know why Hareton never speaks when I am in the kitchen,' she exclaimed, on another occasion. "'He is afraid I shall laugh at him. "'Helen, what do you think? He began to teach himself to read once, and because I laughed he burned his books and dropped it. Was he not a fool?' "'Were not you naughty?' I said. "'Answer me that.' "'Perhaps I was,' she went on. "'But I did not expect him to be so silly. "'Hareton, if I gave you a book, would you take it now?' "'I'll try.' She placed one she had been perusing on his hand. He flung it off, and muttered, if she did not give over, he would break her neck. "'Well, I shall put it here,' she said, "'in the table drawer, and I'm going to bed.' Then she whispered to me to watch whether he touched it, and departed, but he would not come near it, and so I informed her in the morning to her great disappointment. I saw she was sorry for his persevering sulkiness and indolence, her conscience reproved her for frightening him off of improving himself. She had done it effectually, but her ingenuity was at work to remedy the injury, while I ironed or pursued other such stationary employments as I could not well do in the parlour. She would bring some pleasant volume and read it aloud to me. When Hareton was there, she generally paused in an interesting part, and left the book lying about. That she did repeatedly, but he was as obstinate as a mule, and, instead of snatching at her bait, in wet weather he took to smoking with Joseph, and they sat like automatons, one on each side of the fire, the elder happily too deaf to understand her wicked nonsense, as he would have called it, the younger doing his best to seem to disregard it. On fine evenings the latter followed his shooting expeditions, and Catherine yawned and sighed, and teased me to talk to her, and ran off into the court or garden the moment I began and, at last resource, cried, and said she was tired of living. Her life was useless. Mr. Heathcliff, who grew more and more disinclined to society, had almost banished Earnshaw from his apartment. Owing to an accident at the commencement of March, he became for some days a fixture in the kitchen. His gun burst while out on the hills by himself, a splinter cut his arm, and he lost a good deal of blood before he could reach home. The consequence was that, perforce, he was condemned to the fireside and tranquillity till he made it up again. It suited Catherine to have him there, at any rate, it made her hate her room upstairs more than ever, and she would compel me to find out business below, that she might accompany me. On Easter Monday, Joseph went to Gimmerton Fair with some cattle, and in the afternoon I was busy getting up linen in the kitchen. Earnshaw sat, morose as usual, at the chimney corner and my little mistress was beguiling an idle hour with drawing pictures on the window-panes, varying her amusement by smothered bursts of songs, and whispered ejaculations, and quick glances of annoyance and impatience in the direction of her cousin, who steadfastly smoked and looked into the grate. At a notice that I could do with her no longer intercepting my light, she removed to the hearthstone. I bestowed little attention on her proceedings, but presently I heard her begin— I found out, Hareton, that I want—that I'm glad—that I should like you to be my cousin now, if you had not grown so cross to me and so rough." Hareton returned no answer. Hareton? Hareton? Hareton, do you hear? She continued. Get off where ye are, he growled with uncompromising gruffness. Let me take that pipe she said, cautiously advancing her hand and abstracting it from his mouth. Before he could attempt to recover it, it was broken, and behind the fire. He swore at her, and seized another. Stop! she cried. You must listen to me first, and I can't speak while those clouds are floating in my face. Will you go to the devil? he exclaimed ferociously. And let me be. No, she persisted. I won't. I can't tell what to do to make you talk to me, and you are determined not to understand. When I call you stupid, I don't mean anything. I don't mean that I despise you. Come, you shall take notice of me, Hareton. You are my cousin, and you shall own me. I shall have naught to do with you and your mucky pride, and your damn mocking tricks, he answered. I'll go to hell, body and soul before I look sideways after you again. Side out at gate now, this minute. 
Catherine frowned and retreated to the window seat, chewing her lip and endeavouring, by humming an eccentric tune, to conceal a growing tendency to sob. "'You should be friends with your cousin, Mr. Harriton,' I interrupted, "'since she repents of her sauciness. "'It would do you a great deal of good. "'It would make you another man to have her for a companion.' "'A companion?' he cried. "'When she hates me and does not think me fit to wipe her shoon? "'Nay, if it made me a king, I'd not be scorned for seeking her good will any more.' "'It is not I who hate you. It is you who hate me!' wept Cathy, no longer disguising her trouble. "'You hate me as much as Mr. Heathcliff does, and more!' "'You're a damn liar,' began Earnshaw. "'Why have I made him angry by taking your part, then, a hundred times? And that when you sneered at and despised me, and go on plaguing me, and I'll step in yonder and say you worried me out of the kitchen.' "'I didn't know you took my part,' she answered, drying her eyes. "'And I was miserable and bitter at everybody. "'But now I thank you and beg you to forgive me. "'What can I do besides?' "'She returned to the hearth and frankly extended her hand. "'He blackened and scowled like a thundercloud "'and kept his fists resolutely clenched "'and his gaze fixed on the ground. "'Catherine by instinct must have divined "'it was obdurate perversity and not dislike "'that prompted this dogged conduct.' for, after remaining an instant undecided, she stooped and impressed on his cheek a gentle kiss. The little rogue thought I had not seen her, and, drawing back, she took her former station by the window, quite demurely. I shook my head reprovingly, and then she blushed and whispered, "'Well, what should I have done, Alan? He wouldn't shake hands, and he wouldn't look. I must show him some way that I like him, that I want to be friends.' Whether the kiss convinced Harriton, I cannot tell. He was very careful, for some minutes, that his face should not be seen, and when he did raise it, he was sadly puzzled where to turn his eyes. Catherine employed herself in wrapping a handsome book neatly in white paper, and, having tied it with a bit of ribbon, and addressed it to Mr. Harriton Earnshaw, she desired me to be her ambassadress, and convey the present to its destined recipient. "'And tell him if he'll take it I'll come and teach him to read it right,' she said. "'And if he refuse it I'll go upstairs and never tease him again.' I carried it, and repeated the message, anxiously watched by my employer. Harriton would not open his fingers, so I laid it on his knee. He did not strike it off, either. I returned to my work. Catherine leaned her head and arms on the table, till she heard the slight rustle of the covering being removed. Then she stole away, and quietly seated herself beside her cousin. He trembled, and his face glowed. All his rudeness and all his surly harshness had deserted him. He could not summon courage at first to utter a syllable in reply to her questioning look and her murmured petition. "'Say you forgive me, Hatton. Do. You can make me so happy by speaking that little word.' He muttered something inaudible. "'And you'll be my friend?' added Catherine interrogatively. "'Nay, you'll be ashamed of me every day of your life,' he answered. "'And the more ashamed, the more you know me. And I cannot bide it.' "'So you won't be my friend?' she said, smiling as sweet as honey, and creeping close up. I overheard no further distinguishable talk, but— on looking round again, I perceived two such radiant countenances bent over the page of the accepted book, that I did not doubt the treaty had been ratified on both sides, and the enemies were, thenceforth, sworn allies. The work they studied was full of costly pictures, and those and their position had charm enough to keep them unmoved till Joseph came home. He, poor man, was perfectly aghast at the spectacle of Catherine seated on the same bench with Hareton Earnshaw, leaning her hand on his shoulder, and confounded at his favourite's endurance of her proximity. It affected him too deeply to allow an observation on the subject that night. His emotion was only revealed by the immense sighs he drew, as he solemnly spread his large Bible on the table, and overlaid it with dirty banknotes from his pocket-book, the produce of the day's transactions. 
At length he summoned Harriton from his seat. Tuck these into the maester, lad, he said, and abide there. I's going up to my own room. This oil's neither medsful nor seemly for us. We mun side out and search another. Come, Catherine, I said. We must side out, too. I've done my ironing. Are you ready to go? It is not eight o'clock, she answered, rising unwillingly. Hareton, I'll leave this book upon the chimney-piece, and I'll bring some more to-morrow. Only books that you leave I shall take into the house, said Joseph. And it'll be much if you can find em again. So, ye may please yourself. Cathy threatened that his library should pay for hers, and, smiling as she passed Hareton, went singing upstairs, lighter of heart, I venture to say, than ever she had been under that roof before except perhaps during her earliest visits to Linton. The intimacy thus commenced grew rapidly, though it encountered temporary interruptions. Earnshaw was not to be civilised with a wish, and my young lady was no philosopher and no paragon of patience, but both their minds tending to the same point, one loving and desiring to esteem, the other loving and desiring to be esteemed, they contrived in the end to reach it. You see, Mr. Lockwood, it was easy enough to win Mrs. Heathcliff's heart, but now I am glad you did not try. The crown of all my wishes will be the union of those two. I shall envy no one on their wedding day. There won't be a happier woman than myself in England. End of chapter 32《Chapter Thirty Three of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the morrow of that Monday, Earnshaw being still unable to follow his ordinary employments, and therefore remaining about the house, I speedily found it would be impracticable to retain my charge beside me, as heretofore. She got downstairs before me, and out into the garden, where she had seen her cousin performing some easy work and when I went to bid them come to breakfast, I saw she had persuaded him to clear a large space of ground from currant and gooseberry bushes, and they were busy planning together an importation of plants from the Grange. I was terrified at the devastation which had been accomplished in a brief half-hour. The black currant trees were the apple of Joseph's eye, and she had just fixed her choice of a flower-bed in the midst of them. "'There! That will be all shown to the master!' I exclaimed. "'The minute it is discovered!' "'And what excuse have you to offer for taking such liberties with the garden? "'We shall have a fine explosion on the head of it. "'See if we don't. "'Mr. Harriton, I wonder you should have no more wit "'than to go and make that mess at her bidding.' "'I've forgotten there were Joseph's,' answered Earnshaw, rather puzzled. "'But I'll tell him I did it.' "'We always ate our meals with Mr. Heathcliff. "'I held the mistress's post in making tea and carving, "'so I was indispensable at table.' Catherine usually sat by me, but to-day she stole nearer to Hareton, and I presently saw she would have no more discretion in her friendship than she had in her hostility. "'Now, mind you don't talk with, and notice your cousin too much,' were my whispered instructions as we entered the room. "'It will certainly annoy Mr. Heathcliff, and he'll be mad at you both.' "'I'm not going to,' she answered." The minute after, she had sidled to him, and was sticking primroses in his plate of porridge. He dared not speak to her there, he dared hardly look, and yet she went on teasing, till he was twice on the point of being provoked to laugh. I frowned, and then she glanced towards the master, whose mind was occupied on other subjects than his company, as his countenance evinced, and she grew serious for an instant, scrutinising him with deep gravity. Afterwards she turned, and recommenced her nonsense— at last Hareton uttered a smothered laugh. Mr. Heathcliff started, his eye rapidly surveyed our faces. Catherine met it with her accustomed look of nervousness and yet defiance, which he abhorred. "'It is well you are out of my reach,' he exclaimed. "'What fiend possesses you to stare back at me continually with those infernal eyes? Down with them, and don't remind me of your existence again. I thought I had cured you of laughing.' "'It was me,' muttered Hareton. "'What do you say?' demanded the master. Hareton looked at his plate, and did not repeat the confession. Mr. Heathcliff looked at him a bit, 
and then silently resumed his breakfast and his interrupted musing. We had nearly finished, and the two young people prudently shifted wider asunder, so I anticipated no further disturbance during that sitting, when Joseph appeared at the door, revealing by his quivering lip and furious eye that the outrage committed on his precious shrubs was detected. He must have seen Cathy and her cousin about the spot before he examined it, for while his jaws worked like those of a cow chewing its cud, and rendered his speech difficult to understand, he began, I mun have my wage, and I mun go. I'd aim to dee where I'd serve for sixty year, and I thought I'd lug my books into the garret, and all my bits of stuff, and they should have the kitchen to their cell for the sake of quietness. It were hard to give up my own hearthstone, but I thought I could do that. But nah, shoes turned my garden fro me, and by the heart, maester, I cannot stand it. Ye may bend the oak, an ye will. I know used to it, and an old man doesn't soon get used to new bathins. I'd rather earn my bite and my soup wi a hammer in the road. Now, now, idiot interrupted heathcliff cut it short what's your grievance i'll interfere in no quarrels between you and nelly she may thrust you into the coal hole for anything i care it's known nelly answered joseph i shouldn't shift for nelly nasty old note as she is thank god she cannot steal to sell a nobody she were never so handsome but what a body would look at her about winking it's yon flaysome, graceless queen that's witched our lad with her bold een and her forehead ways, till, nay, he fair brust my heart. He's forgotten all I've done for him, and made on him, and gone and riven up a whole row of the grandest current trees in the garden. And here he lamented outright, unmanned by a sense of his bitter injuries, and Earnshaw's ingratitude and dangerous condition. "'Is the fool drunk?' asked Mr. Heathcliff. "'Hareton, is it you he's finding fault with?' "'I've pulled up two or three bushes,' replied the young man. "'But I'm going to set him again.' "'And why have you pulled them up?' said the master. Catherine wisely put in her tongue. "'We wanted to plant some flowers there,' she cried. "'I'm the only person to blame, for I wished him to do it.' "'And who the devil gave you leave to touch a stick about the place?' demanded her father-in-law much surprised. And who ordered you to obey her? He added, turning to Hareton. The latter was speechless. His cousin replied, You shouldn't grudge a few yards of earth for me to ornament, when you have taken all my land. Your land, insolent slut, you never had any, said Heathcliff. And my money, she continued, returning his angry glare, and meantime biting a piece of crust, the remnant of her breakfast. Silence, he exclaimed. Get done and be gone. And Hareton's land and his money, pursued the reckless thing. Hareton and I are friends now, and I shall tell him all about you. The master seemed confounded a moment. He grew pale and rose up, eyeing her all the while with an expression of mortal hate. If you strike me, Hareton will strike you, she said. So you may as well sit down. If Hareton does not turn you out of the room, I'll strike him to hell, thundered Heathcliff. Damnable witch, dare you pretend to rouse him against me? Off with her, do you hear? Fling her into the kitchen. I'll kill her, Ellen Dean, if you let her come into my sight again. Hareton tried, under his breath, to persuade her to go. Drag her away, he cried savagely. Are you staying to talk? And he approached to execute his own command. He'll not obey you, wicked man, any more, said Catherine. And he'll soon detest you as much as I do. Whisht, whisht, muttered the young man reproachfully. I will not hear you speak so to him. Have done. But you won't let him strike me, she cried. Come then, he whispered earnestly. It was too late. Heathcliff had caught hold of her. Now you go he said to Earnshaw. A cursed witch. This time she has provoked me when I could not bear it, and I'll make her repent it forever. He had his hand in her hair. Hareton attempted to release her locks, entreating him not to hurt her that once. 
Heathcliff's black eyes flashed, he seemed ready to tear Catherine in pieces, and I was just worked up to risk coming to the rescue, when of a sudden his fingers relaxed, he shifted his grasp from her head to her arm, and gazed intently in her face. Then he drew his hand over his eyes, stood a moment to collect himself apparently, and turning anew to Catherine, said, with assumed calmness, "'You must learn to avoid putting me in a passion, or I shall really murder you some time. Go with Mrs. Dean, and keep with her, and confine your insolence to her ears. As to Hareton Earnshaw, if I see him listen to you, I'll send him seeking his bread where he can get it. Your love will make him an outcast and a beggar. Nelly, take her, and leave me, all of you, leave me.' I led my young lady out. She was too glad of her escape to resist. The others followed, and Mr. Heathcliff had the room to himself till dinner. I had counselled Catherine to dine upstairs, but, as soon as he perceived her vacant seat, he sent me to call her. He spoke to none of us, ate very little, and went out directly afterwards, intimating that he should not return before evening. The two new friends established themselves in the house during his absence, where I heard Hareton sternly check his cousin on her offering a revelation of her father-in-law's conduct to his father. He said he wouldn't suffer a word to be uttered in his disparagement. If he were the devil, it didn't signify. He would stand by him, and he'd rather she would abuse himself, as she used to, than begin on Mr. Heathcliff. Catherine was waxing cross at this, but he found means to make her hold her tongue by asking how she would like him to speak ill of her father. Then she comprehended that Earnshaw took the master's reputation home to himself, and was attached by ties stronger than reason could break. Chains, forged by habit, which it would be cruel to attempt to loosen. She showed a good heart, thenceforth, in avoiding both complaints and expressions of antipathy concerning Heathcliff, and confessed to me her sorrow that she had endeavoured to raise a bad spirit between him and Hareton. Indeed, I don't believe she has ever breathed a syllable in the latter's hearing against her oppressor since. When this slight disagreement was over, they were friends again, and as busy as possible in their several occupations of pupil and teacher. I came in to sit with them, after I had done my work, and I felt so soothed and comforted to watch them that I did not notice how time got on. You know, they both appeared, in a measure, my children. I had long been proud of one, and now I was sure the other would be a source of equal satisfaction. His honest, warm, and intelligent nature shook off rapidly the clouds of ignorance and degradation in which it had been bred, and Catherine's sincere commendations acted as a spur to his industry. His brightening mind brightened his features, and added spirit and nobility to their aspect. I could hardly fancy it the same individual I had beheld on the day I discovered my little lady at Wuthering Heights, after her expedition to the crags. While I admired, and they laboured, dusk drew on, and with it returned the master. He came upon us quite unexpectedly, entering by the front way, and had a full view of the whole three, ere we could raise our heads to glance at him. Well, I reflected, there was never a pleasanter or more harmless sight— and it will be a burning shame to scold them. The red firelight glowed on their two bonny heads, and revealed their faces animated with the eager interest of children, for, though he was twenty-three and she eighteen, each had so much of novelty to feel and learn that neither experienced nor evinced the sentiments of sober, disenchanted maturity. They lifted their eyes together to encounter Mr. Heathcliff, Perhaps you have never remarked that their eyes are precisely similar, and they are those of Catherine Earnshaw. The present Catherine has no other likeness to her except a breadth of forehead, and a certain arch of the nostril that makes her appear rather haughty, whether she will or not. With Hareton the resemblance is carried farther. It is singular at all times, then it was particularly striking." because his senses were alert, and his mental faculties wakened to unwanted activity. I suppose this resemblance disarmed Mr. Heathcliff. He walked to the hearth in evident agitation, but it quickly subsided as he looked at the young man, or, I should say, altered its character, for it was there yet. He took the book from his hand and glanced at the open page, then returned it without any observation. "'merely signing Catherine away. 
her companion lingered very little behind her, and I was about to depart also, but he bid me sit still. It is a poor conclusion, is it not? He observed, having brooded a while on the scene he had just witnessed. An absurd termination to my violent exertions. I get levers and mattocks to demolish the two houses, and train myself to be capable of working like Hercules, and when everything is ready and in my power, I find the will to lift a slate off either roof has vanished. My old enemies have not beaten me. Now would be the precise time to revenge myself on their representatives. I could do it, and none could hinder me. But where is the use? I don't care for striking. I can't take the trouble to raise my hand. That sounds as if I had been laboring the whole time only to exhibit a fine trait of magnanimity. It is far from being the case. I have lost the faculty of enjoying their destruction, and I am too idle to destroy for nothing. Nelly, there is a strange change approaching. I'm in its shadow at present. I take so little interest in my daily life that I hardly remember to eat and drink. Those two who have left the room are the only objects which retain a distinct material appearance to me, and that appearance causes me pain, amounting to agony. About her I won't speak, and I don't desire to think, but I earnestly wish she were invisible. Her presence invokes only maddening sensations. He moves me differently, and yet if I could do it without seeming insane, I'd never see him again. You'll perhaps think me rather inclined to become so. He added, making an effort to smile. If I try to describe the thousand forms of past associations and ideas he awakens or embodies. But you'll not talk of what I tell you, and my mind is so eternally secluded in itself it is tempting at last to turn it out to another. Five minutes ago, Hareton seemed a personification of my youth, not a human being. I felt to him in such a variety of ways that it would have been impossible to have accosted him rationally. In the first place, his startling likeness to Catherine connected him fearfully with her. That, however, which you may suppose the most potent to arrest my imagination, is actually the least for what is not connected with her to me, and what does not recall her. I cannot look down to this floor, but her features are shaped in the flags. In every cloud, in every tree, filling the air at night, and caught by glimpses in every object by day, I am surrounded with her image. The most ordinary faces of men and women, my own features, mock me with a resemblance. The entire world is a dreadful collection of memoranda that she did exist, and that I have lost her. Well, Hareton's aspect was the ghost of my immortal love, of my wild endeavors to hold my right, my degradation, my pride, my happiness, and my anguish. But it is frenzy to repeat these thoughts to you only it will let you know why, with a reluctance to be always alone, his society is no benefit, rather an aggravation of the constant torment I suffer, and it partly contributes to render me, regardless how he and his cousin go on together, I can give them no attention any more. But what do you mean by a change, Mr. Heathcliff? I said, alarmed at his manner though he was neither in danger of losing his senses nor dying, according to my judgment. He was quite strong and healthy, and, as to his reason, from childhood he had a delight in dwelling on dark things and entertaining odd fancies. He might have had a monomania on the subject of his departed idol, but on every other point his wits were as sound as mine. I shall not know that till it comes, he said. I'm only half conscious of it now. You have no feeling of illness, have you? I asked. No, Nelly, I have not, he answered. Then you are not afraid of death, I pursued. Afraid? No, he replied. I have neither a fear, nor a presentiment, nor a hope of death. Why should I? 
with my hard constitution and temperate mode of living and unperilous occupations i ought to and probably shall remain above ground till there is scarcely a black hair on my head and yet i cannot continue in this condition i have to remind myself to breathe almost to remind my heart to beat and it is like bending back a stiff spring it is by compulsion that i do the slightest act not prompted by one thought and by compulsion that i notice anything alive or dead which is not associated with one universal idea i have a single wish and my whole being and faculties are yearning to attain it they have yearned towards it so long and so unwaveringly that i am convinced it will be reached and soon because it has devoured my existence i am swallowed up in the anticipation of its fulfilment my confessions have not relieved me but they may account for some otherwise unaccountable phases of humour which i show oh god it is a long fight i wish it were over he began to pace the room muttering terrible things to himself till i was inclined to believe as he said joseph did that conscience had turned his heart to an earthly hell i wondered greatly how it would end though he seldom before had revealed this state of mind even by looks it was his habitual mood i had no doubt he asserted it himself but not a soul from his general bearing would have conjectured the fact you did not when you saw him mr lockwood and at the period of which i speak he was just the same as then only fonder of continued solitude and perhaps still more laconic in company End of chapter 33Chapter 34 of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For some days after that evening, Mr. Heathcliff shunned meeting us at meals, yet he would not consent formally to exclude Harriton and Cathy. He had an aversion to yielding so completely to his feelings, choosing rather to absent himself, and eating once in twenty four hours seemed sufficient sustenance for him. One night, after the family were in bed, I heard him go downstairs, and out at the front door. I did not hear him re-enter, and in the morning I found he was still away. We were in April then, the weather was sweet and warm, the grass as green as showers and sun could make it, and the two dwarf apple trees near the southern wall in full bloom. After breakfast Catherine insisted on my bringing a chair, and sitting with my work under the fir trees at the end of the house, and she beguiled Heriton, who had perfectly recovered from his accident, to dig and arrange her little garden, which was shifted to that corner by the influence of Joseph's complaints. I was comfortably revelling in the spring fragrance around, and the beautiful soft blue of a head, when my young lady, who had run down near the gate to procure some primrose roots for a border, returned only half laden, and informed us that Mr. Heathcliff was coming in. And he spoke to me she added, with a perplexed countenance. "'What did he say?' asked Heriton. "'He told me to be gone as fast as I could,' she answered. "'But he looked so different from his usual look, that I stopped a moment to stare at him.' "'How?' he inquired. "'Why, almost bright and cheerful. No, almost nothing. Very much excited, and wild and glad,' she replied. "'Night-walking amuses him, then?' I remarked, affecting a careless manner, in reality as surprised as she was, and anxious to ascertain the truth of her statement, for to see the master looking glad would not be an everyday spectacle. I framed an excuse to go in. Heathcliff stood at the open door. He was pale, and he trembled, yet certainly he had a strange joyful glitter in his eyes that altered the aspect of his whole face. "'Will you have some breakfast?' I said. You must be hungry, rambling about all night. I wanted to discover where he had been, but I did not like to ask directly. No, I'm not hungry, he answered, averting his head, and speaking rather contemptuously, as if he guessed I was trying to divine the occasion of his good humour. I felt perplexed, 
I didn't know whether it were not a proper opportunity to offer a bit of admonition. I don't think it right to wander out of doors, I observed, instead of being in bed. It is not wise, at any rate, this moist season. I dare say you'll catch a bad cold or a fever. You have something the matter with you now. Nothing but what I can bear, he replied. And with the greatest pleasure, provided you'll leave me alone. Get in and don't annoy me. I obeyed, and, in passing, I noticed he breathed as fast as a cat. Yes, I reflected to myself, we shall have a fit of illness. I cannot conceive what he has been doing. That noon he sat down to dinner with us, and received a heaped-up plate from my hands, as if he intended to make amends for previous fasting. I've neither cold nor fever, Nelly, he remarked, in allusion to my morning speech, and I'm ready to do justice to the food you give me. He took his knife and fork, and was going to commence eating, when the inclination appeared to become suddenly extinct. He laid them on the table, looked eagerly towards the window, then rose and went out. We saw him walking to and fro in the garden, while we concluded our meal, and Earnshaw said he'd go and ask why he would not dine. He thought we had grieved him some way. "'Well, is he coming?' cried Catherine, when her cousin returned. "'Nay,' he answered, "'but he's not angry. He seemed rarely pleased indeed, only I made him impatient by speaking to him twice, and then he bid me be off to you. He wondered how I could want the company of anybody else.' I set his plate to keep warm on the fender, and, after an hour or two, he re-entered, when the room was clear, in no degree calmer, the same unnatural, it was unnatural, appearance of joy under his black brows, the same bloodless hue, and his teeth visible, now and then, in a kind of smile, his frame shivering, not as one shivers with chill or weakness, but as a tight-stretched cord vibrates, a strong thrilling, rather than trembling. I will ask what is the matter, I thought, or who should, and I exclaimed, Have you heard any good news, Mr. Heathcliff? You look uncommonly animated. Where should good news come from to me? He said. I'm animated with hunger, and seemingly I must not eat. Your dinner is here, I returned. Why won't you get it? I don't want it now, he muttered hastily. I'll wait till supper. And, Nelly, once for all, let me beg you to warn Hareton and the other away from me. I wish to be troubled by nobody. I wish to have this place to myself. Is there some new reason for this banishment? I inquired. Tell me why you are so queer, Mr. Heathcliff. Where were you last night? I'm not putting the question through idle curiosity, but— You are putting the question through very idle curiosity, he interrupted with a laugh. Yet I'll answer it. Last night I was on the threshold of hell. Today I am within sight of my heaven. I have my eyes on it, hardly three feet to sever me. And now you'd better go. You'll neither see nor hear anything to frighten you if you refrain from prying. Having swept the hearth and wiped the table, I departed, more perplexed than ever. He did not quit the house again that afternoon and no one intruded on his solitude, till at eight o'clock I deemed it proper, though unsummoned, to carry a candle and his supper to him. He was leaning against the ledge of an open lattice, but not looking out. His face was turned to the interior gloom. The fire had smouldered to ashes, the room was filled with the damp, mild air of the cloudy evening, and so still, that not only the murmur of the beck down Gimmerton was distinguishable, but its ripples and its gurgling over the pebbles, or through the large stones which it could not cover. I uttered an ejaculation of discontent at seeing the dismal grate, and commenced shutting the casements one after another till I came to his. "'Must I close this?' I asked, in order to rouse him, for he would not stir. The light flashed on his features as I spoke. "'Oh, Mr. Lockwood, I cannot express what a terrible start I got by the momentary view. Those deep black eyes, that smile, and ghastly paleness. It appeared to me, not Mr. Heathcliff, but a goblin. And in my terror I let the candle bend towards the wall, and it left me in darkness.' 
Yes, close it, he replied in his familiar voice. There, that is pure awkwardness. Why did you hold the candle horizontally? Be quick and bring another. I hurried out in a foolish state of dread and said to Joseph, The master wishes you to take him a light and rekindle the fire, for I dared not go in myself again just then. Joseph rattled some fire into the shovel and went, but he brought it back immediately with the supper tray in his other hand, explaining that Mr. Heathcliff was going to bed and he wanted nothing to eat till morning. We heard him mount the stairs directly. He did not proceed to his ordinary chamber, but turned into that with the panelled bed. Its window, as I mentioned before, is wide enough for anybody to get through, and it struck me that he plotted another midnight excursion, of which he had rather we had no suspicion. "'Is he a ghoul, or a vampire?' I mused. I had read of such hideous incarnate demons, and then I set myself to reflect how I had tended him in infancy, and watched him grow to youth, and followed him almost through his whole course, and what absurd nonsense it was to yield to that sense of horror. But where did he come from, the little dark thing, harboured by a good man to his bane? muttered superstition as I dozed into unconsciousness and I began, half dreaming, to weary myself with imagining some fit parentage for him, and repeating my waking meditations, I tracked his existence over again, with grim variations, at last picturing his death and funeral, of which all I can remember is, being exceedingly vexed at having the task of dictating an inscription for his monument, and consulting the sexton about it, and, as he had no surname, and we could not tell his age, we were obliged to content ourselves with the single word, Heathcliff. That came true. We were. If you enter the kirkyard, you'll read, on his headstone, only that, and the date of his death. Dawn restored me to common sense. I rose and went into the garden, as soon as I could see, to ascertain if there were any footmarks under his window. There were none. He has stayed at home, I thought, and he'll be all right today. I prepared breakfast for the household, as was my usual custom, but told Hareton and Catherine to get theirs ere the master came down, for he lay late. They preferred taking it out of doors, under the trees, and I set a little table to accommodate them. On my re-entrance I found Mr. Heathcliff below. He and Joseph were conversing about some farming business. He gave clear, minute directions concerning the matter discussed, but he spoke rapidly, and turned his head continually aside, and had the same excited expression, even more exaggerated. When Joseph quitted the room, he took his seat in the place he generally chose, and I put a basin of coffee before him. He drew it nearer, and then rested his arms on the table, and looked at the opposite wall, as I supposed, surveying one particular portion, up and down, with glittering, restless eyes, and with such eager interest that he stopped breathing during half a minute together. "'Come now!' I exclaimed, pushing some bread against his hand. Eat and drink that, while it is hot. It has been waiting near an hour. He didn't notice me, and yet he smiled. I'd rather have seen him gnash his teeth than smile so. Mr. Heathcliff, master, I cried, don't, for God's sake, stare as if you saw an unearthly vision. Don't, for God's sake, shout so loud, he replied. Turn round and tell me, are we by ourselves? Of course, was my answer. Of course we are. Still, I involuntarily obeyed him, as if I was not quite sure. With a sweep of his hand, he cleared a vacant space in front among the breakfast things, and leant forward to gaze more at his ease. Now I perceived he was not looking at the wall, for when I regarded him alone, it seemed exactly that he gazed at something within two yards' distance, and whatever it was, it communicated, apparently, both pleasure and pain in exquisite extremes. At least the anguished yet raptured expression of his countenance suggested that idea. The fancied object was not fixed either. His eyes pursued it with unwearied diligence, and, even in speaking to me, were never weaned away. I vainly reminded him of his protracted absence from food. If he stirred to touch anything in compliance with my entreaties, if he stretched his hand out to get a piece of bread, his fingers clenched before they reached it, and remained on the table, forgetful of their aim. I sat, 
a model of patience trying to attract his absorbed attention from its engrossing speculation, till he grew irritable and got up, asking why I would not allow him to have his own time in taking his meals, and saying that on the next occasion I needn't wait, I might set the things down and go. Having uttered these words he left the house, slowly sauntered down the garden path, and disappeared through the gate. The hours crept anxiously by, another evening came. I did not retire to rest till late, and when I did, I could not sleep. He returned after midnight, and, instead of going to bed, shut himself into the room beneath. I listened and tossed about, and finally dressed and descended. It was too irksome to lie there, harassing my brain with a hundred idle misgivings. I distinguished Mr. Heathcliff's step, restlessly measuring the floor, and he frequently broke the silence by a deep inspiration, resembling a groan. He muttered detached words also, the only one I could catch was the name of Catherine, coupled with some wild term of endearment or suffering, and spoken as one would speak to a person present, low and earnest, and wrung from the depth of his soul. I had not courage to walk straight into the apartment, but I desired to divert him from his reverie, and therefore fell foul of the kitchen fire, stirred it, and began to scrape the cinders. It drew him forth sooner than I expected. He opened the door immediately, and said, "'Nelly, come here. Is it morning? Come in with your light.' "'It is striking four, I answered. "'You want a candle to take upstairs. You might have lit one at this fire.' "'No, I don't wish to go upstairs,' he said. "'Come in and kindle me a fire, and do anything there is to do about the room.' "'I must blow the coals red first before I can carry any,' I replied, getting a chair in the bellows. He roamed to and fro, meantime, in a state approaching distraction, his heavy sighs succeeding each other so thick as to leave no space for common breathing between. "'When day breaks I'll send for Green,' he said. "'I wish to make some legal inquiries of him while I can bestow a thought on those matters, and while I can act calmly. I have not written my will yet.' and how to leave my property I cannot determine. I wish I could annihilate it from the face of the earth. I would not talk so, Mr. Heathcliff, I interposed. Let your will be a while. You'll be spared to repent of your many injustices yet. I never expected that your nerves would be disordered. They are at present marvellously so, however, and almost entirely through your own fault. The way you've passed these three last days might knock up a titan. Do take some food and some repose— you need only look at yourself in a glass to see how you require both. Your cheeks are hollow, and your eyes bloodshot, like a person starving with hunger and going blind with loss of sleep. It is not my fault that I cannot eat or rest, he replied. I assure you it is through no settled designs. I'll do both, as soon as I possibly can. But you might as well bid a man struggling in the water rest within arm's length of the shore. I must reach it first, and then I'll rest. Well, never mind, Mr. Green. As to repenting of my injustices, I've done no injustice, and I repent of nothing. I'm too happy, and yet I'm not happy enough. My soul's bliss kills my body, but does not satisfy itself. Happy, master, I cried. Strange happiness! If you would hear me without being angry, I might offer some advice that would make you happier. What is that? he asked. Give it. You are aware, Mr. Heathcliff, I said, that from the time you were thirteen years old you have lived a selfish, unchristian life, and probably hardly had a Bible in your hands during all that period. You must have forgotten the contents of the book, and you may not have space to search it now. Could it be hurtful to send for someone, some minister of any denomination, it does not matter which, to explain it and show you how very far you have erred from its precepts and how unfit you will be for its heaven unless a change takes place before you die i'm rather obliged than angry nelly he said for you remind me of the manner in which i desire to be buried it is to be carried to the churchyard in the evening you and hareton may if you please accompany me and mind particularly to notice that the sexton obeys my directions concerning the two coffins no minister need come, nor need anything be said over me. I tell you I have nearly attained my heaven, and that of others is altogether unvalued and uncoveted by me. And supposing you persevered in your obstinate fast, and died by that means, and they refused to bury you in the precincts of the kirk? 
I said, shocked at his godless indifference. How would you like it? They won't do that, he replied. If they did, you must have me removed secretly, and if you neglect it, you shall prove practically that the dead are not annihilated. As soon as he heard the other members of the family stirring, he retired to his den, and I breathed freer. But in the afternoon, while Joseph and Heriton were at their work, he came into the kitchen again, and, with a wild look, bid me come and sit in the house. He wanted somebody with him. I declined, telling him plainly that his strange talk and manner frightened me, and I had neither the nerve nor the will to be his companion alone. "'I believe you think me a fiend,' he said, with his dismal laugh. "'Something too horrible to live under a decent roof.' Then, turning to Catherine, who was there, and who drew behind me at his approach, he added, half sneeringly, "'Will you come, Chuck? I'll not hurt you. No, to you I've made myself worse than the devil. Well, there is one who won't shrink from my company. By God, she's relentless. Oh, damn it! It's unutterably too much for flesh and blood to bear. Even mine. He solicited the society of no one more. At dusk he went into his chamber. Through the whole night and far into the morning we heard him groaning and murmuring to himself. Hareton was anxious to enter, but I bid him fetch Mr. Kenneth, and he should go in and see him. When he came, and I requested admittance and tried to open the door, I found it locked, and Heathcliff bid us be damned. He was better, and would be left alone, so the doctor went away. The following evening was very wet, indeed it poured down till day dawn, and as I took my morning walk round the house I observed the master's window swinging open, and the rain driving straight in. He cannot be in bed, I thought, though showers would drench him through. He must either be up or out, but I'll make no more ado. I'll go boldly and look. Having succeeded in obtaining entrance with another key, I ran to unclose the panels, for the chamber was vacant. Quickly pushing them aside, I peeped in. Mr. Heathcliff was there, laid on his back. His eyes met mine so keen and fierce I started, and then he seemed to smile. I could not think him dead, but his face and throat were washed with rain, the bedclothes dripped and he was perfectly still, the lattice flapping to and fro had grazed one hand that rested on the sill, no blood trickled from the broken skin, and when I put my fingers to it I could doubt no more, he was dead and stark. I hasped the window, I combed his black long hair from his forehead, I tried to close his eyes, to extinguish, if possible, that frightful lifelike gaze of exultation before any one else beheld it. They would not shut, they seemed to sneer at my attempts, and his parted lips and sharp white teeth sneered too. Taken with another fit of cowardice, I cried out for Joseph. Joseph shuffled up and made a noise, but resolutely refused to meddle with him. The devil's hurried off his soul, he cried and he may have his carcass into the bargain, for aught I care. Eh, what a wicked un he looks, gurning at death. And the old sinner grinned in mockery. I thought he intended to cut a caper round the bed, but suddenly composing himself, he fell on his knees and raised his hands, and returned thanks that the lawful master and the ancient stock were restored to their rights. I felt stunned by the awful event, and my memory unavoidably recurred to former times with a sort of oppressive sadness. But poor Hareton, the most wronged, was the only one who really suffered much. He sat by the corpse all night, weeping in bitter earnest. He pressed its hand and kissed the sarcastic savage face that everyone else shrank from contemplating and bemoaned him with that strong grief which springs naturally from a generous heart, though it be tough as tempered steel. Mr. Kenneth was perplexed to pronounce of what disorder the master died. I concealed the fact of his having swallowed nothing for four days, fearing it might lead to trouble, and then, I am persuaded, he did not abstain on purpose. It was the consequence of his strange illness, not the cause. We buried him, to the scandal of the whole neighbourhood, as he wished. Earnshaw and I, the sexton, and six men to carry the coffin, 
comprehended the whole attendance. The six men departed when they had let it down into the grave. We stayed to see it covered. Hareton, with a streaming face, dug green sods and laid them over the brown mould himself. At present it is as smooth and verdant as its companion mounds, and I hope its tenant sleeps as soundly. But the country folks, if you ask them, would swear on the Bible that he walks. There are those who speak to having met him near the church, and on the moor, and even within this house. Idle tales, you'll say, and so say I. Yet that old man by the kitchen fire affirms he has seen two on em, looking out of his chamber window on every rainy night since his death. And an old thing happened to me about a month ago. I was going to the Grange one evening, a dark evening, threatening thunder, and, just at the turn of the heights, I encountered a little boy with a sheep and two lambs before him. He was crying terribly, and I supposed the lambs were skittish and would not be guided. What is the matter, my little man? I asked. There's Heathcliff and a woman yonder unto t' nab, he blubbered, and I dare not pass em. I saw nothing, but neither the sheep nor he would go on, so I bid him take the road lower down. He probably raised the phantoms from thinking as he traversed the moors alone, on the nonsense he had heard his parents and companions repeat. Yet still, I don't like being out in the dark now, and I don't like being left by myself in this grim house. I cannot help it. I shall be glad when they leave it, and shift to the Grange. They are going to the Grange, then, I said. Yes, answered Mrs. Dean. As soon as they are married, and that will be on New Year's Day. And who will live here, then? Why, Joseph will take care of the house, and, perhaps, a lad to keep him company. They will live in the kitchen, and the rest will be shut up. For the use of such ghosts as choose to inhabit it, I observed. No, Mr. Lockwood, said Nelly, shaking her head. I believe the dead are at peace, but it is not right to speak of them with levity. At that moment the garden gate swung to. The ramblers were returning. They are afraid of nothing, I grumbled, watching their approach through the window. Together they would brave Satan and all his legions. As they stepped onto the door-stones, and halted to take a last look at the moon, or more correctly at each other by her light, I felt irresistibly impelled to escape them again, and, pressing a remembrance into the hand of Mrs. Dean, and disregarding her expostulations at my rudeness, I vanished through the kitchen as they opened the house-door and so should have confirmed Joseph in his opinion of his fellow-servant's gay indiscretions, had he not fortunately recognised me for a respectable character by the sweet ring of a sovereign at his feet. My walk home was lengthened by a diversion in the direction of the kirk. When beneath its walls I perceived it decay had made progress, even in seven months, many a window showed black gaps deprived of glass, and slates jutted off here and there, beyond the right line of the roof to be gradually worked off in coming autumn storms. I sought, and soon discovered, the three headstones on the slope next the moor, the middle one grey and half buried in the heath, Edgar Linton's only harmonised by the turf and moss creeping up its foot, Heathcliff's still bare. I lingered round them, under that benign sky, watched the moths fluttering among the heath and harebells, listened to the soft wind breathing through the grass, and wondered how anyone could ever imagine unquiet slumbers for the sleepers in that quiet earth. End of chapter 34 End of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte Thank you for listening. Check our channel for many more stories. Visit our website at www.storylinkradio.com 